Hello everyone, my name is Zura and I am the Codeholic. I have built e-commerce website with admin panel, with online payments, and deployed it on a custom domain with custom business email address. I also deployed a Vue.js admin panel on a subdomain of the primary domain. Let's have a look at the demo of the project. Let's start our demo and the demo starts on the website. On the website, we output all the published products. We have pagination and at the moment it is set to five products per page. And we have three more pages, cart, login, and registration. Login and registration are pretty straightforward. We have a few fields right here to fill up. And we have, of course, forward password page and password reset pages as well. We have cart page, which displays all the items you have in the cart. You don't need to be authorized to add items into the cart. You just click those buttons and the items are added into the cart. When we go to the cart page, we see all items we have added in the cart. We have possibility to remove items from the cart or change its quantity. And as we see down below, that the total amount of the items in the cart also increases as, as soon as we change the quantity. Adding items into the cart, removing items, changing the quantity, and in general, managing items on the front end side is done using Alpine.js. We have also product details page. When we click on the item itself, we see the details page and we have the description right here, the set to cart button and the quantity. So I'm gonna add like four more uh, items into the cart and now I totally have 11 items into the cart. As soon as I hit this proceed to checkout, now I need to log in. Okay, but first we have to create an account. When you fill up the form right here and click the sign up button, you will receive a conf email confirmation. You just accept this email confirmation, click the button in your email and your account will be activated and you will be logged in. As soon as you create your account or just log in into the system and if you don't have any items into your cart, the items which were added into the cart when you were guest, those items will be moved and associated to your authorized user's information. So basically you can add items into the cart as guest, but whenever you log in, those items will move and will be associated to your authorized user's account. And after that, you can even check out from second device. I'm gonna log in with an existing username and password. And I'm going to scroll down below and hit the proceed to checkout. This will redirect me to the Stripe checkout page. Here I'm going to fill up the information. For Stripe checkout, at the moment it is configured to accept test credit cards. So feel free to provide the following credit card information and test how checkout process works. And click the pay button. This will redirect us to our website and we see the successful message, Sura, your order has been completed. I'm actually authorized and I can click this my account, right here I have my profile and my orders. If I click my orders, I'm going to see all the orders I have made. All the orders basically are unpaid except this one. I can click on the order number to view the details of the order. If I want to manage my addresses or my personal information, I just click on my profile and from here I can manage my addresses, update my password or just change the profile details. Now, let's go to the admin panel. Once you log in in the admin panel, you're going to see a dashboard. This gives you an overview, the latest orders, orders by country, total income, couple of useful numbers and the latest customers. The admin panel is built fully on Vue.js as a single page application, which connects to Laravel API and communicates just like this. So you're going to also learn how to create Vue.js applications and connect to any third party APIs. Let's go to the products. This is the place from which we can manage our products. We can edit the product information, change the image, change its description, change the price or we can add new products. From the orders menu item, we're gonna see all existing orders. We can see details of each individual order and we can even change the status of this order. I'm gonna set this into shipped, for example. When you change the order status, the customer will receive an email that his order status was changed. Also, when the order is made by, by customer, admin user receives an email that new order has been made. Okay, let's click on the users from which we can manage all admin users. We can change the passwords of these users or create new user or delete users. From the customers menu item, 
we can manage existing customers. If we click edit right here, we can see the details of the customer, we can see all addresses, and we can even change addresses of the customer. Let's go on the reports from which we can see basically orders by day for last one month. And we have a drop down right here from which we can update the period into last week, last day, or last three months. The same type of date range picker we have also on dashboard. Right here, we can choose the period we want. All right, I think I showed you everything about the project user interface. In this video, you're going to learn how to build full stack applications with Laravel, Vue.js, Talon CSS, and Alpine.js. How to correctly implement Stripe online payments. How to create Vue.js applications and connect to any third party APIs and how to deploy your projects on a custom domain with custom business email address. Even though this is multiple hours tutorial, still it is a small part of the entire course. I recommend to check thecodeholic.com and have a look at all the features of the premium course. I also plan to regularly create updates for the course for additional features, such as having multiple images for the products, create categories, having a carousal or so-called featured products, add stock management on the products, and there are a few others. Those are the top features I want to include in my next update, which will probably be in December. When I started working on this project, my initial plan was to create six or seven hours tutorial on YouTube how to build and deploy Laravel Vue.js e-commerce project. I had a list of the features and I was following that list implementing all the features. At some point, I discovered that I already had much more hours recorded then it was my initial plan. I tried to simplify the project, remove few features, and continued recording like this. When I recorded everything, all the features I wanted to implement, I discovered that the, the whole content was about 23 hours long. I put so much effort in this course, and I spent so much time on this course. Actually, if you have a look at the GitHub repository, you're going to see that the initial comment was made about five or six months ago. I put so much effort in this project that finally I decided to make it as a premium course. I tried to make the price of the premium course very affordable, but even after that, I knew there were some people who were waiting this uh, YouTube tutorial, free YouTube tutorial, how to build and deploy Laravel Vue.js e-commerce project. I simply could not let them down, so I decided to take some parts from the premium course as is, without any kind of editing, and then fill the missing gaps with quickly explaining what changes have been made from section to section. So finally, this several hours tutorial includes the whole process as well, from start to finish. And actually, the first section, start setting up the project, is unedited. You're going to see the full process, as well as the last section, deployment, is unedited. You're going to see the full process. And in between, you're going to see also cart management, for example, and online payments. Those sections are unedited full flow. But in between, several sections are created, not created, but are explained very, uh, very fast. Of course, not every single line written in this project is explained in this few hours tutorial, because as I mentioned, the entire content is about 23 hours long. But the most important sections is unedited. You're going to see full process. At the end of this course, we're going to deploy the project on a custom domain with custom business email address. As a choice of hosting provider, we're going to use Hostinger, which is also a sponsor of today's video. I have been very skeptical to shared hosting services years ago. I tried it years ago a few times, but that was very inconvenient for me. I didn't have possibility to control my PHP version, my databases. Uh, I, the only possibility to deploy my project was FTP clients using FileZilla, for example, which, by the way, I don't like to deploy my projects for. And like my previous experience working with premium shared hosting uh, services was not that good. Then I switched to virtual private servers, so-called VPSs, and I preferred VPSs because even though it was a little bit expensive, I had all the control on my web server. I could install the version I needed, I could manage and maintain as much as I needed. But both hosting types have their advantages. Uh, shared hostings are very easy to set up, but you're kind of limited in shared hosting. 
However, VPS is you have control on anything. You, you are very, very flexible, but it's hard to set it up. When I discovered Hostinger about two years ago and started working with the Hostinger, I discovered that Hostinger has best of both hosting types. It's very easy to start with the Hostinger, but you also have great control on whatever you need. You can control your PHP versions, your DNS records, you have possibility to connect with SSH, create up to 100 websites, up to 100 databases, you can set up subdomains and pretty much anything you might need. I'm going to also show you how you can register with the Hostinger, get the premium shared hosting, which will include domain and SSL and SSH access and databases and everything basically you, you, you will need. But first, let's talk about the prerequisites of this course. This course is pretty much for everyone who wants to learn building full stack applications with Laravel and Vue.js. The only recommendation for me is to have basic knowledge of Laravel. Know what is controller, what is model, where are the migration files located, for example. And have a basic understanding of Vue.js. At least know what is a component. This course also uses Talon CSS and Alpine.js, but no prior knowledge of these technologies are required. But still, if you have hard time understanding what's happening around Talon CSS or Alpine.js, I have tutorials for both. I'm going to put links in the video description. Building such type of projects, editing, connecting different parts to each other and offering you as a free tutorial takes a lot of time. Your appreciation will be if you hit the like button and subscribe. There are many people watching this video right now who is not subscribed. You are not losing anything if you just hit the subscribe button that gives me additional motivation to create such type of videos. Hit the like button and again if you want to see the full working process with 23 hours of content, 140 videos, check my website thecodeholic.com. Alright, let's register on Hostinger, get premium shared hosting and then start building this awesome project. All right, let's scroll down below. And right here we have this premium shared hosting. And they have unmetered traffic. You can deploy up to 100 websites right there. You have 100 gigabyte of SSD storage. You have free domain, free email address, and you have unlimited number of free SSL certificates. And if we see all the features, there are much more. You have unlimited databases. You have also Git support and SSH access. You have 100 email mail mailboxes. So when you take a domain, you can create up to 100 emails, which will be um, under the domain, basically. All right, so you get a lot for such a low price. And let's click right here at to cart, which will redirect us to their checkout page. So right here, we have four options. We can purchase the hosting for one month, 12 months, 24 months, or 48 months. And when you purchase it for 48 months, you get an insane discount, almost $500. Okay, so you can choose whichever option you want, then scroll down below, provide your email address right here, or authorize using Facebook or Google. Scroll down below, right here you again get a little bit of glimpse what you are basically uh, taking in this amount, you already have a great discount. But actually, if you use my coupon code, the code holic, you're going to get additional 10% discount. Then you fill up the information right here and submit secure payment. All right, I recommend to take this premium shared hosting at the moment because they have Black Friday insane sale. Use the link in the video description or provide a coupon code, the code holic right here to get additional 10% discount. Once you fill up the form and click Submit Secure Payment, you will be redirected to the Hostinger's age panel. From there, we will be able to claim our free domain, configure SSL, create databases, deploy our project, access to our uh, hosting using SSH, and do much, much more. Before we start working on the project, let's set up working environment. For this, we will need to install a couple of applications. The first one is XAMPP, which is a package and contains Apache, MariaDB, and PHP. Apache is a web server to run PHP, MariaDB is a database, and PHP is just PHP. Let's go on apachefriends.org, 
click on download in the menu and right here we have exam for all major operating systems download the latest version for your operating system and just follow the installation instructions it is pretty straightforward next we will need composer which is which is a dependency manager for php using composer we will be able to create new laravel project as well as install dependencies in existing laravel project go to download right here and download it for your operating system next we will need text editor slash id my primary choice for php is php storm it is pretty straightforward um, pretty powerful uh, smart uh, PHP ID. The only disadvantage is it is not free. As a free choice, I recommend Visual Studio Code. Uh, and I also have a video where I install 12 useful extensions for PHP. So if you're new to PHP and VS Code, you can just watch that video and install those extensions because without the extensions, basically, VS Code is, um, is not that intelligent. Okay, download whichever editor you want, and now let's create new Laravel project. But before that, uh, we as soon as you install your XAMPP, uh, let's open XAMPP control panel, and we need to start Apache and MySQL services. Just click Start buttons right here, and after that, we will be able to access p uh, localhost slash php my admin. And we need to create a schema from here. That's a um, MariaDB in client interface. Just click new on the left side and specify right here the database name. I'm going to call my database Laravel View e-commerce and choose the encoding UTF-8 and before Unicode CI. That's where I'm going to choose. And according to my experience, that is the encoding which works best uh, for Unicode characters. And just click create right here. Okay, now let's open CMD and I'm going to also navigate to the folder. Here's the CMD and I'm going to navigate to the folder where the XAMPP is actually installed. And that is going to be under Windows C drive XAMPP HDDocs. Okay, I'm going to copy the path and navigate using CD hit enter and now I'm in the XAMPP HDDocs um, folder and I'm going to create new Laravel project right here. For this I'm going to create first Laravel installer install. So composer global require Laravel slash installer. I'm going to hit enter and this will download the Laravel installer and then we will be able to create new Laravel, Laravel projects using that installer. Now I'm going to run Laravel new and the project name. I'm going to call Laravel view e-commerce. Let's hit enter. It's going to take a few seconds or minutes depending on internet and many other things. And until this is actually done, we have already a folder right here. I'm going to open that Laravel view e-commerce in my text editor. I'm going to use PHP Storm, so right click on that and open folder as PHP uh, Storm project. You can open with the VS Code if you prefer it. And it's going to take a few seconds. Here it is already opening. And let's have a look in the CMD. And application is ready. Okay, so we have already successfully installed that. I'm going to actually close CMD because I'm going to use later the PHP Storm's integrated terminal. And we already have database, so let's open .en file, and we need to configure the database. So the connection is MySQL. The host is this is a local uh, IP. The port is three three zero six. That is the default port. We should leave that. And the database is called Laravel View E-commerce. That's actually correct name. Username is root, and the password for Windows installation it is empty. So the database is actually configured successfully. Now let's open terminal and I'm going to run PHP artisan migrate. That's going to apply migrations in the database. Okay, migrations are files which hold the schema information. Okay, in this case, the migrations created users table, they created password results table, they created uh, failed jobs table, and personal access tokens table. Okay, now let's open 
PHP my admin and just reload right here and we see Laravel view e-commerce inside there we have five tables fail jobs migrations password resets personal access tokens and users and those are tables which we are created from here we will have to create our own migrations uh, in a moment but let's uh, test our application in the browser so let's run php artisan serve hit the enter uh, it's going to start the laravel's development server at uh, local ip port 8000 so let's just click right here or open localhost port 8000 and we see laravel application up and running all right uh, perfect I think we should start right now working on the database schema so for this let's have a look at the schema i prepared so we have the following tables so the users table which already exists in laravel this one so i don't have uh, fields described right here so that's just for the referencing other tables but let's understand and start with the products so for products we have title slug the slug will be a unique uh, string generated from the title image we have image mime and image size as well we have description we have status uh, for the product we have price of course we have created it and updated it when the product was created and updated we have created by and updated by by whom the product was actually created or updated we have deleted at and deleted by that is for soft deletes when the product will be actually uh, deleted by the admin users uh, it's not going to be actually deleted from the database but the deleted at, at deleted at and deleted by fields will be set then we have um, orders and order items so here we have the orders the order has total price it has its status whether the order is pending or completed it has its uh, created at updated at created by and updated by then we have order items which is a junction table between orders and products we have the order id here product id here quantity and the unit price okay then we have payments which is connected to the orders and we have order id here we have amount we have status we have a uh, type right here created at and created by we don't have updated at and updated by because the, once the payment is made it's not going to be actually updated okay down below we have cart items you know, which references to user and product and uh, quantity as well so that user added the following product with the following uh, quantity in cart and that's the also date when that actually happened okay we can actually have right here updated at as well if the quantity is updated inside the cart we have order details as well which is connected to the orders and that contains uh, the first name last name email phone address one address information basically everything and country code and create that and update it at we have countries table which references to the order details and finally we have customers and customer addresses and the order details basically is a, just a union of customers and customer addresses tables okay just like that this is our whole schema so we have possible we will have possibility to add items into the cart uh, uh, then make orders and then we have order details and make also payments and based on that information we can have um, minimalistic reporting as well which products uh, have been sold this month um, and so on things like that okay now we have to generate migrations and models for the following schema now let's open php store i'm going to open new terminal right here i'm going to actually call this uh surf and another terminal and right here we're going to generate models and migrations php artisan make model and i'm going to call this product and i'm going to specify right here uh dash m for migration as well so we have to generate product the next will be to generate um 
let's wait until this is actually generated then we have to generate order model well let's have a look in the schema again so we should first generate tables which don't have references to other tables uh, okay until that other tables is already generated for example when we generate products uh, then we can generate cart items but we cannot actually generate for example order details table until the orders table is actually created um, so that's why we need to keep that ordering so maybe before the order model I'm gonna leave this as it is I can delete that later uh, but before the order model we should uh, create a country which is which doesn't uh, a reference to other tables itself so let's generate country then we can generate already orders um, and order details as well or we can generate cart items as well so let's generate now cart item then we need to generate order detail then we need to generate uh, order item then we have to generate uh, maybe payment then we have to generate customers and customer addresses and we're done so let's generate customer model with migration and customer address okay now let's have a look in the project under app uh, models right here we have cart item country customer customer detail order everything basically what we just generated let's go in the database and go under migrations and right here we have now first products then orders then we have countries cart items order details so they are right now generated in the order that they can run whenever we create uh right here uh, corresponding uh, content inside the schemas okay let's start from the products table and basically generate uh, schema here we need the product title we need slug we need image we need image mime we need image size and long text which is going to be description and decimal price we will need created by which references to the user we need updated by as well which references to the user as well we need soft deletes which will add those created at uh sorry excuse me uh which will add those um deleted at and deleted by fields and we will need foreign id uh, for the user as well for the deleted by and finally at the top right here we need to import the app models user because we use it right here for reference okay that is for the product table let's open the second one which is orders table okay for orders let's first import app models uh, user because we are going to need that then down below we need to add total price to the order we need status on the order we need the created by and updated by on the order and that's that's all for the order we can double check in the scheme as well we don't have anything else right here we don't have timestamps but we already have it the next table is countries table okay for countries we don't need id and timestamps so i'm going to remove both and we're going to add a string code which is going to be primary key we will need name uh, and we will need uh, json b which is going to be uh, states. So that's going to be a JSON column and it's going to contain states. A couple of countries have states and we need to show states drop down as well when you choose a specific country, for example, United States. So we're going to save that JSON uh, states information right here inside the states JSON. Okay, we have that. Let's open the next one, which is cart items table okay for cart items we don't need timestamps so i'm going to remove that we will need foreign id for user with the user id we will need foreign id uh, on product id column it references id on products table okay we have a foreign key on the products then we will need timestamp created at we actually don't need um 
updated uh, at. Or we can actually add, I think we decided to add. We don't, even though we don't have that in schema, it will be good to have that. So uh, yeah, that's it. And we need uh, quantity. Let me actually change this into time stamps so that we have both. Uh, and I'm going to move this down. Okay, and just like that, we have cart items. Let's open the other one, which is order details. Inside order details, we need the first name, last name, phone, which is nullable, address one, address two, we need city, we need state, we need zip code, a country code, and that's basically all. So we need all only those fields. Okay, in the down, basically in every migration down, we already have drop if exists and it drops the table. Okay, so we save that and let's open the next one, which is order items table. Here we need uh, order ID to be referenced to the orders table. We need product ID to reference to products table. We need quantity and we need the unit price. And that's all for order items. Let's open the next one, which is payments table. For payments, we will need the reference foreign key to orders table using order ID. We need amount decimal. We need status of the payment. We need type of the payment, whether the payment is made by cash or credit card. We need a uh, foreign key to create it by to the user table and update it by and we need to import that user model at the top okay i think we don't have uh, the type of the payment in the schema no actually we do have that we do have okay so fine let's move on on the next one and which is customer table for customers we will need first name last name we will need phone we need status and we need uh, created by and updated by Okay, and let's import the user model at the top. Here we have that. So we have customers table migration ready as well. And finally, we need customer addresses. Here we will need type of the address, whether that's a shipping address or billing address. We need address one, address two. Uh, we need city, we need state, zip code, country code, and we need customer ID to which customer this address references to and we need country code to which country this address belongs to and yeah i think that's it so that's all what we need and we have our migrations actually ready now let's open terminal let's clear up everything and i'm going to run php artisan migrate this will apply just created migrations Okay, all of them migrated successfully. Now let's open PHP my admin and reload the page. And here we see all our tables, what we just created. Awesome. Now let's open terminal. Let's clear up everything. And I'm going to run PHP artisan migrate. This will apply just created migrations. Okay, all of them migrated successfully. Now let's open PHP my admin and reload the page and here we see all our tables what we just created awesome now we need to create a Vue.js application for this make sure you have node.js and npm installed on your operating system if you don't have just download for windows or for your operating system the uh, latest version which is at this moment it is version 16 LTS, just I'll always try to download LTS version, which is long term support. Okay, and just download that, install that, and then you're gonna have npm command available in your terminal. And in this case, we're gonna run npm create white. And just to make sure that we have the latest version, uh, we can specify tag at latest. I'm gonna hit enter. And it's going to take a few seconds. Okay, what's going to be the project name? The project name will be backend. I'm going to call this backend. And which framework I want to choose? I'm going to choose Vue.js. And whether I want to use Vue or just Vue and TypeScript, I'm going to choose just Vue. And 
Just like that, it is generated inside the backend folder. Okay, right here the view application is generated. Now let's navigate inside backend and I'm going to run npm install and npm run dev. That's going to spin up the uh, white server and now let's open localhost port 3000 in the browser and we see hello view 3 plus white and clicking on the counter actually works so we actually successfully created Vue.js application now we need to install talon css in our Vue.js application make sure whenever we have to do anything inside the Vue.js application make sure you are in the backend folder okay if you run any commands from the project root directory which is laravel view e-commerce in my case it's not going to work for Vue.js applications okay just make sure we are in the backend because we have to run commands for the Vue.js application which is inside the backend in this case we have to install Tailwind CSS so let's open the browser and I'm going to just type uh, Tailwind CSS white and the very first link will be guide we have to basically install Talon CSS, Post CSS, and Auto Prefixer as a dev dependencies. That dash D means that we want all of them as a dev dependencies. And then we have to run npx Talon CSS init dash P. So this will create Talon CSS config. Dash P will create config for Post CSS. We can copy these two lines, go inside the backend terminal terminal which is navigated inside the backend and we're going to paste this right here first npm install and then npx talon css init dash p that's going to create config files right here we have post css config and talon uh, config js those two files were generated and the package json was also updated down below we see auto prefixer post css and talon css as added inside dev dependencies all right so we have them now what do we need to do here we can find the full guide in the Talwind Talwind config js we need to copy content open Talwind config js and inside the content we need to oops we need to replace the content and down below we have to do the following things we need to create uh, source index CSS and copy and paste that right there let me actually collapse the terminal under source I'm going to create now a new file called index.css and paste them right here and then we need to open main.js and we need to import that import index CSS okay and the css is actually running okay so we have created that imported that and then when we run npm run dev the talon css will already work so let's bring up the terminal again clear up and run npm run dev and let's open now up view or hello world and where's the template right here and let's actually give this one uh, background purple 500 so we save that and let's have a look in the browser here we see background purple 500 so that actually proves that Talon CSS is installed in our project now I want to install Vuex in our backend Vue.js application so let's bring up the terminal make sure you are in the backend folder navigated into your terminal and we're going to run npm install dash s vuex at next to install basically the latest version for vue.js i'm going to hit enter it's going to take a few seconds okay the vuex is probably installed let's have a look right here we see vuex and now we need to create store and use that in our application in the source folder let's collapse the terminal in the source folder i'm going to create a new folder called store and inside the store i'm going to create new file index and js okay 
So from here, uh, I'm going to actually call const store equals create store. I'm going to hit enter. And now PHP Storm automatically detects that there are create stores created in the following packages. And if we want to import some of them, I'm going to import the very first one, create store. Okay, hit enter and PHP Storm automatically imports that for me. Okay, so we have create store and we have to specify right here object and we have to specify state, state, which is an object. We have getters, object, uh, actions, and mutations. Okay, and we have to export default store from here. Now let's open main.js and I'm going to import store from store and down below after create up, we're going to run use store. Okay, and just like that, we created the store and we are using that store. Let's test how store is actually used. So let's go in the state and create test property, which corresponds to one, two, three, four. Now let's open hello world component. And right here, the hello world component actually uses a composition API. And here we need to import computed from view and then define a property const test equals computed which accepts a callback and returns i'm going to import store from my store store dot state dot test okay basically this test now will be available in the template and let's actually output test right here so we save that uh, actually when we format the code it formats on four spaces and we have to adjust this as well but let's run npm run dev and now open the browser and right here we see one two three four okay if we delete everything because we have to delete them in any case so we delete everything from the template oops now we have one, two, three, four. Okay, that's coming from the store. If we open again store index.js and change this into five, six, seven, we save that and have a look. Here it is. Okay, our store was actually successfully used. Okay, let's continue. And now we need to install view router. I'm gonna just stop the server and then we're gonna run npm install dash uppercase s to add that in a dependencies view rotor at next uh, by specifying at next we're sure that we're going to get the latest version okay we hit enter okay this is actually done now we need to go in the source and we're going to create a right here folder rotor and inside there we're going to create index.js okay so let's create right here folder called uh, rotor and then inside there, I'm going to create a new file called um, index, index.js. Okay, so from that, uh, we're going to create a router and export that. Okay, let's write uh, const router equals create router. And when we hit enter, PHP Storm detects that there are the following create rotors uh, existing and it suggests me to import. I'm going to import the first one and we're going to specify right here object. We need to specify history to be create web history and that should be also imported from view rotor. And we're going to specify right here roots. The roots doesn't exist yet, so it's defined const roads equals an array for roads so we have rotor with create web history and roads as well this create web history by the way defines uh, history mode true so we will have always uh, normal urls and we won't have hashes like our users for example endpoint will be uh, something like um, domain.com slash users not uh, hashtag 
slash users. Okay, so this is what create web history will do. Um, okay, and finally, we need to export default uh, router from here, and we need to open main.js and import uh, router from here. And then just like we are using store, we need to use router. Okay, we already have router actually ready. We can start our server npm run dev. Now let's actually go in the router and create two roads. I'm going to create one for a dashboard. Uh, I'm going to give it a name also dashboard and the component will be dashboard component. This component doesn't exist yet and we're going to create that. So I'm going to actually duplicate this and I'm going to call this one uh, login and the component will be login. Okay, the login component will be also created. Now let's go in the source and we're going to create right here a folder called views and I'm going to create new view.js file right here view component that's going to be login. Okay, so here we have, I'm going to create h1 login form. And then I'm going to duplicate the login and create dashboard view. Hit enter. And the dashboard view, of course, needs to have different text. Dashboard. Now let's go in the router and I'm going to import dashboard from views dashboard. Okay, make if you uh, your ID ID editor doesn't support auto import, make sure you write the following code here and make sure you also specify extension. Let me actually change this into login and we have to specify extension right here dot view. So we save that. Now let's have a look in the browser. I'm going to refresh the page and we don't see anything because if we open up that view, uh, we still have right here hello world with that image. Okay, let's delete everything. We don't need the hello world. We don't need that image uh, in the template. However, we need rotor view. This is what we need. And this will be the place where our views will be displayed. And I'm going to remove that um, from setup as well. And let's go in the components and let's delete that hello world. So we save that. Now let's have a look in the browser. We have an error source components. Hello world. Uh, where is the component actually used? Let's search inside the project hello world. We don't see that project. Probably uh, Pitchstorm didn't understand that I deleted and saved that. Now let's reload the page and we see login form. Now let's go on the dashboard and we see dashboard. Okay, that actually proves that our routing successfully works. Now let's start working on the login form. I'm going to open login.view. Let's open the browser and I'm going to look for Tailwind CSS. Um, actually, let's search for Tailwind uh, components and open the very first link. Uh, no, that's not actually what we are looking for. I want to look for Tailwind UI. Let's go under components and right here, uh, Tailwind um, offers a couple of free and paid components. I'm going to use free components only and I'm looking for sign in and uh, registration forms. Where are those? Let's actually search for registration. Here it is. So let's click on that. And this is how our form login form should look like. I'm going to actually change this into view and the Tailwind UI components basically suggest only HTML. Uh, React and Vue.js version. So I'm going to go in the view and go in the code and I'm going to copy the whole code. And that gives me hint as well that I need to install Talent CSS forms. And it gives me the following hint that this template requires updating your HTML and body tags. And this is the whole form. And it also uses uh, hero icons. And we have to actually use uh, install that package as well and it has template and script okay we have that copied now let's go and replace template and script however as, as I mentioned we have to install a couple of packages like hero icons let's actually look for headless UI because that template basically um, is using in this case it, it uses um, hero icons only but a couple of templates 
mentioned right here, which requires JavaScript functionality, uses headless UI. In this case, there is no JavaScript necessary in this form. Everything is only HTML and CSS. But if we want to have, for example, if we want to copy a dropdown, the dropdown requires JavaScript and that uses headless UI. So it's going to be good if we need in the future that JavaScript, um, JavaScript activated components, we need to have headless UI. So let's click on this headless UI and here we, as I mentioned, here are all the components which uses JavaScript. And I want to go on the installation section. Let's go, here's the documentation. So npm install headless UI uh, for view uh, latest. And we will need hero icons as well. Uh, so basically we need to install the following packages. Let me actually open page store. So let's bring up the terminal, close that npm run dev and clear up everything. And I'm going to run npm install dash, um, dash D. We need to install them as a dev dependencies. And let's specify a headless UI slash uh, view. We need to install headless UI, actually, uh, sorry, a hero icons, um, excuse me, hero icons slash view, and we need uh, tailwind CSS uh, slash forms. Okay, let's hit enter. So this one is, as I mentioned, a JavaScript, uh, that's a headless UI, which means that we have only JavaScript, we don't have user interface. And we are installing that Vue.js ready JavaScript components. We have these hero icons, which are just for icons and we're going to look for the hero icons from here, heroicons.com, where we can get that icons from here. And then we install that Talon CSS forms, which is required by that login uh, template. Okay, so we installed all of them. Now let's run npm run dev and let's check in the browser. Let's go on the login page and this is our form. So we have the icon. We have nice inputs and uh, I don't think we have nice inputs. I think something is missing here. Uh, we need to open Talon config and we need to add the Talon CSS forms plugin right here. So let me actually copy the following require and paste that right here. We, when we format the code, it formats that on two spaces according to editor config. And now let's have a look in the browser, reload that. And now we see um, the actual input, how it should look like. Awesome. So we actually um, have that. Do we need anything else here? So we have the login form. Let me actually delete the uh, comment. Let's remove that. Yeah, we need to add the following classes on HTML and body. So let's open index HTML. Oops. Let's open index HTML and on the HTML tag, let's add uh, hful bg gray 50 and on body, let's add hful. Oops. Okay, we can have this always added on all pages. So let's hit the enter. Now the background is slight gray and the form is like form inputs are actually fully white. We can test this by setting this on 300, for example. Look at this, but it's too much. So let's set, set this on 50. Okay, so we have our login form ready. We made small modifications in the login form, such as removed logo and some texts. And we also created forward password and reset password pages. So whenever you click this forward password, it's going to show the following page. You enter your email address and hit the submit button. At the moment, only front end is implemented. And this makes requests to the Laravel in the future. And the Laravel will send email to that specific provided email address. And then when user clicks the link in the email, it should open a new view, which is going to be reset password. And this reset password link should contain some secret token in the URL as well. Okay, whenever this is opened, this whenever we type basically, whenever we click the email, the following URL will be opened. 
and that's going to be the view and user will provide new password and click the submit the, the request will go back to the laravel and it will reset the password okay now let's start working on the layouts if you observe those three Vue.js components for request password reset password and login template looks very similar to each other actually we copied and pasted from each other right so we have to define it's going to be good to define layout for auth uh, for guest users basically and we can move certain classes inside the layout and then we can have only the main part inside the components and of course we're going to need to define um, primary layout as well which will be for authenticated users so let's actually go under source um, components and inside the components i'm going to create a vue.js component and i'm going to call this auth um, or maybe guest layout guest layout hit enter on that okay we will need to copy and paste certain things uh, from the login form so i'm going to paste that and now let's identify what's going to be the layout the layout can be basically a, this one can be a layout this div can be also a layout but the text is different so we can provide a prop right here uh, for that uh, text and this form of course needs to come from the uh, form component itself okay the only thing we need is text okay let's do like this i'm going to actually take this form and replace this into slot that's where the default slot will be outputted and right here i'm going to output title that's going to be title property okay so we have the layout out layout let me think um we can have this in in two ways like we can have this as a component normal component or we can have this as a uh nested rotor view component okay if we have this as a guest layout normal component that's actually fine we can go in the login and now i'm gonna let's copy this text and i'm gonna remove this portion and just type right here guest layout we have that i'm going to specify right here title title to be signing to your layouts and down below this is for the guest layout and the guest layout needs to be actually imported so if we just start typing uh in a pascal case like guest layout and hit enter that's going to be properly imported right here okay and we can use this pascal naming for components as well however if we don't have that imported and if we just start typing normal dashed version naming well it sometimes is imported properly sometimes it's not in this case i actually prefer to have a pascal case naming guest layout so i'm going to write it like this and in this case if we have a look in the login form uh where is that components guest layout we need dot view always for view components so let's go on the login page okay we have the form we don't have the title the only thing is to go in the guest layout and define right here title prop for this i'm going to use uh, view 3's built-in function called define uh, define props and we have to specify um, well actually we can assign this to a variable const props equals define props what what's the problem sorry my bad i'm writing this in the style we have to change this i'm going to actually change this into composition api because i really like this approach and i'm going to put right here setup okay and, and then we can define already the props we can destructure the props and get the title but in the object for define props we have to define the type for the props i'm going to specify title must be string okay and now we have the title let's open the browser 
and reload the page and now we see that sign into your account that is the title given from the login.view from from here okay now we can copy that and paste that into multiple places uh, let's actually think if we can even move this form inside the layout so we we cannot move we cannot move anything except the form inside the layout that's for sure however the form actually can be moved inside the layout and we don't need action of course we aren't going to actually submit that form somewhere else instead we're going to need uh, submit on submit okay and that is something which can be also triggered from the guest layout okay i'm going to show you what i'm thinking and maybe it doesn't worth uh, i will think while i'm actually doing that so we can take that form move into guest layout and wrap the slot with the form okay now we don't need that form right here we have the inputs everything right there if we just reload the page we see everything if we inspect the form and just expand the div element we still see form right here however inside that login component we need to listen to the form submission whenever a form is submitted we need our function to be called and let's uh, call our function let's create function function uh, submit or function login and i'm going to actually write console log statement right here login okay and i don't have the form i don't have the control to attach event listener on that so i'm going to go in the guest layout and for the form uh, i'm going to let's actually remove the action i'm going to add submit event listener i'm going to prevent as well and that's going to be login but i don't have login right here so i'm going to emit my event from here to the parent and down below i'm going to define emit const emit equals define emits and we have to specify right here submit okay we have to emit submit event from here and whenever the form is actually submitted i'm going to call emit with the submit event okay that's how i can do that now if i go in the login on the guest layout i can add submit event listener which will call login method okay now let's actually open the form go in the console and maybe hit enter from inputs let's go in the info section and we see login so when i hit enter inside the input that actually triggers form submission or whenever I click the button, that's going to trigger the form submission as well. Okay, this is the approach I can actually do. Uh, I don't know if that's the better than the other one. I think the other one is slightly better because the guest layout is more generic. The guest layout is just for uh, showing user a guest layout. It should not have, in my opinion, form information right there. So form is not necessary in the guest layout. So I'm going to actually undo the changes just so you already know how you can emit event from the guest layout so i can undo this change go in the login and i'm going to undo this from here as well so we have form and whenever we implement actually implement login we can attach submit right here and create that login form again however now we need to use that guest layout in password now request password so i'm going to actually put this right here specify the title that's going to be the title let's finish the guest layout and let's delete everything above and below let's format the code however we need that guest layout to be imported okay just like we have right here we can write that import manually or i'm going to actually delete one letter in phpstorm and hit the control space and phpstorm auto completes that for me however the last t right here is missing and it also um this auto completes and imports that guest layout for me as well but the extension is missing okay we have that now let's go in the reset password and let's actually put right here guest layout that was auto imported 
we specify title the title will be set new password sorry quick pause if you enjoy this tutorial why don't you pause the video hit the like button and continue watching please hit the subscribe button as well if you are not subscribed and let's wrap the form and i'm going to delete everything before the guest layout and after so we have a nice correct guest layout let's check all three forms uh, the extension right here is missing so we've saved that this is our login form forward your password uh, remember your password and the last one is reset password one three four okay this is our layout awesome so we have successfully created the guest layout component now let's understand the changes made in this section we created up layout and this is how our layout looks like we have this header with this uh, user profile and logo drop down and we have this sidebar and we can navigate between the products and dashboard dummy pages at the moment okay let's understand how how these this layout was actually made so for this first we updated the i updated the rules file and right here we now have a component app layout which has inside meta that this layout requires authorization so only authorized users should be able to access that and all the existing roads became the children roads of the following road and down below also we configured on the router that on before each basically whenever we try to access to a page we check if the page we want to try to access uh, requires auth authentication we check and inside the store if the user doesn't have the token we redirect user to the login page okay if we open the store at the moment we have the token to be one two three four if i remove this and set this into null for example and i save and open the browser we see that i'm now on the login page okay let's understand this router once again and down below we have this else if statement and if the uh, url we want to basically navigate to requires guest user and the token already exists we redirect user to the dashboard page so basically if we have a look in the browser we are on the login page but if we just open the store index and i'm going to set this one two three four right here save that now if i open the browser i am on a dashboard page so basically white server automatically reloads the page and the view router detects that i have a token and i need to go to the dashboard page okay and these changes have been made and this is the app layout inside which we have a sidebar component we have this nav bar um, inside which we have the uh, next to the nav bar we have this main with the rotor view inside and this is how our nav bar looks like and this is the sidebar we also created not found page so basically if we try to access a url non-existing url something we see not found page and this is done through the rotor so right here we have configured basically if the path matches uh one of the following paths mentioned above then it will of course render the corresponding components but if the path doesn't match then this component will be rendered not found and this is our new not found page that was all that has been made in this section now let's understand what changes we made so far we have created a migration and we added is admin column to the users table so for admin interface we want only those users to be able to log in who has is admin flag to be true i also created admin user cedar and i created one admin user with the following email and with the following password so now i should be able to log in as soon as i implement the backend side i created auth controller which is for logging and logout for the api so right here we accept the user information we validate that we try to log in user if the username or password is incorrect we return with the proper message if the user is not admin we also return with the proper message otherwise we create a token and return the token and we have implemented logout as well and right here we also have an endpoint to get the current user information for this we created user resource and we are just returning id name and email and we also created admin middleware and this middleware will restrict access only will allow access only for admin users okay so and we of course need to register this middleware uh, in the kernel file so 
under the um, under the road middleware we added this admin middleware right here and of course we modified the roads and we added right here admin middleware and that's basically all we did on the backend side on the front end side of course we implemented the actual login in the login.view and we also created separate files for uh, actions for store actions and for store mutations and we're going to see that as well so right here in this login view we listen let's scroll down below we listen to the login button click we set the loading indicator true we call the action store action login and inside the actions now we have get current user information a login and logout actions which by itself calls the mutations if we check mutations we see we have set user and set token we take the user information and save it in the state we take the token information and save that inside session storage as well as inside the state and just like this the user is basically authorized and this is how we modified the store as well so we created separate files for actions and mutations and imported them right here okay so now we have the full flow of uh, login and logout for the user and we can even test this let's open the browser and hit the login right here and now we are authorized in next section we created fully functional products crud so let's have a look in the user interface first we open the table we have the nice animation we have the products we have pagination as well we have possibility of course to add new products we have also possibility to sort items by the columns mentioned right here by title or price with ascending or descending and we also have possibility to search products by keyword okay all that has been implemented in the following section and let's now see how those things have been implemented okay let's start from scratch we created the product controller the product controller has basic methods such as index which should return all uh, published all existing products we have in the database we have store method to um, to store the product with the image i'm not going to go through the old line right here um, then we have the show method to get a single um, single product we have update and delete right here basically basic crowd methods we have the product request as well for validation we have the product resource and only those fields are what is returned in the product resource and we have product list resource as well one is used for the table second is used for the form and we have products table and right here in this table we created a reusable table header cell component as well which handles the uh, some common stuff common logic such as sorting for example and this is a standard um, Vue.js table and we have uh, installed also Spati's Laravel Sluggable. So whenever a new product is added, based on the product title, a slug of this product is generated, and that slug will be used later. And inside the product PHP, we configured the model to use the title for slug generation okay so the next thing let's have a look in the products view this is the general component we have a button right here to show the model then we have the products table and product model nothing um, that like um, difficult okay and inside the product model we of course uh, listen to the button click and make requests for update or for um, for delete and we also added animation uh, using Talon CSS, and we also installed the Talon CSS forms plugin. That's for the for the inputs. Okay, um, I think we already have forms. I think we only added animation right here in this. And whenever we just reload the page, we see a nice animation uh, for each individual row. Okay, so it, it looks uh, like very simple, but actually like this dedicated section, this particular section, I think has um, about two hours of, um, of the full process, how this product scrud is actually fully built. And if you're interested, of course, to see this uh, full process, uh, check the full course on my website, thecodeholic.com. In this section, we have installed Talon CSS e-commerce theme into Laravel application and outputted all the products we have in the database. And we have also implemented the registration page in the theme design, uh, the login page, as well as forward password page and the password related pages, basically. As a theme, 
The following theme is used, Talon CSS e-commerce theme. If you want to see how I built this Talon CSS e-commerce e theme, you can check my other videos. It is built in two videos. First, you're going to see several hours, I think three hours video, how I built this using Talon CSS. And then you're going to see additional video, how I added Alpine.js functionality to that. Okay. But if you don't want to watch that, no problem. Just hit the download clone right here and grab the source code. You can get it is free and you can use this. And I'm going to actually use this, the following theme. Okay, so this is the theme we're going to use, but what we need to do. So first we installed Laravel Breeze. Once you install Laravel Breeze, it's going to create the following controllers under the uh, HTTP controllers auth folder. It's going to also generate uh, views under the resources folder. And yeah, we have installed Laravel Breeze and we, then we integrated our Talon CSS e-commerce theme and we have included our CSS files as well as whenever we need, basically we open the theme and copy and paste HTML files and just put them into views, our blade files and make them live, uh, integrate with the Laravel. So if we go now in the resources and views and open product index, for example, this is a template which is available in the uh, Talon CSS e-commerce template. We can actually have a look under source. We have a couple of HTML files and the index HTML is what basically outputs all the products. Product HTML is for the product details and so on. So whenever we need to create product details page, we're going to basically open this product HTML, grab the following source code, identify what is layout, what is not layout and what needs to be part of the blade. And just like this, we in integrate in our project. Okay, so here we uh, basically render iterate over our products and render them um, just it's a straightforward operation let's open actually product controller uh, i have i think we have it i have opened it somewhere okay if not then i will go into controllers and product controller so in the index page we select all the products and sort them by updated descending and for simplicity i have a pagination to five items and pass that to product.index inside which as i mentioned we iterate and render render them okay that's for the products now let's have a look in the uh, authentication so so basically we modified all the existing views which is offered by uh, Laravel Breeze. Uh, okay, let's open now these views auth. And if we have a look, blade. So this blade, a login blade PHP file basically contains the template, which is grabbed from our template from the login HTML. Okay, so we just took the HTML template, as I mentioned, and make it active, make, make it integrated into, into Laravel. And we also implemented email sending. So whenever the user is authorized, uh, not authorized, but uh, registered on the website, he's going to receive an email on registration and user clicks, of course, on the link and the user is activated. And this is done um, by adding, if we go now inside app models and open the user right here the user model implements must verify email okay and because of that basically uh, the user is not able to authorize into the system if he doesn't confirm his email address and if you open web php right here we are using this verified middleware which restricts the user um, from accessing the dashboard if the user uh, doesn't verify his email address and we created product um, product details page. This is the product details page. We can actually have a look right here. Click on this and this is the product details page. Okay, that is the changes that has been made in this particular section. And now the most interesting thing, the most interesting task starts and that is implement adding the items into the cart. And um, this is just an edited version what uh, which is also included in this course. So I'm offering this right now. It's a like, I think a one and a half hour, one and a half hour section of the entire course where we have this uh, cart management, adding items into the cart, removing items from the cart, having a dedicated cart page, etc. So enjoy that specific section. Now let's start working on the cart management, adding items into the cart, changing their quantities, 
removing items from the cart and we also need to add one important feature whenever you're a guest you can basically add items into the cart but after you log in or register your items which are in the cart needs to get associated to, to your account so before user is authorized we're going to save the items into cookie uh, so that user can navigate between pages like close the browser, come back later, and the cart items will still be in cookies. But if user decided to proceed with the uh, registration, login, and decided to basically register and login, and then these items which are in the cart needs to move into his account. And in the database, we're going to have them, of course, saved in the cart items table. Okay, so this is what we're going to actually do. We have to do a lot of things, so let's start step by step. Let's open our project and I'm going to create a couple of files. Like we will need controller, of course. Let's go in the HTTP controllers and we have to create card controller right here. I'm going to also create a helper. Let me actually, actually create this helper manually. I'm going to first create the helpers directory and inside there, I'm going to create a new PHP class called cart. So we're going to create cart helper. So far, so good. Now let's create controller, PHP artisan make controller. And I'm going to create cart controller. OK, the controller was created. It's going to be right here. And we will have to create also under resources views. I'm going to create a cart folder and inside there I'm going to create index view so let me just create new file under cart folder index blade PHP okay here we have it this index blade PHP will use the default layout so I'm gonna get this X up layout and put this right here and let's just print h1 uh, my cart items perfect and we're going to have right here this one should extend the controller extends controller where's auto completion this one extends a controller up http controllers controller and let's create right here index function from which we will simply return a view index. No, it should be cart index. Okay, so we will need, of course, to update the uh, web files, rules file, and we're going to do a lot of things basically, but let's start step by step. And I'm going to start with the cart PHP. Um, where is that, by the way? Oops, my bad. My bad. That is a helper. Let's actually call this cart helper. No, let's leave it. Let's call this cart. And I'm going to uh, remove this extends controller because I mistakenly extended helper. I needed to do this in the controller. So let's open cart controller. Here it is. And we need this method right here. Okay, but let's start from the helper, as I mentioned. And we're going to create a couple of uh, methods right here. We will need five methods right here. The first is get cart items count. We're going to display how many items we have in the cart in the navigation, in the header navigation. Second method we will need is get cart items, which will simply return an array of cart items we have. We will need get cookie cart items, which will return the cart items we have in the cookie. Okay, the get cart items basically will uh, analyze, will understand if the user is authorized, it's going to return those cart items from the database. Uh, if not, it's going to basically call get cookie cart items. Down below, we're going to need a get count from items, which will accept the cart items and return the count from there. Why do we need this? Uh, why cannot we call like get cart items or get cookie cart items and then calculate how many items we have right there? So we will understand this when we go in the controller because 
whenever we update the counter in the cookie, this is not yet saved in the cookie. Okay, this will be saved after response is sent to the browser. So in this case, we will need to accept and cookie items in the array, and we're going to use this in the, in the cart controller, so you will understand this. Okay, and down below, we're going to need final method, which will be move cart items into DB. Whenever a user registers and logs in in the system, whenever a user authorizes, basically, we will need to take the cart items which the user has in cookie and move them into database. Okay, so let's start implementing these methods step by step. So, first, we need to get the request. From the request, we get the user data. And we need to check if the user is authorized, we need to call cart item we are basically we are making query in the database so this method is called get cart items count so whenever user, user is authorized we query from the cart item table and we sum all the quantities for that user id okay basically if the user has two items in the cart the first item has quantity two second item has quantity three we sum all of them and we say that user has five items in the cart Okay. However, if the user is not authorized, we call get cart get cookie cart items, and these cart items will be simply an associative array, and we call array reduce on that. Okay, and we pass right there cart items and a callback function, and we basically sum the quantities from those cart items which are right here in this array. Okay, and this finally will give us the same result five. Okay, let's move down below and implement the second method, get cart items. So here we get the request as well, we get the user information, and we check if the user is authorized, we query cart items, all cart items basically, for that specific user, and we call map. So we basically want to map eloquent model into, a, into an associative array. Okay, why we need to do this? Because... Uh, we need to return the data in the same format from this function. And whenever the user is not authorized and the data is in the cookie, there is an associative array. So basically, right here, we, call, we give a callback function and return an associative array where key is product ID and, and one key is product ID and second is quantity. Okay? So basically, this one, this whole command will return an array of associative arrays where each element has product ID and quantity. Whenever the user is not authorized, we simply call uh, get cookie cart items. And inside the cookie, we save items just like this. Okay? So let's continue. And inside get cookie cart items, we get the request. And from that request, we call cookie with the key cart items. If that doesn't exist, we give it a default a string, which is an empty array. Then we decode this as an associative array. And finally, we return that, which will be an array. Down below, we have get count from items. We accept the items and call array reduce on that. Okay, so we pretty much do the same thing as we did above right, right, right here. Okay, so we uh, call array reduce, we give it a cart items, we give it a function, we give it initial value, and this one will return the number of items uh, in this cart items array. And finally, we have move cart items into DB. We get the request, we get the cart items from cookie because those items need to be moved into the database. Okay. Uh, we assume that whenever this method is called, the user is already authorized. So we get the request user ID, make a query in the cart items, and get all of them, and we index them by product ID. Okay, let's assume the following case, that a user has some items in the cookie and some items into the cart, into the database. Okay, let's say that user has item one two and three let's create a scratch file scratch text file for example and let's say that inside uh, cookie user has items one two and three with id one two and three however in the database in the db user has items one and 
three or or four. Let's do like this. Okay, so whenever user is authorized, we need to take those items which are in the cookie and not in the database and move them into database. So basically, after the user is authorized in the database, we're going to have one, two, three, and four. Okay, this is what we're going to have. And in this case, we basically don't care uh, quantities. So we basically move uh, those items into uh, the database. Uh, but if the item is already in the database, we leave with the quantity it was there. Let's say that the first item in the database has quantity 2 and the fourth item has quantity 1. However, in the cookie, the first item has quantity 3. Okay, and the second item had quantity like 1 and the third item had quantity 1 as well. So in this case, we aren't going to sum up the quantities of the items from the cookie and from the database. We will simply leave the quantity whatever was in the database. So finally, we're going to have the first item 2, second item 1, third item 1, and fourth item 1. Okay, this will be the final result in the in the database and that's what we are going to do so we basically um, get select all car cart items from the database and index them by product id so finally we're going to have an associative array of eloquent models where key will be the product id so let's continue and we create an array of new cart items and we start iterating over the cart items from the cookie and we check if the cart items from the cookie exists inside the database okay by this check we check if the cart items from the cookie exists in the database we continue we don't do anything if it doesn't exist we push this new item which is inside the cookie but not in the database into new cart items array and we give it a user id product id and quantity okay and finally we check if the new cart items is not an empty array we call cart item insert, which will finally save those cart items in the database. Okay, so we we have done uh, writing those methods, and the only thing we need to do is to import the cart item. So let's move at the very top and write import uh, cart item model. Okay, so far so good. Okay, now let's move in the cart controller and let me actually delete this index and create all the methods we need right here. We will need four methods right here. The first will be index, which we already had. Second is add, whenever we are going to add item in the cart. Then we're going to have remove and we're going to have update quantity, okay, which will simply change the quantity of the item in the cart. Let's start implementing these methods step by step. And let's start with the index. So first, we're going to call get cart items to get all the cart items we have, no matter if it is in the cookie or if it is in the database. And we have the cart items array. Then on the, these cart items, I'm going to call array helper plug method on the product ID. So I basically want to get a single dimensional array of product IDs. In this case, the IDs simply will contain, um, it's, it's going to be plain array with the IDs of the products. Okay, then I'm going to make a query in the database to select products by those IDs. And these products will be now eloquent models. Then on these cart items, basically I'm going to index those cart items, which were taken from the either cookie or from the database. I'm going to index them by the product ID. And now these cart items will be associative area where key will be the product ID and the value will be the cart item itself. Then I'm going to create a variable total. I want to calculate what is the total um, sum of all the cart items we have in the either cookie or in the database. Uh, because we want to display this total to the user in the interface. Then I start iterating over my products and... Basically, I'm going to sum up the product price multiplied on the cart items quantity and save that in the total. Okay, you get the idea. In the products array, we're going to only have those items which we have in the 
cart. So we start iterating those products and multiply the product price into the quantity of the cart item. And we save that in the total. And finally, we're going to have total, which will have the value. And finally, we're going to return the cart index view. And we're going to pass right there cart items, products, and total. There's a second way to uh, display the total, which can be done using Alpine JS. Okay, let's see which one um, we can go with. Like, this is a one way to do. I'm going to show you a second way as well uh, to display the total um, by Alpine JS. Okay, so let's move on and implement the add, me add method. So we get the quantity from the request. If the quantity wasn't given, we assume that the default is one. Then we get the user information and check if the user uh, does exist. We're going to uh, select the first cart item with the, given, uh, with the given product ID and the user ID. So we basically assume that there already is a cart item uh, with this product ID. Okay, we need to check if there exists this cart item, then we're going to update its quantity. Okay, and um, add uh, the quantity which we what we received in the request. And then we're going to call update on the cart item. However, if the cart item doesn't exist, this means that user is adding this cart item the very first time in his cart. And we're going to create a data as an associative array, give it a user ID, give it product ID and quantity, and save that in the cart items table in the database. Okay. However, we need to handle the case if the user is not authorized. So right here, we need an else statement. Uh, but before else, we need to return. Okay, whenever a user successfully added the item in the cart and the user is authorized, we're going to return the associative array where we will have only count key. And the count will be from the cart to get items count. Okay, which will uh, understand basically if the user is authorized, it's going to get the items count from the database. Again, have a look right here, get cart items count. Basically, the code will come right here and return the total count. Okay, so, and we need this count to update the number of items in the header navigation. Okay, now, now let's handle the else case. In else case, basically, we read the items from the cart. We can even use right here, we can even use the method get cookie cart items. Okay, it's going to basically do the same thing. We might replace it later. Okay, and then we, we have product found variable, which is by default false, and you will understand why we need that. Then we start iterating over cart items, and I get the each individual item by reference. Okay, that's also an important thing. So, and I check if the item's product ID is the same as the given product ID, which comes on the request. So we have to update, we have to do an update, in this case, item quantity, and this is the case where I need it by reference, because I update this item quantity and add the given quantity, which comes in the request, okay? And I also set the product found equals true, and I break this loop, because I updated the um, product quantity in the cart, and there's nothing to do anymore in this loop, So I, and I set the product found equals true. However, down below I check, if the product was not found, if we checked all the cart items with what we have, and there was no product with the given product ID, it means that we have to add additional item into cart items. So, in this case, cart items, we push a new item in the cart items, which will have user ID null, product ID, quantity, and price. And finally, we're going to save those updated cart items in the cookie, and we're going to give it a duration expire date for one month, and we return um, the same type of response what we returned right here with get count from items. This is the method what we created in the cart helper, get count from items, we give it cart items, and it basically calculates and returns a number. So this we need because the new cart item, if the product wasn't found, or if the product was updated, the changes basically made in the cart items is not saved yet in cookie. So right here we queue cart items to be saved in the cookie, but it is not yet saved. Okay, and this method is what we need in this case. 
Okay, let's move down below and we have to implement remove. For remove, we first get the user, we check if the user does exist, then we make a query in the database by user ID and product ID, we select the first cart item, we check if the cart item exists, we simply delete that. And we re return new um, response with the updated count. Because that cart item was deleted, we need to send to the user what is the current count. Okay, we need to handle the else case. In this case, we read the cart items again from the cookie. And again, we could use the method get cookie cart items. We might replace this later. And we start iterating over our cart items. Again, we get the item from the reference. Not sure if we need bioreference right here or not. But we check if the item product ID is the same as the given product ID, we call array splice, which works uh, internally on these cart items and modifies it. And uh, on that position, which is the index in this case, it, it's going to remove one item. So basically, if our product was the second item, it's going to remove the second item from the cart items. And finally, we're going to have cart items updated. And down below, we're going to again call Q uh, on the cookie. And we set this duration, give it expired date one month, and we return the uh, new count. Again, we call get count from items, given the updated um, cart items array. And let's implement the last method, which is update quantity. So here we get the quantity again. Uh, we get the user information. Again, we check if the user is authorized. And if the user, user is authorized, we select the cart item by user ID and product ID, and we call update immediately on that. Okay, if that exists, it's going to call update on that. Okay, if it doesn't exist, simply it's not going to do anything. And down below, we return a response with the updated count. In the else statement, we select the cart items from cookie. We start iterating over those cart items. And we select, we find the cart item with the given product ID. And we set its quantity. Okay, update quantity basically uh, means that we need to set new quantity for that. Okay, we don't uh, we, we don't have plus and equal right here, like we had whenever we were adding item in the cart. Instead, we set the given quantity. Okay, and uh, we, of course, save this in the queue with the expiry date one month, and we return the response. Okay, I think that's it right here. Do I miss anything? No, that's it right here. And the only thing we need to do is to import all those classes. Like, I'm going to hit Alt and uh, Enter to import the cart helper. Let's import the cart item. Let's import the cookie HTTP. Or I think it's uh, Illuminate Support Facades cookie. And what else do we have? We have to import the product. It's a app models product, not API, but up models product. And at the top, I think we have to import this array helper as well. Okay, I think we have imported all of them. And I think the controller is fully ready. Now, let's open web PHP and configure our Roads. Okay, what do we have right here? We have the index, we have the product view page, and we have the dashboard, which has auth and verified. Not sure if we need this dashboard. Uh, however, we need this uh, verified. And how we're going to do this? So basically, a guest user can add items into the cart, remove items into the cart, or basically, guest user can do cart management. And authorized user can also do cart management, but if the user is authorized and not verified, um, we basically need to force the user to verify his email address and he won't be able to do anything. Okay, so let's do like this. I'm going to create a new middleware. So, root uh, middleware. Why the auto completion doesn't work in my PHP store? Okay, and I'm going to call this middleware um, guest or verified. Okay, the user either needs to be guest or verified. Okay, and let's create group 
Okay, let me restart my PHP Storm. I restarted my PHP Storm. I think now it can autocomplete my code. So let's just create a group right here. Uh, we're going to, of course, accept a function right here. And inside that group, I'm going to put basically all my code. So this needs to be moved right here. I think we can completely delete this dashboard. We don't need that. However, we're going to create a couple of routes for the cart and let's start first making a, a group i'm gonna first give it a prefix so all my roles needs to have a prefix cart and i'm gonna give it also a prefix name like cart dot and then i'm gonna create a group right there and then we're gonna have road get or slash we're gonna have a cart controller uh, index method and let's give this name to be index and let's duplicate this three times we're gonna have add and we're gonna pass right here product with slug and this gonna be this is gonna call add method and the name will be add as well Right here, we need remove for product with slug. And we need remove right here. And the last one will be update quantity. Of course, we accept right here product as well and select by slug. And right here, we have the update quantity method. And the name should be update dash quantity okay so we have the rules ready we have the index method inside which we're going to re render all the cart items we have the add method we have the remove and update no it should not be updated quantity it should be update quantity let's actually uh, change this into use so instead of uh, writing a namespace replace qualifier with an import and we're going to have at the top import of card controller okay now i think we have to create this guest or verified middleware and implement that so i'm going to create i'm going to open the terminal and write php artisan make middleware and let's call this guest or verified guest or verified hit the enter okay let's open guest or verified middleware and basically, this uh, middleware is very familiar to uh, email verified middleware. So I'm going to extend this from email, um, ensure email is verified. That's the correct name. Ensure email is verified middleware. And I think right here, this has additional argument, redirect to root. So we have to add this additional argument. Uh, or no, we don't need, this is optional, basically. Uh, we just need to remove request from here. Okay. And we basically need to take this as an optional as well. So we get this optional argument and we need to check. So if the user, if the request user does not exist, okay, uh, the user is guessed basically. And in this case, we allow user to proceed and open the page. So we call next. Otherwise, we call parent handle. And the parent handle is the ensure email is verified handle. So we pass request, we pass next, and we pass redirect to root. Okay, and we have to register this middleware. So let's open open kernel php and let's duplicate this line and let's call this guest or verified and the middleware name should be guest or verified okay and comma so we have created middleware we have added in the root middleware so it should be properly used now and I think the root file is all also ready. And maybe we need to go now to the front end and implement the JavaScript. So let's open up JS. 
and have a look what do we have right here we have the toast data we have the header related data i think we don't need the header so we can completely remove this we have the product item uh watch list i think we are not going to implement watch list so i'm going to remove all watch list related methods uh, i think we don't need the quantity here as well we don't need the id because uh we can use we're going to use slug okay to make requests we don't we don't actually need the id so we need a to cart uh which uh we can clear up because we're going to implement from scratch and make requests to the backend and remove from watch list this can be actually changed and one additional method we need is um, change quantity so let's create this change quantity and we have to implement all of them so quantity okay i think this looks good uh even even id is not necessary right here so we have the method stops ready uh what is this this is a sign up form which we don't need that comes from the alpine js talon css template so we have the toast which we need we need to display a successful message whenever a user adds something into the cart and yeah i think we can already implement these methods but before that i'm going to create a helper file uh, inside the js and i'm going to uh, call this http js okay this will have this will have a few methods like get and post methods we aren't going to use any third-party package i'm not going to use axios in this case i'm going to use a fetch api so i'm going to create right here two or three helper methods for the fetch api okay so let's create one function and export that function and call this request this will accept a method url and some data and i'm going to create um, get myth get function and export that and post as well so get will accept only url and post will accept url and data and now we can implement those methods request get and post get and post basically will call the request the main thing right here is to implement request so let's implement get and post first the they are very simple we're going to call a request pass the method and the url for post we do the same thing however we give additional data variable now let's implement request first we're going to make a call of the fetch method and pass it url and we're going to also give it a, a additional object with the method and headers inside headers we will need content type to be application json and accept to be application json as well we will need csrf token as well so we're going to pass it x csrf token to be document head query selector and take this csrf token from the meta text and take its content and give it right here without that basically whenever we make post requests we are it's not gonna work okay we will get an error and right here if if you just want to change this into application x www form url encoded you can easily do it okay we need to pass an additional uh, property called body whenever the method is post whenever the method is not get basically and right here we check if the method is guessed we take the empty object and destructure it, and destructuring will not do obviously on empty object. However, if the method is not get, we take the body right here, uh, we take the data, stringify that, and give it into the assign it into the body, and then we destructure that. And just like this, we will be able to give the data to the request. Then we need to uh, give it a because this one will return a promise fetch we call then on that we get the response and we check if the response status is more than 200 and it's less than 300 which means that the response was successful okay we return response.json because on the fetch api you have to call uh, then two times to get an actual result uh, returned from the server okay so we call then one time then we return response.json 
this one will still return a promise and whenever we want to get the actual result of this request we have to do an additional then on that okay which will be done later in the app.js probably okay so if for some reason uh, the response was not successful we throw the error whatever we throw basically whatever comes from the result right here because this one returns also promise we await on that extract the actual value from that promise and throw that value okay so i think we have everything ready right here and we can now go into app.js and implement these methods in the add to cart method we make a post request to the given url what is this URL? So this edge to cart URL doesn't exist yet, and we're gonna create that. Um, we're gonna generate that URL using root Laravel's root function. We can have hard-coded URL right here slash cart slash add and specify maybe a slug, but this is not a good approach. We want the URLs to be generated on the Laravel side, so we're gonna do that there and we simply take that url which will have a string right there and make a post request on that okay and we of course need uh, need to pass the quantity as well and then inside the then we get the result and here's the interesting thing so we trigger we dispatch the alpine js event cart change and we give the result count so from the response from the cart controller, whenever we change something, add item into the cart, remove item into the cart, we return a response which has count right there. Okay, so this is this is the add method, and we return a response with count in both cases, whether user is authorized or not authorized. And right here, we take the result count and trigger the cart change and pass that count. And basically, Inside the header, we're going to have AlpineJS component, which will listen to this cart change and update the value in the header. Uh, I mean, in the header right here, update the value, whatever is result.count. Okay. And we're going to also dispatch another event, notify. And uh, toast, our toast basically listens to the notify and it will simply display this message if we want to see we can open up blade php scroll down below here's the toast component alpine.js component and here's the notify so notify on window so this one listens to notify event on window and calls a show method with the event detail message in this case this is the message we give and the show method is available right here inside the toast component okay so this one basically will show alpine.js toast okay and inside the catch we can simply print console log response if there's an, any error error let's print what is the actual um, error let's implement now remove item from cart we make post request on the remove url the remove url will be generated in the same way like a to cart url and we call then we get the result we call notify we trigger we dispatch the notify the item was removed from cart and we dispatch also cart change and we give it a result count okay and the last thing we need to do after remove is to remove the cart item from the cart items array okay what is these cart items we don't have this mentioned anywhere, but we will have this cart items mentioned in the cart page, in the blade. So when we will move into blade files and implement those, we're going to have cart items basically there. And in the cart page, whenever we click right here on the cart page, the items, cart items will be rendered using Alpine JS. Okay. And we simply, these cart items will be whatever will be rendered on the cart items page, and we simply remove the cart item from the cart items array. Okay, now let's move on. And we have to uh, implement the change quantity. We call a post method on the update quantity URL. We give it a new quantity. We listen on then, 
we call dispatch cart change we give it new quantity and we dispatch notify as well the item quantity was updated okay and i think just like this we have implemented all the primary methods uh, we needed right here we have to import this post function from the http so i'm going to hit alt and enter import post from http.js and this is going to be imported at the very top okay the only thing missing right here is add to cart url remove url and update quantity url um, php storm for some reason doesn't understand this what is this dispatch but it should work because that's a alpine js dispatch function okay i think now we can move into blade templates and modify a few things right here there as well as create the cart page okay let's open product index blade php index blade php and we're going to make a few modifications right here for example in the app.js we are using this add to cart url which is available on the product and this product basically is what we are passing right here on the product item okay so this object is the product right here so on that product we're going to add add to cart url and that basically will be to call root and give it cart add as a name and the product will be the parameter okay it will automatically take the slug laravel will automatically takes slug from here even right here we don't need to provide slug slug i believe let's check the web of php uh yeah we don't need to provide because we are selecting by the root key name and we already have the root key, key name changed in the model so we can specify product right here let's scroll down below and have a look i think we can completely remove this add to watch list button we don't need that uh, however, in add to cart, we don't need this ID as well because the add to cart is available on the product itself. Okay, so we save this and let's open the browser and let's let's the developer tools doesn't seem to be working. Okay, ensure email is verified not found. Okay, now let's test everything. I think we need we need to import that. What's that? Ensure email is verified, not found. That doesn't exist. Okay, let's import. Um, ensure email is verified. That comes from up HTTP middleware. Do we have it? No, we don't have this right here we need to import that from illuminate out middleware ensure email is verified so we save that and refresh the page and here is our index let's now inspect this and have a look in the network let's zoom out slightly okay here is our network and let's click the edge to cart button okay so the first thing is successful the request was made let's click on this and we have an error post method is not supported on this route okay i think we know the reason so let's open web php and right here we have all get requests so this one this and this should be post okay we save this and let's check in the browser and click add to cart once again okay we see the toast item was added into the cart and the request was successfully completed let's now open the application by the way let's see what is the response okay we see count one so this means that uh, the item was added in the cookie well so let's click once again now count is two let's go in the application and here are the cart items of course the actual cookie value is encrypted but i think we have successfully added item into the cart we don't see this um outputted right here so let's open 
uh, navigation blade PHP. And by the way, we need to change this into cart as well. So let's set this into root cart cart.index. And let's scroll down below. And this is the place where we need to make some changes. Um, okay, so previously in the template, we were using store header, but I'm going to remove this store header and right here as well. Let's move up. And at the top in the header, we have this X data mobile menu open true or false. So I'm going to create one additional property right here. And I'm going to call this cart items count. And as an initial value, I'm going to use the cart helper. And I'm going to call get cart items count. Okay, so cart items count corresponds to the following value. And let's move down below. And if the cart items count exists, then this will be displayed using X show. And we need to output in X text as well. Let's move down below. We have the desktop version as well. I think we made changes on the mobile version only. Let's remove the watch list. Uh, let's have a look. This is a different thing. Okay, here is the responsive, or I think this is the desktop. The above one is responsive. So we set this root, oops, root to be cart.index. We scroll down below. We set this into cart items count right here as well let's move down below and we have to remove the watch list from here as well okay now let's have a look in the browser we reload the page and we see two already immediately right here which is awesome one additional thing we need to do on the component. So this one header is already already AlpineJS component. Okay. Whenever we get the response, we dispatch the cart change and we need to listen to the cart change. So right here, uh, we're going to listen to cart change on window. And basically, I'm going to set cart items count equals to event uh, detail count. Okay, whatever we pass right here, the whole object is detail, event detail. And we need to take the count from this event detail. So I save this and let's have a look in the browser. I'm going to add one more item in the cart and we see three right here. Okay, let's add more items into the cart and we see the counter increases. Magic, right? No, it's not a magic. <laughs> it's just the correct implementation. All right, so we have now six items into the cart. And I think we didn't need to do anything on this page. We need to implement the cart page. So I click on this and we see my cart items. Now let's open cart slash index blade PHP. And this is the place we need to work in. Okay, let's now open the Talon CSS AlpineJS um, template, the front end template. And we have to copy and paste the car template. So basically, what do we need to do? Let me actually copy the whole container, this container, and let's put this in the PHP store and let's format the code and save this and have a look in the browser. Okay, so images are missing, but the template, I guess, is what we want. Okay, now let's make um, some changes. We don't want, of course, so many items because we're going to iterate over our items. So let me actually delete all the cart items and leave only one. Okay, how we're going to iterate. So from the cart controller, I think we are passing... Where's that? We are passing the cart items. Uh, we are passing the products and total. Okay. We get those uh, variables and they are available right here. So, you know what I'm going to do? So, on this div element, which is the wrapper of the cart items, 
I'm going to make this as an Alpine JS component. So I'm going to specify X data right here. Okay, just like this. And I'm going to specify cart items right here, which will be the cart items given from the controller, but I'm going to modify it slightly. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to also create a getter, get um, cart total. Okay. And this will be a calculated property. So, and we are going to return um, something from here. So basically, I'm going to run on the cart items reduce. And I'm going to do this something something similar I, I'm doing uh, on the backend side, calling reduce on the cart items to calculate the total. So I'm calling reduce on this. Uh, the initial value will be zero, and we multiply the product price uh, on the quantity and then add it to the accumulator. So finally, this will give me the total sum of all the cart items. But what are the actual cart items? I'm going to run here a PHP code. So using blade um, curl braces, I'm going to call JSON encode. So I'm going to take the products, products array, which is given from the cart controller. Okay. And the products are basically eloquent collection. Okay. So I'm calling map on this and we accept each individual product. And I'm going to return an associative array which finally will be JSON encoded and inserted right here. So JSON encoding will give us a JSON, which is also an array. And right here, we're going to have an array. Okay. So what do we have? We have ID, slug, image, title, and price. We give all of them inside the cart items. Plus, we give the quantity. The quantity is not available on the product. Instead, the quantity is available on cart items. And let's have a look in the controller once again cart items is indexed array so it's indexed using key by so the cart items is an associative array where key is the product id so right here based on the product id we get the quantity from the cart item okay and additionally i'm going to give the href which will be the product view page and I'm going to give it the cart remove URL, which is going to be the remove URL used in app.js right here. And we're going to have update quantity URL, which is going to be used also in app.js right here. Okay. So I'm basically mapping the eloquent model into an associative array, each individual model. And then finally, this will be JSON encoded. So I'm going to save this. Uh, we're going to save this and let's have a look in the browser so far. So I'm going to reload the page and let's view page source. Okay, let's scroll down below. And where is, where is that? Here it is. Okay, it has a lot of quotations. Should it be like this? I don't know. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Um, next, right here uh, on the div, basically, um, I think we need to do this on the div. I'm going to create a template and I'm going to run the for loop, Alpine.js for loop on that. But first, I'm going to make a check if uh, using x if if the cart items length exists. So if there are at least, the, if there is at least one cart item, so, and I'm going to wrap uh, everything, maybe using the checkout button. I think I'm going to wrap everything in this template. Okay, if there are no items, we this one will not be displayed. Uh, however, we will need another template. Uh, AlpineJS doesn't have else, so we're going to write x if if uh, cart items. I think we need to do it vice versa. So 
if cart I no, we're doing it correctly, excuse me. So if the cart items exists, then this will be uh, this condition will be satisfied. If cart items length does not exist, let's put exclamation mark right here. Then let's create um, one div with talent classes. Let's give it a text center uh, padding y adding y8 maybe text gray uh, like a 500 okay and let's write you don't have any items in cart okay perfect now we need to write a for loop and i'm going to do this for loop uh right here so template x4 uh, product of cart items okay let's format the code product of cart items and now i can access this product and this product uh, is something i can pass to another component and i'm going to create x data just like i have the product index blade let's move up so we have the product and this is the product and this product is passed to the product item so i'm going to do something similar right here and i'm going to call product item and i'm going to pass the product right here okay and what does this give me this give me the functionality that inside this component i can use the methods defined in the component like remove item from cart and change quantity and this is what i want let's go in the cart this is exactly what i want now let's let's save this and first have a look in the browser we should see a few items okay we see only three let's inspect this and have a look maybe we have an error uh no we don't have any error we have three items I think this is logical because we have three different items but the quantities should be um should not be one for all of them anyway let's implement now this uh the source will be it should be bound using uh colon product dot how do we call this image product dot image save this and have a look so we have now different images, which is good. Let's output the X text. That's going to be product dot title. Let's remove this. Save and have a look. We have different titles. Now let's take care of the price. The price will be product. No, it should not be like this. We should basically give this pun x text. And if we simply write product.price, this will print the price without the dollar sign. So I want dollar sign to be prefixed with that. So I'm going to use string literals, backticks right here. And I'm outputting the product price, which will do the same thing. So we see the product price, but I'm going to put additional dollar in front of that so now i refresh the page and we see dollar sign right here the css is something that needs to be adjusted and fixed and we're going to fix that however we have to i think take care of the quantity here we have that so on that select i'm going to give this one x model to be product dot quantity now let's have a look and voila we see that this item is added twice this is added three times this is added just once okay and i'm gonna listen to change of this drop down and i'm gonna call change quantity on that okay so far so good we can test this but let's add um right here click remove um remove how it's called the method remove quantity or remove item from cart 
Okay, this is what we need to call. And I'm going to call also modifier prevent just to call the prevent default. Let's format this input. Okay, so we have added the remove event listener. We have added the change. Uh, I think we need to add right here minimum needs to be one on this um, by the way do we need um, select right here maybe this should be an input and we can set whatever we want so let me change this into input uh, let's give this one the same classes and let's give it a X model and change uh, we give it type number and let's give this one minimum one in this case and let's remove the select uh, okay I don't like the width of this input so maybe we can give it a width of 16 okay this is good let's go in the network and see if the update quantity or remove from the card works fine so let's reduce the quantity request is made we see the toast item quantity was updated and in the header we also see five i decrease the quantity this changes into four i decrease the quantity it changes into three as soon as i keep increasing the counter in the header increases as well which is awesome so we have implemented the quantity change now let's remove the item from the cart let's remove the first one it was removed the item disappeared from the view which is awesome exactly what we wanted let's make a few changes right here a few css modify modifications so that this needs to be on the right and the height of this item should not be that large let's go in the blade template and have a look so we need to adjust the image dimensions first let's actually wrap this in anchor tag let's put image inside there let's give this one it needs href so and the href will be product dot href we specified right here that's a product view and we're going to provide um, some classes what classes do we need let's give it a fixed width like with um, 32 and height 32 now let's give this one a flex items center justify center and let's give this overflow hidden as well and on that image i'm going to give this one object cover so let's save this and have a look okay this is more or less okay so it at least it doesn't have that much hate there and every row will have the same hate which is good however this one has different width and this one has different width so width needs to be adjusted as well and maybe i can set uh mean width mean with something okay i can set this um I can set this later i don't want to spend too much time on the css and this is the place which probably needs to have a flex one let's see let's give flex one right here and remove from here have a look in the browser and yes this is what we needed okay so now this this one where's that so the whole div the whole right side so this div element the right div has the flex one and stretches fully and then we have the uh, two divs with justify between right here and justify between right here okay this gives us exactly what we want okay so we have implemented adding item into the cart uh, updating the quantity 
removing item into the cart and I think we haven't implemented the total quantity on the cart so basically we created a getter cart total and this is something what we need to use right here so maybe I will use X text right here and use cart total and let's have a look by the way this is not outputted why x if let's collapse this we have the if cart items length and this one is inside if that should work isn't it okay why this is not displayed um let's observe this once again so let me inspect and see where is the so we have the template okay this is something we don't need exceed cart items link this is displayed those items are displayed And this is not displayed. Do we have any error in the console? No, we don't. Then why this is not displayed? I'm on a cart page. Okay, let's delete the whole template. We have data. Then we have cart item. Do we need to clear the cache, Laravel cache maybe? Let's remove this. Okay, here's the here's the subtotal. Strange. So we save that. I think the reason might be overflow hidden so in fact it might be displayed no to be honest i don't see that by the way let's give this one uh, key product dot id And let's remove this again. And now this is displayed. This is outside of the if statement, if cart items length. Is it so? No. It is actually inside. Also, the button is not visible. PHP artisan cache clear. View clear. Why I don't see the button? I know I'm making some stupid mistake right here, and that's why the button is not displayed, which is very annoying when you make such mistakes. Okay, I think the reason might be that inside the template, it only displays the first element. So if I wrap this in a div, and format this let's save this and have a look in the browser here it goes that was it okay um, now right here we are outputting the card total let's actually use the backticks and usually use the dollar sign 
and now we have the total price formatted nicely so when you increase the number of items in the cart this one also changes and this is what we wanted and that happens through alpine js basically this re-evaluates and finally we have the updated price okay now i think what we need to do is first test uh, adding items into the cart when the user is authorized and also implement the functionality when user logs in or uh, registers and then logs in to uh, move the items from the cookies into the database okay so i'm going to log in and let's log in using zura and click login okay it redirects to dashboard and the dashboard doesn't exist so we have to find the root service provider and change the home into slash reload okay now i am authorized and my number of items in the cart basically is zero that's because nothing was moved in the cart so i'm going to open um, authenticated session controller and right here in the store after the session regenerate basically i'm going to call cart helper move cart items into db and i'm going to do the same thing in the registered user controller after store after outlogging okay so we save this and now i'm going to log out now let's log in when i log out you see uh, i have something in the cookie so it shows two right here now i log in and now i have two items in the cart the advantage of this is that it saves those cart items in the database and if i log in from another device I will have those two items as well in my cart. Okay, now let's say that I have um, those two items, the chair and the PlayStation in the cart. So I log out, I go in the cart, I remove all those items, and I see this text also, which is nice. And I'm going to add um, mouse in the cart. Okay, I have one mouse in the cart and two uh, items for the authorized users now i log in and they should be merged and i should have three items in the cart okay and look at this this is this is handy and very important feature by the way if you are building a production ready e-commerce application user experience is the most important thing you have to give to to your users all right and maybe we need to test the registration i have a, a user john which doesn't have email verified so as soon as the user logs in we get the following uh, message even if i try to open the cart or basically any other page it asks me to verify my email uh, email address so um, if i go right here and let's actually resend the verification email and here it comes i click verify email address and now i am probably authorized and verified and i'm able to see all the pages i need now let's log out i have mouse in the cart and i'm gonna register with another user mary mary at example.com let's provide the password okay and now pay attention okay i have one item in the cart the items from cookie was moved into the database for recently added user mary and i guess mary has id 4 and i of course get the verification email right here as well as soon as i verify my email address i will be able to access everything so i think this finalizes the uh, cart management no we actually missed one important thing adding items into the cart from the product inner page this is something we have not done okay whenever i click this add to cart button it should add the item into the cart 
and I should also be able to change the quantity and click it to cart. Yeah, this is something we haven't done. Okay, let's open resources, views, product, and view. And right here, okay, what do we have here? Let's search for add to cart. And on this button, we have this add to cart. It accepts an ID. Let's remove this ID. And it takes the value from the quantity from this input, which has a reference quantity L. I think this is good. So this one takes the value and sends it to the backend. So let's save this and test this. Go in the network, clear. We have this on six and click it to cart. Uh, maybe we need to reload the page first and click add to cart and it doesn't work and I think I know why because we don't have the product component in the app.js this is a this is a data and this data is not added on product so maybe what do we have right here this is a gallery this is image gallery and this one can be product section but i'm going to actually create x data right here and i'm going to call product item and we're going to accept product right here so right here basically i'm going to run um, blade uh, template expressions and then call json encode uh, we need to pass right here an array and then uh, let's open cart index and I'm going to copy the following or maybe we need to open product slash index blade PHP and we copy the following code we need to add to cart as well so and go in the view and paste that now let's format this okay here it goes so now we have product data and whenever uh, we call it to cart this should call the app js it to cart let's refresh the page clear the network and click it to cart for five items okay it made request and now we have six right here okay this is as easy as like that so we have the call-ups working we have we can set this into okay we need to give this one some minimum value minimum equals one reload the page you can go below one so click and now it's seven now let's add three there are ten we click on the card we see nine items right here we reduce the quantity and i think we finished the cart management so we have implemented the adding items into the cart from the list as well as from the inner page we show the notification we implemented the moving items from the cart into the database if the user is authorized um, we haven't tested this probably but if the user is authorized and we click it to cart it should create records in the database immediately how many records we have in the database we have totally uh, which user I am I am the second user I guess and there are four items four rows uh, in the database let's create let's add the laptop into the cart so click right here and it doesn't work here we found the bug add user ID to fillable property to allow mass assignment I think yeah we missed that okay now let's open cart item you need to test your code carefully so we put fillable right here and what attributes do we need uh, we will need user id we will need product id we will need what else do we need 
user id product id and quantity i guess we don't need oh we don't need anything else uh, and quantity and by the way the created it and updated it is not populated so we have to fix this one as well so let's save this and first trigger it to cart again okay now this was added in the cart and we should see one more record in the database for the second user product id one and now we have created it and updated it in this section we have implemented the profile details update as well as the password update and the html right here the template basically is taken again from the following theme so right here we have uh, profile html so that was grabbed and integrated into laravel and let's understand how this process was actually done and we have right here this checkbox as well so whenever you modify something in the billing address and you hit the checkbox it's going to copy that into shipping address as well so let's now understand how this was actually made so we first created the migration and that migration basically changed the states which was a text column into a json column because uh, inside the states we're going to basically save um array of states for a specific country okay states are relevant for uh, not for all countries like you for usa it's really um very relevant and that was done like this so we have also created country seeder inside there we just um, um save in the database few countries and for usa we save um like four uh, how many states we have we have five states for usa and we have four countries so these are just for the implementation purposes uh, i didn't spend time to save all the countries and all the states and we have the database seeder inside which we registered our country seeder and the most interesting part starts in the in the controller basically so in the profile controller so we basically render the view for the for the customer customer details we get the customer addresses uh, and if the addresses doesn't exist they are created the first time and we have right here store method which basically runs all the checks if the shipping address exists it's going to run an update if not then it's going to be created now we have a password update right here as well and we have created password update request with the validation rules as well as the profile update uh, request with all the fields and validation rules and the most interesting and tricky part is the components input that is that input became a very reusable input it has a support for select right there as well which accepts uh which accepts um options and renders basically like this and it has also validation support and few other good things have been added inside this input component and of course the view blade itself which as i mentioned is just copied and pasted uh, from this theme and we just uh, tweaked a little bit so we are using the alpine js to display the flash messages so as a result when we click on this update right here we're going to see this nice um, with progress bar message success message box that the profile was successfully updated and this is done through this alpine js flash messages and it's going to time out after this amount of time we are using a combination of alpine js and laravel right here to achieve the best possible result and the result is actually achieved so if i just remove the one field that's going to make the field required and this is done through both as i mentioned laravel and alpine js okay and just like this we have implemented the uh, profile update as well as well as the um, password update and now let's start working on the stripe checkout process and i'm offering you the full process of the stripe checkout which is i think about two hours or even maybe more the full process how to correctly correctly implement stripe online payments stripe checkout online payments in your project and how to configure web hooks as well so enjoy this particular section now let's start working on payments and we're going to do payments using stripe make sure to have an account uh, on stripe first i already created an account the process is very straightforward uh, like you we can google stripe uh, sign up it will give you registration page 
you just need to fill up the form and as soon as you fill up the form you will be redirected and you will have test mode enabled okay uh, when the test mode is enabled you can ex actually implement your functionality use the test um, publishable keys and secret keys but as soon as you want to go to live you have to provide a bunch of information to stripe and here are like five step uh, activation process uh, which needs to be completed uh, to get the permission to go live basically but as far as we are in the test mode we should be fine to implement uh, stripe all right uh, i'm gonna look for php stripe github package i believe this is the one let's open the second one as well i think the second one is for releases Okay, and let's move down below. You know, let me actually log in to change the theme into dark mode. All right. Okay, let's first install the Stripe package. So I'm going to get this and open my terminal and paste this. Then I think the readme doesn't describe every step uh, every step uh, that is necessary. So, of course, Stripe is a huge service and they have a lot of payment, uh, a lot of different types of payments, like recurring payments, one type payments, and few others, of course, subscription type and so on. So what we're going to look for is a Stripe. Let's first open Stripe documentation. And we are interested in to accept, accept a one-time payment. Um, accept a payment. Okay, let's find this. I want dark theme. I think I don't have it. Okay, I think this is what we want. So we have to set up the Stripe. Um, this is what we have already done. Then we have to redirect customer to the Stripe checkout page. And we have to create a button. Actually, we do have the button. If we go in the home page and we add a few items in the cart. Actually, I, I already have two items in the cart. So I click this proceed to checkout. Whenever I click this, we need to submit to our Laravel um, route and basically uh, generate a Stripe checkout session. Let's scroll down below and we will find uh, more examples. I think this example uses the Slim framework, which we don't need. However, this is what we need. Okay, so this generates a session and then we have the session URL. Okay, we can redirect user to the session URL. Let me actually grab this and let's open also, let's open cart index blade. This is the cart page. And here we have the proceed to checkout. So I'm going to generate form with action. Uh, root will be cart checkout. We're going to create the root. Uh, then we're going to have method to be post. Uh, okay, we will need um, CSRF, and let's move this up. Oops, I did something wrong. Uh, I, I have something copied, and I didn't want to cut this. I uh, didn't want to lose uh, the copied script, but I think I have already lost that, so that's fine. Now let's open web PHP, and let's put this right here. User needs to be authorized. So post request needs to come on cart checkout. Uh, we're going to use cart controller class checkout. Oops, checkout will be the method. And let's give this name cart dot checkout. Awesome. Now let's open cart controller. Scroll down below and create public function checkout. We're going to accept request, of course, right here. And let me now copy. Um, what do we need to copy? So first we have to set this set API key, and that's going to be the um, secret key. So I'm going to put this. We have to put the secret key in the env, of course. So let's open env. And, and let's look for secret. Let's remove this. AWS pusher stripe secret key. Okay, so we have some secret keys, uh, which is fine, but I think mine will be different because I, I haven't set these secret keys probably that came 
uh, out of the box. Okay, so let's search for API, or I think I have it right here, for developers, okay? And this is the publishable key, and this is the uh, secret key. So I'm going to click the secret key, and I'm going to copy this, and then I'm going to put this right here. Okay, I think this is mine. I, I think I have set this um, maybe before when I was uh, actually experimenting. Okay, now we have to copy the uh, publishable key as well, and I'm going to put this right here as well. All right, so we have them. Now let me take the Stripe secret key in the card controller and replace this with the get env uh, Stripe secret key. Okay, so now we have that. Let's open now documentation, and we have to take and create the session and then redirect user to the specified um, session ID. Okay, so what line items we have to pass? The line items are basically whatever we have right now in the cart, okay? Because we are on the cart page, we click proceed to checkout, and we have to be redirected to the Stripe checkout page. And we have to take those line items and pass it to Stripe. Okay, so we have um, helper, uh, I think it's called cart helper, uh, cart, uh, get cart items, we have those, cart items, and let me actually die and dump cart items. Okay, uh, let's reload the page, let's click proceed to checkout, and we see two cart items right here. And we have product ID and quantity, and I think we don't have anything else. However, we want the whole product information. So maybe we need to get the um, get the IDs and then make uh, make a query in the database to get the products. I think I have done this above. I think I'm sure I have done this. Uh, this is not add probably index. Yeah, we get the cart items, then we get the IDs, then we query to get the products, and then we have the cart items as well, which is indexed by product ID. Okay, okay, I can copy this, and this will give me the products. Let's go down below, and let's put this right here. Okay, so now I have products, and let me die and dump these products. Let's reload the page. Here we go. I have two um, two products, and let's go in the where are the attributes? Here it is. Okay, and we have everything what we need. And let's now create line items array. So I'm going to create line items empty array. Then I'm going to iterate over my products, and inside each line item, I'm going to push. Um, the following object okay let's remove die and dump and we will also need cart items to be indexed by a product id because we're going to use that for quantity so i'm going to get this actually you know what uh, now i see that i have code duplication okay so whenever i put this now i have these four lines duplicated in the first method and right here as well. So I'm going to extract this into a separate method and I'm going to call this get uh, get products um, get products and cart items just like this. Okay, I'm going to extract this. Okay, it found out that there was a second occurrence um, with the same code and I'm going to replace this one as well. However, right here I need cart uh, cart items as well. So this one probably returns products, but I'm going to return an array where we have products and cart items. Okay, I think a little bit formatting is necessary. Okay, let's remove this. Now we have products and cart items. Uh, I'm using this right here, and let's call list and take out products and cart items from here. Awesome, let's move up and modify this part as well. So we get list and 
cart items. Okay, I don't like code duplication. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's actually render the page to make sure that uh, rendering works fine. Uh, right here, I mean, it should be just cart page. Okay, here are my, my cart items, which is fine. Now, let's scroll down below, uh, right here. And now I'm going to set the currency to be USD because I, ha I have only USD uh, currency. I don't have like anything else. Well, then we have to specify, you know, let's specify line items right here. We have the product data and we can specify right here name to be product title or name, how it's called. Um, yeah, title, product title, and we have unit amount, which is product price. So we have product price. I'm recording this tutorial like on weekends, uh, because I don't have time, um, for like every, every day. And then it keeps forgetting me how my schema looks like. So apologies for this. And then cart item from the cart items for the given product ID, we have to take quantity. Uh, it's going to be an array, so we have to take quantity with the array notation. Okay, we have cart items. Let's actually die and dump cart items. I like to be sure that everything is okay. Proceed, we have two items. We have um, price. Okay, we have quantity. Perfect. Uh, let's actually test one more thing. I'm going to increase the quantity and then proceed to checkout. Now, let's see. The first one has quantity four. All right, so far so good. Um, we, can, we need to redirect user to the checkout page and we can actually do this. Um, let's return redirect. Uh, we have to specify. We have to specify right here probably session URL. And let's see. Let's reload the page. Invalid integer. Okay. It expects the unit amount. unit amount to be integer okay what is the unit amount i th i think that should be price right is there any explanation about the unit amount same at units unit amount but it accepts unit amount decimal aha uh -huh, i see so we have unit amount decimal as well like i found this right here somewhere unit amount is an integer but we have unit amount there there should be unit amount decimal let's try if it doesn't exist we'll find something okay here we go so we see this try payment page um, we have this element as quantity four, and it has price for each. And this one, this one has, <clears throat> I think the prices are too small. And I think I know why, because this accepts, expects, um, let's specify this unit amount. This expects in cents, probably. So we have to multiply whatever we have right here we have to multiply this on 100. Okay, let's go back below the page and let's click proceed to checkout. Yeah, okay, here we go. That's more like it. Okay, I want images right here. So there must be possibility to specify image right here. So let me actually explore this session. Now, this one accepts line items. Uh, validate params. We have an array. We have params. 
this one just validates then the params is given into static request we have params right here then the requests are request we have params right here request row um we have params right here prepare request okay this one just makes requests to the api it doesn't have any kind of a model uh dto type ob object which would show me uh what other properties does the product um, product data supports but i guess it should support something like image so let's try product um how it's called product image okay let's now go back and click proceed to checkout okay it did you mean images okay probably it has images array and let's convert this into an array not bad okay let's see okay this one um it should work let's actually get the image and open okay maybe because this is coming from the local host it simply doesn't work okay maybe that's the reason um dell laptop let me actually get one image from the google to easily pass that to stripe not this one like anything copy image address let's open and i'm going to put this right here okay let's go back now and click proceed to checkout and here we go yeah because the image was coming from localhost it didn't show up but this looks this looks good and we can make a payment and then we need to handle the success and failure okay let me actually go back and return to the product image this is how it should be and we have to specify right here success url and cancel the url let's actually create let's create um, different methods i'm thinking maybe we need to create a different controller not the card controller but it should be probably checkout controller inside which we will have the checkout as well as the success and failure let's let's create php artisan make controller checkout controller hit the enter let's open checkout controller let's create public function success we accept request and i just want to dump whatever comes from here and then let's create failure we accept request and let's dump request all here as well now let's open web of php and i'm going to change yeah we have to create um probably checkout as well checkout and let's move this let's move this into checkout however now we don't have these get products and cart items because that that was left in the cart controller so i'm going to actually take this and move into cart helper scroll down below and put this right here i'm going to change this into public and it should be static as well okay so self get cart items then array plug we get the ids then we make query we and we return what we need okay let's go in the cart controller and at the top change this into cart get cart get products and cart items and we have to do the same thing right here i'm using cart helper get product and cart items all right let's again test the cart page make sure we didn't break anything so far so good uh cart controller checkout doesn't exist that's fair we have to change this into checkout controller uh, let's change this into use 
and we have car checkout and now let's specify two more one will be uh, actually let's change this into checkout like this and it's going to be checkout slash success and that's going to be checkout slash failure and let's specify right here success and failure as well all right now let's go in the checkout controller uh, and let's modify this so we have to use root but i want absolute so i'm going to specify first the root name and it's going to be checkout success we don't have any parameters so i'm going to specify empty array then the third is whether it should be absolute or not and i'm going to specify true right there and let's do the same thing for uh, failure right here well before i test again uh let me die and dump what is this url uh, and what is the other url failure okay now let's go back click proceed to checkout okay that wasn't found let's reload the page proceed to checkout okay checkout success not defined um, okay okay that should be checkout success and that should be checkout failure and let it be car checkout no problem okay so we have checkout success and checkout failure this looks good now let's go again in the checkout controller and comment out this die and dump and let's have a look okay we have to provide uh, let's click proceed to checkout and let's actually use test card um, I'm not sure what is the test card okay let's check the testing section okay I think 424242 is the test card let's specify it okay i think this anything in the future will make sense and save my info okay i don't want this let's click pay i have to specify email so let me write so right example.com name on the card just Sura. let's try this click on pay okay let's see so we see success and now the get method is not supported for this road support methods post that's fine that's my mistake this should be get all right now let's go in the cart again whenever the user makes payment of course the items uh, in the cart should um, simply like disappear and um yeah but but right now we haven't finished yet let me actually test if the payment was made in the in the dashboard okay here i see and most of them are incomplete and one of them was succeeded i think this is the latest one okay so far so good uh, let's proceed now i want to disable the email and name if possible i can find this out later okay it should be in the future okay let's specify and click pay now let's see what information we have in the success okay we don't have anything what, what just happened was the payment made okay the payment was made but we are we are still on this page which is weird okay let's try this once again okay something um something doesn't work i think the problem is in the success url 
let's try to access to localhost um, what is the actual URL that is checkout success checkout success okay and we are redirected to the payment page again that's my bad we have right here checkout always that should be success that should be failure okay it's good it's good that it was my mistake and not something else okay let's now access to our application once again and click proceed to checkout okay how many payments we already have i think like four maybe three three successful recent payments okay let's make payment once again okay now let's see i want to see some kind of result and the result is empty it's good that um we got this um it actually called our action however we need to make sure that the payment was actually successfully completed okay we need to there must be something in the documentation about this all right let's start from the top okay we have implemented this this is fine then we redirect to this page okay so far it's good show success page let's go on the server side okay this is for two-factor authentication this is something which fails create products and prices upfront this is something we are not interested we don't want our products to be sent to the stripe upfront fine we don't want existing customers to be there or anything like this and we don't also have uh, discounts and taxes however what i am interested in validate whether the payment was successfully completed or not like it was redirected to the checkout success but i don't know actually whether someone else redirected this here or stripe did that so basically we have to validate um, the transaction in the stripe all right let's go in the third section again and um, we must have something okay so here we have the show success page it's important for your customer to see a success page after they successfully submit the payment form um, host this success page on your site okay that's clear but we want to validate next up the checkout session creation endpoint to use the new page uh, okay this is our um, success URL if you want to customize your success page read the custom success page okay let's have a look modify the success and uh, checkout session ID template variable I think yeah I think that that's what I was looking for so we basically need to put a uh, session ID in the success URL and on the success page itself uh, right here we need to get that session ID and retrieve the session from the stripe API okay and then from the session we can retrieve the customer and we can show thanks for your order John Smith however we don't have information about the customer because we we haven't don't have customers and products pre-edited inside stripe so we just need to validate if the session is actually valid or not and the session is a random random ID so like this is what we want to do all right now let's go in the PHP storm let's go in the checkout and I want to print um, session ID uh, that, by the way should be down below now let's open our cart page and click proceed to checkout and this is our session ID this is something which is random and no one can guess this so we have to 
provide parameter right here session ID. Let's actually go to the web and specify right here uh, session ID. All right, then we have to specify right here session ID. That's going to be that's going to be what? That's going to be something which is mentioned right here. Okay, check out session ID. Check out session ID. Let's copy this. I think we can specify this using question mark as well. Uh, if we just remove this, if we just remove this, well, I was thinking, yeah, like we can do it in both ways. Like if we leave this parameter right here, and then I will specify this is the um, session ID. And then, as we can see, if we just end dump this access URL, we will see how the URL looks like. Let's reload the page. Okay, the parameter was not replaced. That is something I hoped it would be replaced. But the easy solution will be to just remove this from here. And at the end, we just concatenate session ID uh, equals to, to this. Whatever is this. Okay, now let's, let's comment this die and dump. And we have the session ID. And let's go in the let's go in the success and let's get session ID from here. Let's actually scroll down below, find this portion. So I'm gonna get this, paste it right here. And from request we get the session underscore ID. Let's change this into underscore ID. And we have a session. Okay, retrieved from Stripe. And I'm going to die and dump session. And let's have a look. So let's reload the page. We must be redirected to the stripe. We are not redirected because we die and dump something. Session ID. All right. Let's continue. All right. Let's specify example.com let's click on pay all right now what do we have so we have a session id no api key provided that's absolutely correct so we have to we have to take this and Put it right here as well and just reload it and here we have the session okay if we try to get the customer this is just the customer identifier okay on the demo right here it tries to get the customer name but i think we don't have a customer name at least uh, i haven't tried so let's try to get the session and customer so we just reload the page and now let's scroll down below so we have the customer and what is the name of the customer name is test okay with whatever i provided that's fine so we can display a success message to test that hey your uh, payment was successfully completed and we need to remove the items from the cart as well okay let's now create success page we're going to go in the resources views let's find let's create new folder called checkout and inside there i'm going to create new uh, success blade php and we will need a failure as well failure blade php okay let's include x up layout or is it called so yeah it's it, it's called x up layout and let's just uh, write a simple message right here with some talon CSS classes bg um bg emerald 500 padding y2 padding x3 uh text white uh, rounded 
aimed let's put right here message uh thanks for your or your order has been completed mr or mrs someone let's just write name we have customer name comma your order has been completed uh, by the way we did this in the failure we should have done this in the success for the failure we should give some uh, message to the user let's actually change this into bg red uh, 500 and failure and let's remove this die and dump and we just return view checkout success and we pass we pass customer so far so good we reload the page and we see test your order has been completed test obviously is the customer name let's go and give this one width of like 400 pixel and let's give it also margin x auto so we save this reload the page okay here we have your order has been completed and the only thing which remained right here in the checkout we have to clear cart and we have to make order as well whenever the session exists uh, okay let's try to provide in invalid session id let's put additional one at the end hit the enter okay now we have problem invalid string must be at most 66 characters okay uh, let's just delete the last b and type c let's hit the enter that that error comes from um stripe no such checkout session which is valid okay right now we tried to uh, the the error basically was produced from this line session let's scroll down below we need to find the place where the error came from because we have to put this in the try catch uh, let's search for checkout control checkout controller here we have this okay yeah from the error comes from this line so we basically put this in the try catch we try to get the session um after this we try to get the customer if for some reason that didn't work uh, we get the exception right here and we know that the uh, session id is not valid and that's it okay however if everything is successfully we need to render let's just render it properly and right here we need to render failure and we have to render failure also if the stripe return with uh, failure obviously if the session id is wrong uh, someone else is accessing it's going to come right here and the failure and the, inside the failure we show uh, like your payment was not successful okay this is the message we can show but we aren't able to test the case when the session id um, comes right here but the session actually wasn't fetched from the stripe or or something like this okay just in case this happens let's put right here if session does not exist for some reason then we return failure okay we return with failure and otherwise if the session exists we get the customer and we render, render success uh success page okay so right here we get the customer so we need to do a few things we have to create an order let's go in the local host and we have to find orders okay in, right here we need to make request when the payment was successfully done we have the total price we have the status and we have also payments inside the payment we have the order id amount status and type and probably we should save session id as well 
inside the payments. So I'm going to create the payment basically is the transaction which happened in Stripe. So I'm going to create new migration to add the session ID to payments. So PHP artisan make migration add uh, session ID to payments table. Now let's open add session ID to payments table. And right here, we're going to create uh, this. We have to create string, not this, sorry, but the table string. Uh, let's make it, uh, let's give it name session ID. And let's give it length 255. Okay. And it basically must not be now. Or it should be now. Let me think. So the payment should be made whenever success page happens. Whenever Stripe accesses to the success URL. In this case, if we make um, if we make a payment, we have to provide session ID. Otherwise, it's it doesn't make any sense. So, but if we make the session, if we insert the session in the database right here. On the checkout page we can get the session id from here and insert into the database this is also something good to do i think this is this is uh what we need to do okay actually we need to make an order right here as well so we make order right here you make a payment right here order will have an um, status unpaid uh, payment Will be will have status of pending and then whenever on success page, success page we get the session id uh, let's extract this into a variable called uh, session session id we get this we make query in the database so we need to make sure that the not only session id is a valid session id uh, coming to us but the session also exists in our database created uh, previously somewhere right here okay if we make sure that this is the case then we proceed so let's create order data and what information do we need inside the order we need the let's open first order we have the total price and status like nothing nothing that important and we need the total total price of the order it's going to be zero by default. So right here we get the product price. So let me sum up to uh, total price plus equals product price. And the total price comes right here. Uh, we have to specify status as well. For the statuses, let's create an enum. So let's go in the app enums and I'm going to create, let me actually duplicate address type. That's much easier. Uh, order, oops, order status. Let's hit the enter. Um, this is going to be order status. And I think I have a typo in the address type. Yes, I do. Okay, inside the order status we have uh, unpaid unpaid and we have paid order is either unpaid or paid of course we can have like more granular statuses like pending and processing and so on and maybe we need that um, the order needs to have um, let's write paid maybe we need completed or complete Completed is better. Uh, complete. So whenever a user makes payment, uh, the user will turn into paid. Okay. And then the vendor, the administrator of the e-commerce website, can take care of the shipping, which is not handled in, in, the, in our application at the moment. And shipping will be handled outside of the application. And when this happens, then simply we will... Um, I just I just noticed that and then I just noticed that I have the editor zoomed out 
and that distracted me. Okay, let me actually zoom zoom in. So basically, uh, when the admin of the website will handle the shipping, the user, the admin can turn the status into completed. And just like this, we we're going to have the completed orders. Okay, so this can be just unpaid or draft. Both of them will be uh, the same. And let's create another enum, which will be uh, payment status. Let's change this into payment status. And the payment will be unpaid, or let's call it pending. And we're going to have paid and failed. All right. So now let's go in the HTTP controllers, checkout controller, and we have to take care creating orders. So we're going to take order status and it's going to be unpaid. Okay. So what information do we have? Total price status, like created at and updated at will be managed automatically, but we can specify created by and updated by, which will be in any case authorized user. So we'll specify created by, that's going to be user, but we don't have the user, right? So let's get the user. Actually, let me take this from, uh, from card controller or from a profile controller so let me copy this and put this right here so now we have the user id let's duplicate this for updated by and now let's open order model order php and let's add right here fillable to be status we have total price we have created at and updated at. Okay, I think we created the migration and we wrote, but we have not actually finalized it. Uh, the session ID, this can be nullable, by the way. So let's specify, we decided that it can be nullable. And in the down, let's just drop the column, drop column. Uh, session ID. All right. So let's let's have a look again. So now we have the order data, and we are going to create order equals order order create. We don't need to validate the data because we know what we are inserting. Right? We have the prices. And we have the unpaid and IDs. Okay, we don't need to run any kind of validation in this case. And we're going to have order. And I'm going to simply var dump. Let me actually hit the dump. And I'm going to var dump the order. Then I'm going to create the payment data. And for the payments, we're going to have oops, uh, order ID, amount, and status the amount will be the same as the total price so let's specify first let's specify order id order id that's going to be just created order id then we have to specify amount that's going to be total price we're going to have status which will be payment status pending and we have type as well. By the way, is the type required? No, no. Yeah, the type is required. But in this case, um, like the payment type can be uh, credit card or cash or check or etc. So I think in this case, we can just always specify credit card. And we have created it. Um, no, created by. Create debt will be managed uh, automatically. So we have to specify created by. Let me actually take this code and paste this right here. And we have the payment data. And let's create now payment. Payment. Create. 
with payment data. And let's now dump payment as well. And maybe exit right here. Okay. This is getting interesting. Now, let's go in the cart, hit the enter. Okay, and click proceed to checkout. Okay. We have order ID to fill. Okay, we didn't. I think the order was created. We can check this. Yeah, the order was created. We have the total price. I'm not sure if the price is correct, by the way. Uh, created by, updated by is not presented. Not sure why. Uh, let me actually dump the user ID. Uh, yeah. The user must exist. Uh, I was thinking maybe I was doing something wrong, but the user must exist. So we have to have created by and updated by. Uh, however, I have specified something else right here. Okay. Now let's open payment model. Payment.php. Okay. Let's open from here. And let's add fillable to be order ID, status, um, what else? Type, and created by, and updated by. All right. Now let's reload the page. And now let's have a look. Amount doesn't have a default value into payments. Okay, we haven't specified amount here. Let's reload once again. And we have something looking successful. Int 8. Int 8, I guess, is the authorized user ID. Let's reload the page. Okay, now we have the user ID for orders. And we have one payment this is looking good so we have three orders because for two of them it was simply failed we can delete the first and second even we can delete this uh, but we have to delete first payment i'm curious why amount is 587 so i think i know i think i know because i didn't multiply this on quantity right Exactly. So right here, I have to multiply this on quantity. So let me actually extract this into a variable called quantity and then move this up and use quantity right here. So I save this and I reload the page. All right, now let's have a look. So we have the total amount inside payments. We have the order ID. We have the payment uh, type and everything that is necessary. However, we don't have session ID because we haven't run migration. So PHP artisan make, uh, no, migrate. Okay, now let's see what happens. There's no column with name ID on table customers. What? Rename customer ID column. Okay. I think while I was testing, uh, I broke something that uh, will not be a problem on your on your case. So I think I have uh, some migrations down, and it is not marked in the table. So let's check the migrations. The last migration, rename customer ID into user ID. Let's see. Let's see. Database, migrations. Okay, that should be the name. That should be the name. Uh, that, that's going. That's not going to be a problem on your uh, machine because, like, uh, I was first preparing and doing the project, and then recording, and uh, I gave it slightly different name while I was recording, 
and I guess that is the problem. So I will simply take the name of this migration and put this right here. No, this is something wrong. Let's go in the migrations. This one, the last one. Rename customer ID into user ID is what is in the database. However, we just have rename customer ID column. Let's go and change countries, states column into JSON. This is something which needs to be run, right? Uh, let's see. But again, I think that is already run. And simply, we have to add a new record. Let's try to migrate. Change country state column into JSON. Okay, so far it worked, so I think there is no problem. Let's go in the countries. Again, that was problem on my computer. That's not going to be problem on yours. However, if we open now payments, we should see session ID right here. Okay, and this is something we need to also consider right here when creating. Let me remove the user ID. Let's remove order and let's specify right here session ID. That's going to be session ID. And let's add session ID into fillable as well. Session ID. All right. Let's remove this. Now I have session already created. Okay. I have um, payment and order already created. So let's scroll down below right here. And we have to now grab the payment. Okay. Payment equals uh, payment. Uh, let's get query where uh, session ID equals to session ID. And we're going to get one. Okay. This is going to be the payment. Uh, let's actually do this. We get the session ID, we get the session. Okay, if the session doesn't exist, that's fine. Then we get the payment. Okay, and then we can do one more check. If the payment doesn't exist, if the payment doesn't exist, or if the payment uh, status uh, does not equal to payment status pending dot value not dot but value then we return to checkout failure otherwise we get the customer and we show the success page as well as we have to update the payment and the order and we have to mark them uh, as paid like payment status Let's do like this. Payment status equals payment status uh, pale, paid uh, value. I think the value is not necessary. Let's, let's see without the value. And what else? No, we, have, we can... What else do we need? I think nothing. Like we have updated by, but that's going to be the same one. Status, we just need to change the status. Okay, we change the status, then on payment we call update, and we have to do the same thing for order. So we get the order from payment. Actually, we need to set up the relation. So let's open payment, and now let's create public function order, which should return as one. Return this has one uh, order and I think that's it so the payment has order ID so that should have a correct reference to the order and that should return order uh, let's get the order and let's let's far dump order um, let me actually dump this. I, I need the pre-tags as well. So I have the order. Now I'm going to change the order status to be order status 
paid and what else do we need to update we have the status to be paid and nothing else so we change the status then on order we call save not save it update and just like this we finish the success page so we get the session id we make query in the stripe we make sure that the session exists if that doesn't exist we return failure then we query payment from our database uh, and we can put this status by the way here uh, the session id needs to be this and the status uh, should be equal pending right so payment status pending if the payment doesn't exist with the following criteria, then we again return with failure if the payment exists then we mark it as paid and update and we take the order of this payment and mark it as paid and update perfect all right now let's test this let's reload the page let's provide correct information let's write john smith and let's click pay now let's see your payment was not successful and there must be reason for that okay either payment doesn't exist didn't exist or session didn't exist let's start typing everything let's start Let's type uh, print session and let's print uh, payment and let's also um, throw exception. Let's reload the page. Okay, collection update does not exist. Let's look for checkout controller and payment update didn't work because right here I called get. Okay, I need first. I think Laura was right. I have an error. Let's reload the page. And now let's see. Orders payment ID. Okay, that's orders payment ID in we're close okay that's something which I didn't expect so payment has one order a single payment cannot have multiple orders right so basically payment should have this has one order strange so I have to specify right here foreign key will be id and the local key will be order id if i specify this it's going to work but yeah i didn't expect that um i'm going to find out more about this but let's reload the page okay we don't have any error that's good so we have the session scroll down below uh we don't have payment however and then we have a problem now why don't we have payment let's click on payments and we have the session id right and yeah I, the status is already paid that is the problem which is logical because we had an error right here so let me update this and change into unpaid and click go now let's let's go in the checkout controller and remove our dump statements uh, i'm going to leave order let's reload the page payment wasn't successful again we have a problem let's undo and reload what is the payment status it should be pending pending yeah, so like we are debugging and we're testing and we're making sure that it doesn't break so we don't have a security hole here. 
now what happens? So we have session and we have everything in John Smith. Your order has been completed. This is the most satisfying message um, so far. So let's remove this. Let's save. And if we just reload, the payment wasn't successful, obviously, because our session ID was already used and payment was already marked as completed. Let's go in the failure blade and give it also width, just like we gave to success. So that we show this in the center. We reload. Okay, so far so good. Of course, the uh, design of the success or failure message can be improved, um, but yeah, I'm going to leave this as it is. And now I'm going to do final thing in the checkout process, which basically will remove the items from cart. So we can leave this throw. No, we shouldn't leave that. So probably in the checkout failure, I'm going to pass a message. And message in this case will be E uh, get message and we need to accept the message in failure let's put this in the h1 and then we have a paragraph inside which we output a message if the message exists we output that otherwise we output empty string and from the other failures, like we can specify message uh, payment does not exist. And right here we can specify message um, invalid session ID. Okay, fine. Now let's delete the items from the cart so i think the cart has remove item from the cart let's open cart controller and remember how we do remove now we do remove for a single item in this case we have to remove items completely from the cart and if the checkout happens we know that they are uh, the cart items are definitely in the database not in the cookie or somewhere else so why don't we simply run um, delete on cart cart item delete and we have to specify i think uh, user id user id uh, not sure if i'm doing Correct, so let me actually search for this Laravel um, bulk delete. I want bulk delete. Something find and delete. Something find and delete. Is that correct? find each delete the question i think the question is slightly different probably uh, the user probably wants to trigger the events as well i just want bulk delete i don't care events so let me try uh, cart item find and then delete so let's run Where's the find? Let me actually copy. Find and delete. So let's run query. Do we have find here? Find, specify a user ID corresponds to current user ID. Do we have the user? Think we don't have the user so I'm let me actually get the user from request and put this right here and then call delete 
Okay, let's see if this works. So we have five items in the cart. Then proceed to checkout. Let's provide email. John Smith. And let's save this. Save my info. I have to provide my phone number. Okay, let me actually leave this. Now let's see. Your payment wasn't successful method. Okay, delete collection, delete does not exist. Okay, so let's go back and find another another example. Something, find, and delete. Okay, this one gives you an error. This one looks like correct. Product destroy. Okay, I, it's not a problem. I can iterate over my products and just delete them. If there is... I don't want to just lose um, much time on this. I'm going to go back and then find out and fix that. Seems like we are in should work. Let me actually just search for into Laravel documentation. Um, eloquent delete. Let's look for delete. Deleting models. Don't we have like bulk delete? help page okay fight we are delete that should work we are delete now let's I think I think it's not gonna work because the uh, payment would be marked as paid. So let's actually change the last payment into pending. And now let's reload the page. The order has been completed and I don't have items in the cart. Congratulate me. Or I will congratulate you. So we have successfully implemented a now checkout process, the whole process. I wasn't actually prepared for this process. You probably noticed that. Now I just had a very, very minimalistic uh, research um, where was the Stripe documentation and uh, things like that. So yeah, we, we made it. So now we have um, order in the orders. We have actually few orders two of them are paid and of course in my account we have the my profile and my orders page and the next step will be to have my orders page inside which we will see what items we have purchased in this order as well as see uh, whether the order is paid or not uh, even if we just uh, add items into the cart and go to the stripe page this is the interesting thing go in the stripe payment page and then I close this or just cancel or do anything else. The order is made and the order is unpaid. And that will, now we have how many? One, two, three, four. We have four orders. I reload and we have now unpaid one more order. And this will show up in our My Orders page for sure. And we can, we can probably implement to pay it later. Okay, we can start working on My Orders, I think. Now, let's create new route for orders page i'm going to define right here route get slash orders and let's consider there is order controller for this maybe you can create controller first php artisan make controller order controller Okay, controller. Okay, 
let's hit the enter and now let's use order controller class and the method should be probably index then we have a name orders dot index okay we we might have one more url which is going to be orders view with the order specified order let's replace the uh, qualifier with an import and in this case that's going to be view okay we have the in we have the roots ready now let's go in the order controller and let's define index we get request and we're going to make query into orders so orders equals order uh query well we have to specify where uh where the current user i think i have copied somewhere the current user information so i'm going to paste this right here so query where user id corresponds to user id and i'm going to call paginate on that returning 20 orders and then we're going to return view with orders index and pass their orders okay let's create now view resource we have car check out layout product so let's name it into singular form order index and we have the product so i'm going to actually duplicate this product and call this order and then i'm going to clear up everything inside index i'm going to get right here orders and i'm going to clear up everything from view as well i just duplicate because like my php storm um when i i have scaling increased then the right click opens um in the second screen the context menu basically anyway so we have the uh we have the uh view ready so in fact if we now go and open navigation and find orders and change these I think we have a second match for this and let's change into both um now i have multi-cursor one is above somewhere one is here uh root order dot index so we save this and reload the page order index not defined i think we called it orders so let's call it order index order view Okay, what just happened? The home page. The home page doesn't work. Where are the products? We have the products. What did we do? <laughs> I I did what I shouldn't have done. So I modified the product index and product view. Okay. So I'm going to revert this using git. And this is what I should have modified. Okay, that should be orders. And should clear up everything right here. H1, order, H1, order, view. And that is H1, orders. We have template for this but let's have a look so let's click now my orders unknown column user id in where clause i think it's called created by right so let's open order controller created by is the user okay we have orders now let me open vs code because we have somewhere orders okay and i'm going to copy now 
copy this container and put in my order index right here and let's have a look in the browser okay this is my orders and we have what do we have so we have the order number we have the date when the orders was made we have status we have subtotal and few actions like we have view invoice or pay if the order is paid of course we aren't going to show this we just have view invoice okay let's actually try to implement this and output actual data so here we have tr i'm going to use php uh, no actually we can use blade why should i use php for each uh, orders is order and right here we have and for each and let's just output view information let me actually um delete the other trs all of them leave only one and it's going to have the root to order dot view we have to specify right here order as an argument and let's output number whatever is the order number so order id is the number in this case now let's output date it's going to be order created at we're going to output the status order status and let's output price order i think it's called total price and then this is view invoice and this is pay okay we will take care of these buttons but let's have a look so far we have unpaid and paid let's let's modify this so we have the status and we have to conditionally add classes okay so right here we are going to add if order status equals order status paid paid we're gonna make this let's move this down we're gonna make this green uh, bg okay i think we had this like green color or it was called emerald where was that uh, let's search for paid here it is bg emerald 500 okay let's give it bg emerald 500 if the order is paid otherwise we don't give anything okay but we output the order status for sure uh, no let's see let's remove this pg gray we can put this in the else okay let's specify right here maybe value okay if the order status equals paid we have bg emerald 500 else we have something else that doesn't seem to be working let's check this oops that should be that should be right here isn't it yes it is okay here we go we have paid and unpaid actually let's try to change this into small yeah i think better okay so we have the date we have the subtotal and we have the buttons let's disable the pay button if the order is actually already paid so that is the button we can completely 
remove or like disable it let's actually remove so if uh, order status let's actually do like this so I'm gonna open order PHP and I'm going to create public function is paid which will return this uh, status if the status equals to order status uh, paid value okay and I'm going to use right here is paid if the order is paid uh, let's do like this if the order is not paid in this case we show the link and we can do something similar right here if the order is paid that's much shorter then we show um, emerald color so now we don't see the payment button for two of those but because those orders are not actually paid we can actually click and pay that's also really useful um, we can implement this however um, let's first implement the order inner page now let's actually implement this now let me think so the order needs to have its own session ID let's check not the order but the payment and order has a single payment okay like in the complex applications a single order can have multiple payments but in our application order has a one payment only it could be even in this like we could even combine orders and payments in single table that would not be a problem however let's check payments so we have four payments but we have five orders like three and four let me actually delete three and four because i think they don't have yes they don't have um payments so i'm going to delete this fourth we only leave five six and seven all of them have session id so if we go in the payments i delete all of them and not all of them but a third and uh, with the id come on and fourth okay now we have three orders two of them is paid one of them is unpaid however whichever is unpaid we also have information about uh, its session ID okay and we can get the session from um, from stripe and redirect user to the payment page let's do this so I'm gonna open now again checkout controller and let's create uh, one more function by the way we don't do anything in the fail right so let's put this right here uh, however the message will be um, your payment wasn't successful or something like this okay let's give it an empty string because we also have a message inside the failure view itself all right let's create a um, function called checkout with session ID we get the request and I'm gonna get this session ID uh, we're gonna get the session ID from the URL right so let's open Weibull PHP and configure route for this uh, check out uh, but with session ID and check out with session id check out with session should be the view name so i'm going to get this now let's go in the order and we have this payment button however i'm going to turn this into button and I'm going to create form right here with action uh, route uh, checkout with session and provide right here uh, session ID however 
uh, I need to get the session ID and I'm going to get this from the order. So let's open order. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to create right here public function payment, uh, which has one. So order has one payment. Okay. In, in theory, it can have multiple, but in our case, it has only one payment. And we're going to return this has one payment class. Okay. And right here, I'm going to get order payment session ID. I pass this session ID. Uh, let's change the method into post. And let's give it CSR as well. And let's close. Let's close the form and format the code. Okay, now we have this form if the order is not paid. Now let's go in the checkout controller and we are going to get session ID right here. Session ID. That's coming from web PHP from here. We should get this. Okay, so now we have the session ID and I'm going to get the session and here is the method to get the session and we have to take this as well. So I copied both right now and I'm going to paste first this and second using multiple cursor um, I'm going to pass the session ID right here. Uh, the session might even be expired and in this case you have to generate new session. Okay, I'm thinking maybe uh, maybe it's a good idea to always generate new session um, when you click when you click pay. I think that's gonna be that's gonna be good. In this case, checkout with session. I'm gonna rename this and call this checkout uh, checkout order. And in this case, I will get I will get the whole order. Okay. No need. Let me actually delete this. And let's change this specify order. Checkout order was renamed. And checkout order right here. Let's open this part. And that should be changed into order. And I'm going to pass right here order as well. Okay. Now, whenever it comes here, I'm going to die and dump uh, entire order. Let's save this, reload the page, and click pay. Okay, here, here is the place where order comes, but what is this? Okay, what is this? Let's go in the orders and click on pay. And we see this, which is fine. Now let's go right here and find the, basically we have to copy uh, the code from checkout, but maybe um, not just directly copy and paste, but we have to uh, do something similar what we are doing in the checkout. So first we need to have the user information and the, we have to set the API key for Stripe, so we do this. Next, we have to take the order items. By the way, we don't create order items. Yes, we don't do that. So we have to make records in the order items as well. So let's go in the checkout page where we create uh, orders and payments and all of that. And let's create order items. So order items needs to be created for sure after order is created because we will need the order ID. Um, and we have to create as many order items as many products uh, we have in the cart. Uh, we can directly create right here because we will need the order ID as well. So I'm going to create... Uh, by the way, we have line items. But that's not, that's not what we want. So let's create order items array and we're going to push inside order items 
we will push the following information. Uh, we will push the product ID, product ID. We're going to pass quantity and unit price. Product price. Okay, now let's take the order items and after the order is created, uh, let's leave comments also. Uh, create order items. We have to iterate over our order items and I'm going to call order item create and I'm going to give each order item needs to have order ID as well. It's going to be just created order ID. And then we pass order item to the order item create. Okay, let's leave comment create create order and create payment. Okay, now we have order items. We should test this once again. Now, but let's now select the order items. Okay, I think we don't have order items, so we're gonna delete everything, every order what we have, or at least unpaid order. Let's actually delete all because they need to have order items. So let's click delete. Yes, no, first we need to delete payments. then orders okay now let's go on the cart page we have only one let's increase the quantity and let's add second product keyboard now we have totally three items we're gonna proceed to checkout okay we have to open order item and add right here billable uh, we need order id we need unit price we need order items product id and quantity product id and quantity so we save this let's create by the way here order return this has one order plus not sure if this this will work without specifying right here for in key and anyway let's leave this let's reload the page i think it will create now second order because it should have created order previously as well this one has ID 8. Let's check order items. So we have now two items with order ID 9. So I think we can go in the payments, uh, not payments, but in the orders and delete the eighth one. By the way, I think everything right here in this uh, checkout controller, whenever we create order and order items and payments should go in a single transaction because if one of them fails all of them should be rollbacked okay so now let's specify okay your order has been completed and now we have order items right here let's go and add now two more items in the cart mouse and playstation and I'm going to go to the checkout page, but don't pay that. Not a valid URL. Strange. Really strange. Okay, I think this problem is coming from the images. As I found out, because we are giving right here images from a local host domain, and that is not accessible by Stripe, 
we get this error. It's strange why previously we didn't get this error. Uh, previously, images simply we are not displayed, but now we have this problem. So let's open and comment out this line. We don't pass images at all and simply reload the page and have a look. I spent quite a lot of time on uh, finding out what the problem was and that was actually the problem. So now let's proceed and let's have a look. Now we should see Basically, right now, at this moment, the order must already be created. I think we want to create unpaid order. So we have one order, which is order 9, and I guess this is paid. Order 9 is paid. Order 10 is unpaid. Actually, we don't need to uh, like populate anything. So imagine the case that the user opened the payment page, but simply closed the top, didn't do anything. Okay, so we have to show that order in the, let's leave this, in the my orders and here we go here we see that okay and we have view invoice and pay whenever we click pay now this should trigger the same type of payment process let's now scroll down below so it should come right here and the same thing should start but now let's actually copy and paste uh, some code so we have to basically we're doing this uh, let me actually copy this part down below and now we have order we have to take the order items so let me create right here line items equals an empty array then we start iterating over order items and the order doesn't have items so let's define it right here public function items this uh, has um, as many okay we return this as many order item specify class and i think we don't have to specify anything else let's have a look at least so we have the order items as item inside line items we push the same type of array we have okay here we go and we have the item quantity we have item, we don't have item title, but the item, every item has access to product. And we can go to the product and take the product title. So let's open order item. And just like we have has one order, we need to duplicate this and uh, return has one. That should go to product. Okay. Order item has one product. Uh, let's put this has one here as well. And now from the item, we go to product and the product has title. Uh, also, uh, for the price, we have this price in the as a unit price in the order items table. So we just take unit price. Okay, now we have line items array and we are passing this uh, into the session create. Okay, let's move up. Uh, so whenever we do this, then we take the uh, session uh, URL and redirect user. We don't need to do anything else right here. So we simply redirect user. We already have order. The order is obviously unpaid. So we simply redirect user to the session URL. Okay, now let's reload the page. Let's click on pay and let's have a look. So unknown column, products, order item ID. This is really strange. Uh, I need to find this out. So Laravel has, has many. Okay, let's quickly find out. Has many. Okay, post has many, comment. And this assumes that the comment has post ID. Okay, now how do we do this? So if we go in the order, we see that the order has many items. And the order item has many, has order ID. Okay, now let's open um, order item and talk about the product has one so it's clear for has many and i guess um for the 
let's go in the checkout for the iterating over the order items that should work okay we should be able to get the items uh, let's now search for has one okay has many comments no we need has one let's see has one example the latest order that's probably coming from the product okay latest order and it has order let's see in other examples okay that through is basically using a junction table many to many relationships uh, we need this one like user user has one phone okay the first argument passes to has one okay that's clear we get the phone and it is assumed that the phone models automatically assume that have user ID okay so it's it means that the phone should have user ID okay not not understood now okay not the user should have phone ID but if we want from phone to access to the user belongs to user now inside the phone we would put belongs to okay this is something I was missing if we open now order item uh, right here for the order I'm gonna put that the order belongs to the order item belongs to order and we can leave this because I think it will assume that the order item should have um, order ID and we will do the same thing it's not gonna return has one in this case and let's put this right here now all right so I think we can add belongs to to be returned from here belongs to all right now we should be able uh, to get the product and now let's have a look so we reload and we don't have any errors it looks like and it's going to redirect us to stripe okay attempt to read property title on now okay it, w it wasn't able to basically mm, get the product because right here we need product sorry so we reload the page and here we go so we are on the stripe page now let's um if we proceed and if we proceed and pay then we have to handle the payment successfully now we have the checkout success but the checkout success is a uh, url which is for checkout uh, for from cart but now we are actually making payment of an existing order so does it actually make sense so if we go in the checkout success in any case we will get the session id okay this is what we have to change so right here when we generate the new session we should take the session id and update the payment okay we have order right here if we go in the order um, the order has payment and now right here i'm gonna get order let's zoom in order payment uh, we'll have a session ID and this session ID equals to session ID so we update the session ID and let's call order uh, payment save that's gonna update the session ID and let's go back and let's have a look in the orders not the orders but in the in the payments okay the second one has this this is actually it's um, session ID let me copy part of it and then when I click pay it's going to generate new session and it should update right here so if I just reload the page right now that should be different yeah now my search uh, copied uh, session ID is not basically 
found on the page. So the session ID was updated and now whenever the redirect happens, the we can use the same uh, same success URL. Okay. In this case, in the success URL, the code will select the payment. Now first it will valid validate, then it will select the payment and then uh, goes through the same process and uh, update the payment and the order which is excellent so now if i proceed and if i fill up the information oops and click on pay that should change the order into paid let's let's have a look okay so your order has been completed now if we go in the my orders both of them are paid Okay, but one very important thing uh, when building a production-ready online payments system. Uh, and I have to reproduce this. Okay, now let's add one more item in the cart. Go in the cart, proceed to checkout. The order was created at this moment. Uh, let me paste this. And now... Uh, be uh, like be careful so I click on pay okay and as, as soon as I get the green button green the payment is done I'm going to close the tab okay okay now what happened is that the payment was completed but the redirect didn't work okay and if we reload now payments page we see that the um, the order is actually uh, made and the payment is pending and if we open now stripe dashboard let's go under payments and the very latest payment is this one okay now you see we have the latest two payments uh three uh, seven eight six which is the previous one and the latest one which is succeeded three nine nine okay this one is succeeded user actually paid but mistakenly maybe closed the tab or the electricity was off and uh, that happened and the order if the user now this is the this is not something else okay let's open the our closed tab and now if the user goes in the my orders we see that the order is actually unpaid by the way the item is in the cart which is something um, we should change so let me actually the items from the cart is deleted on success but that's not that's not correct so let's take the cart item and that should be deleted as soon as the order is created order item is created and the payment is created we delete the items from the cart okay this is small improvement but in any case uh the order is unpaid even though the uh, like al almost 400 dollar was taken from the user's uh, account so for this uh, Stripe has webhooks and the webhooks uh, will be triggered from time to time uh, if the uh, success URL didn't work Stripe will send webhooks and you have to provide those webhooks let's go in the payments again um, in the Stripe dashboard and I'm gonna go in the uh, let's actually look for uh, webhooks okay developer webhooks and Okay, I actually I was testing and I generated a few webhooks, but on the webhook section, like we have the API keys right here, and then we have webhooks. By the way, I have this webhook key which I'm gonna delete. So you won't have this. So I'm gonna delete that. Let's confirm the password because I'm gonna generate a new one so that you can follow. Okay, now if you go in the webhook section, uh, we have to add an endpoint while we are doing this on a local environment on a local host we can test in local environment and we have to use the stripe cli for that okay but as soon as we deploy this project on staging or on a production environment we have to provide right here endpoint urls which will be for webhooks and we can also configure uh, the events on which the webhook should be triggered for us 
So let's click an endpoint and test in local environment because right now we are doing everything locally. So we have to download the CLI. I'm going to click the download CLI that will redirect us to the get started with Stripe CLI. And we have a few options right here. OK, so on Windows, for example, we can go to the um, GitHub following link on Linux. Uh, we need to go to the following link and download the tar -GZ. Let's go on Windows. I'm going to open this in a new tab. And right here we have uh, the release and we have the zip file. We have to download the zip file. I'm going to click on the zip file and it's going to trigger the download. I actually already have it downloaded. So now let's open this. I opened that and extracted the zip file. And inside there we have the only file is Stripe XM. And that is the file uh, that is the Stripe CLI. Okay. Now let's go in the browser again. And we don't need this, we download it. Uh, okay, now we need to log in into the CLI, and that is also written right here. Okay, so we have to do login. I'm gonna click on copy to clipboard. Actually, I don't need to click on copy to clipboard, it's very small to type, and even um, just Stripe login will not work in my case. I'm gonna now bring up the CMD, okay, CMD or Git Bash. If you are gonna use CMD, first you have to navigate to the folder where the Stripe XA is located. Okay, I'm going to paste this and navigate. And right now I can already um, use the Stripe XA file. So uh, let me actually write Stripe XA login and hit the enter. Okay, this one will uh, ask me please enter uh, to open the browser or visit the following uh, URL. Okay, I'm going to simply click enter right here which will start the authorization process for the stripe cli and this will ask me to allow access to uh, my account information and look at this so right here your peering code is excelled amused poised up at something and it asks me if that's the information you see on screen yes I allow the access access is granted now I can close the window and return to the cli I already have access to CLI. So let me clear up everything. And now following the documentation, we need to forward the events to uh, my webhook. So basically the webhooks are triggered by Stripe. And whenever we start listening to the webhooks and forward that to local, uh, Stripe will send it to my local server. And my local server at the moment is running on port 8000. So this is an example. I'm going to copy this and now paste this right here. However, the executable is called Stripe XM. Listen forward to localhost port 8000. Okay. And I'm going to specify the path to the webhook. And we don't have path yet. Let me actually move this uh, in the corner, just like this. And now let's open PHP Storm and create path for that. I'm going to open. Um, Web PHP and define the route for the webhook. We have um, redirect callbacks and let's actually create let's create now two roads, uh, but that's going to be post roads. Uh, one will be webhook success and it's going to use let's use the same controller checkout controller. Um, yeah, let's be checkout controller. Okay, and that's going to be called success. And the second one will be failure. Well, basically, I think we only need one webhook. Okay, webhook uh, stripe. Let's go to webhook stripe and webhook. Fine. So if we go in the checkout controller, we have to create this webhook right now. However, uh, let's actually do it like this. I, I want to just follow the error. So we have the webhook which accepts the post requests. Now what? Now what to do? 
Now let's go in the documentation again, and on the right side we have the uh, sample endpoint. Okay, this is how uh, webhook PHP should look like. We have to install the Stripe PHP, which we already have. We have to start listening to the localhost 4242, which we are not doing. We are listening on localhost port 8000, and we have to uh, configure it like this. And we can already, by the way, let's put this in the corner. We can already specify right here webhook uh, slash stripe okay this is now listening to webhooks and it will redirect to the webhook stripe okay but we have to trigger webhooks as well so now uh let's actually open another cmd let me copy this open another cmd and i'm going to put this in the left corner and we need to navigate to the folder and now let's have a look in the documentation again down below we have the stripe trigger and the event okay here we have a lot of different types of events uh, but right now we're gonna uh, trigger the payment intent succeeded so i'm going to copy this and open the second terminal and open the right one as well and i'm going to uh, put this right here, okay? Stripe trigger, but let's specify Stripe XA trigger payment intent succeeded, and whenever we hit enter right the right here, Stripe will redirect the event to my local domain. Let's wait. Here it comes, okay? Charge succeeded, payment intent created, payment intent succeeded. Okay, these three events were sent to my webhook. And all of them return with status code 419. And that error code identifies that we have CSRF validation on post requests. We have to disable CSRF basically for the following uh, endpoints. So I'm going to open now the file, which is called app. Um, where, where it is? Um, let me actually double click uh, CSRF. Verify CSRF token that is located under app HTTP middleware. Uh, verify CSRF token. And right here, we the by default is going to be uh, empty. And we have to specify a webhook slash stripe. Whatever, whatever is the URL. Okay. So in the web PHP, we have webhook stripe. And we have to specify right here webhook stripe as well. So we basically dis disable CSRF validation for this URL. Now, if I try to trigger the same event, it's going to succeed and return with the status code 200. Okay, what happened? It doesn't send right now. Okay, here it is. It was returned with 302. Let me restart this. Well, it's triggered once again. Okay, we get this with um, 302 because probably because we don't return anything. Okay, if we just return response uh, with empty response, but the status code is 200, and by default, the status code is 200, by the way. So let me trigger this once again and on the right side we still get 302 webhook stripe webhook stripe let's open webphp we have webhook stripe which is post why should we, why why are we are getting 302 we should not be getting, but let's actually keep um, following the instructions and then we will identify the problem. Okay, on the right side, then we have to we have to validate the signature of the payload. Okay, we have to read the payload and validate that. So the very first thing what we need is to uh, set the API key inside the stripe. So we will still need to take this. By the way, the user is not used here, so we can remove that. And we set this Stripe API key as the very first thing. Second is that whenever we run our um, redirect, let's clear up, uh, 
uh, it tells us what is the webhook. Uh, here it is, uh, webhook signing secret. This is webhook signing secret. So I'm going to copy this and basically put this somewhere in the comment right here. And then if we copy everything from the documentation, this is the endpoint secret, by the way. So let's copy everything and paste now this right here. And let's format the code. Okay, the only thing is endpoint secret, which should be this. Okay, we set the API key, we have the endpoint secret, we read the payload, uh, we read the signature header, okay, and then uh, we try to construct an event from this payload, signature, header, and endpoint secret, and if there is any error, we return either 400 or, um, yeah, 400 basically in different type of errors, and finally, if everything is okay, we return with 200. I'm going to actually change this with return response um, empty string with 400 and I'm going to actually return this with 401 and with this 402 because that helps me to debug if there is this error I get 401 if there is a second error I get this 402 when I was testing I was getting the signature verification exception uh, very often and it took me huge time to find out the problem the problem was that the time zone in my computer was mixed up and the time wasn't correct and the header basically contains the information about the current timestamp as well and that needs to be validated as well so that's why i had this big problem okay make sure your time is correct when you are doing this and finally i'm going to return with status code uh, 200 return response 200 okay so far so good we have everything what we need now let's bring up the terminals and we are listening and now let's trigger okay we still get 302 which is weird we should not be getting this webhook stripe webhook stripe Okay, why do we get this? Let's actually open uh, and change this into get. And then I will try to access this in the browser. Maybe I, I'm going to return everything. I think I know why. I think I know why. Because we have this root protected in the auth and verified. That should be, that should be accessible uh, from anywhere. Okay, because the Stripe uh, can access... Yeah, okay. I think it's very obvious, very clear. We should not have this in our verified because Stripe is accessing uh, this URL and Stripe obviously is not authorized when making requests to this. Okay, so the webhook needs to be accessed from anywhere without authorization. Okay, so when we do this, now let's have a look. So we trigger again and now on the right side we get 200. Okay, so it was successfully completed. And if we now go in the webhook, um, we actually cannot dump the information right here and see. However, we have this payment intent. And that payment intent contains uh, everything what we need. So we know that payment intent succeeded and we can mark the uh, payment as um, like uh, the payment and order is paid. Now let's go in this Stripe dashboard and go in the received events and look at this so we see what event we received okay we received the whole everything right here is um uh, is event okay and we have data object look at this we have data object and that is the event uh, that is the payment intent at the moment right here so we have the id we have the object amount what amount received um uh, well, we have charges as well. However, I'm looking for if we have anything related to a specific session. Payment intent, payment method, fingerprint, receipt URL, succeeded, client secret. What is the client secret? I think that's not 
the that's not the session ID. I want the session ID to identify which order should I mark as paid. Now, we are listening webhooks and then sending the uh, intent, but why don't we listen to webhooks like this, but don't actually send it manually, but try to make a normal payment like this one, for example, which is considered as unpaid at the moment, even though the user paid. Let's click pay right here and let's provide the user information. And by the way, if we increase this, so we're going to get information uh, not only about like payment succeeded, but payment intent created. So whenever we open this page, it's triggered this payment intent created. So let me actually do like reduce it and click on pay. Now let's wait. Okay, right now payment succeeded. I think I, I had to close the tab, my mistake. So let me actually go to the cart and proceed to checkout. And let's provide. And again, when this form was opened, another payment intent created was triggered in my opinion. Okay, here it is. And checkout session completed. Sometimes this CMD uh, is stuck and until you hit the enter, it doesn't show the progress. But here we see this payment intent created. Okay, now let's click on pay and I'm going to close the tab as soon as it turns into green. Okay, I close the tab and we got a few information like charge succeeded, checkout session completed. And now we should payment intent succeeded. Here it is as well. And let's go in the Stripe dashboard and we see that uh, this is checkout session. We are looking for payment intent succeeded. And if we if we're talking about the uh, checkout session, we get the session ID as well. So previously, because we were testing some test data, the ID was obviously wrong. But if I look for a payment intent succeeded like 31 seconds ago, we should have some kind of identifier um, for the session. Okay, customer created. This is something we don't care. Payment intent succeeded. Okay, so we don't have uh, the session ID for payment intent succeeded, but we do have session ID for uh, checkout session. We have the amount as well, the correct amount, 399. However, can we know from this event that the yeah the status is completed but basically so if the checkout session is completed then we know that the user actually completed the payment so right here instead of payment intent succeeded so we uh, said checkout session if that is completed then we also take the ID, which is the session ID. We have the payment intent and we get the session ID from payment intent, um, just ID. Okay, and then we will do the uh, whole process like we were doing in the success right here. So we get the session ID. Um, we can also retrieve the session, but I guess that's not necessary. We select the payment. We update its status, we update the order as well, and 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 then we return uh, the customer, push the customer to the view. So if I just take this portion and extract into a new function, and I'm going to call this this update um, update order and session, and we only pass session ID or session underscore ID, doesn't matter. So let's create this update order and session method, private method down below, and I'm going to paste my code here. Okay, so I get session underscore ID right here. Uh, let's format the code. I select the payment. If the payment doesn't exist, we return uh, view. But uh, we have to we have to be careful here. Uh, if we return view from there, we have to return view from here as well. Okay, if the payment doesn't exist, 
we return payment doesn't exist. Why don't we simply throw new not found HTTP exception? Is this the correct one? Just throw new HTTP not found. Okay, let's throw this exception. And in other case, we will update the payment and the order. And we're going to take this code and put this in our webhook right here as well. So if the event is checkout session and we get the session ID and we selected the order, if the payment was not selected, we throw not found exception, but if that was selected, we update status and that's it. Okay, now if we go in the browser and have a look, so we're going to have um, this order actually is already paid. That is the payment. Let's go in the orders. Okay, we have all of them paid. Now let's open our website and add item into the cart. Let's go in the cart, proceed to checkout. We have this uh, webhook um, redirect enabled. Let's provide some details. And let's hit pay and I'm going to close the tab. Okay, so I close the tab, reload the page, and we see that the order uh, or the payment is pending. Now let's see right here, we got um, checkout session completed. Okay, I think we made a small mistake right here. It's not simply checkout session, the event is called checkout session completed. Okay, let's listen to this. So we get the session ID, we update the order, and just like this, then we, we, we will return mm, 200. So now the order will stay pending. So let's, let's open the tab again, go to websites. Now we can go in my orders and we see this is unpaid. I'm going to click pay on this. Okay, let's provide information again and let's click pay. And I'm going to close the tab again as soon as it turns into green. Okay, close the tab. Okay, let's have a look. Now it's already paid. Look at this. And if we have a look right here, we see checkout session completed. Okay, chart succeeded, checkout session completed. Okay, this works fine. Mm, however, let's test one more time because whenever we don't close the tab, like this might be triggered and as well as redirect and then when we select the payment which has should have status pending one of them might fail okay let's let's see let's have a look so let's open the tab and let's add one more item now proceed to checkout okay and let's have this also opened or maybe I'm going to clear up everything and restart it okay and now let's click pay and have this open so we get succeeded check out complete and now look at this so your payment was not successful and that happened uh, that happened because the webhook actually triggered earlier than the redirect, okay? So on this redirect, we have to make few modifications. Uh, here it is. Let me actually look for uh, success. So here it is, and we get the session ID, and we have to update uh, or order and session. So maybe we can make a small change right here. So I'm going to take this out. And we're going to accept uh, payment here, which is going to be an instance of payment model. And let me actually remove this mixed. And I'm going to change the notation into, well, we don't even need session ID. We just pass the uh, payment. Then from the success, we select the payment first. But on the success webhook, we only select the, let's select the payment if it is uh, 
ending or completed. And then we check if it is completed, we still show success to the to the uh, user. So, but if it's failed, we are not going to do anything. So we have pending, uh, paid, and failed. So let's put right here. Let's ch change this into an array, and we're going to select pending payments or payment when pay payment status is paid. Okay, if payment does not exist, then we're going to throw not found. Uh, however, if payment exists and the payment status is called uh, payment status paid, this means that webhook already succeeded and then the redirect happened. So we have to show success message to the user. So basically we have to put this right here. Okay. Or we can do vice versa. If payment status equals pending, it should be either pending or paid because we are selecting only these two statuses. If the status is pending, then we update, um, then we update the payment and we're going to pass right here payment. Okay. This accepts payment right now and we're going to accept payment. We're going to pass payment. Uh, and, and what? And then the payment will be updated with the order and then we show success message to the user. Let's find the second place where we are passing the session ID and we have to select right here. Um, okay. We have to select payment right here, which... Okay, in this case, we can assume that the payment is pending because it looks like webhook comes earlier than the redirect. But just in case the redirect comes first, uh, we have to select only. No, we have to select um, completed as well. Okay, if it's completed, we won't do anything. Or simply in this case, so we get the checkout session completed. Okay, let's select only pending. And if that doesn't exist, we don't do anything. Okay, simply, if that exists, we will update it. Otherwise, we just don't do anything. Okay, now let's test one more time. We are creating something which should be used on, on production, right? So, proceed to checkout. According my, to my observation uh, in my, my past few years, uh, like a lot of time is taken on to actually test your product on multiple use cases. Now, hit the enter payment. Okay, payment session, uh, checkout session completed, but here we have another error. Yeah, the order has been completed. We got this. Uh, we got multiple, we got multiple succeed. So, Customer created, succeeded, payment intent succeeded, but session checkout has 500 error. And I think we can have a look at this error inside storage logs, Laravel log. It's going to be probably huge, right? So let's scroll at the very bottom. And what is the error? Let's see. Argument one, payment must be type of payment, string given. Okay. That's right. Laravel is right as always. So we pass payment right here. Now we need one more test because we want everything to pass. I, I, low, I um, bought a lot of things from my website. And click pay. Let's bring up this. We see them coming, all of them succeeded, and payment was not successful. Okay, payment was not successful. Well, let's understand why. So, we tried to, we tried to fetch the session, invalid session ID. So we, we don't see this message. Your payment wasn't successful. Let's open this checkout failure, by the way, and see what we need view. 
Okay, your payment was not successful. You see that the message is empty. Okay, if the message is empty, then this stuff didn't happen. Okay, what might happen is this, some exception. Okay, let's open Laravel log and see if there is any new exception. Update session order, okay. Okay, no, there's nothing new, or at least let's try to reopen this. No, that's not that's not a new message, so let's close it. So obviously there was um, an error. The error might be we get the first payment. If the payment doesn't exist, we throw not found exception. If the payment is pending, we update that. And then in the exception, I think the problem is right here. Okay. So there was some kind of exception, but because we should have the message displayed somewhere, right? If we inspect these, we have a paragraph which is empty. Okay, we have to we have to throw maybe throw an exception from here and do one more test. Let's into cart and then check out okay now here we see not found and the not found happened because the payment Okay, maybe this doesn't work. We're, I expected this status would be um, in this, but I think that doesn't work. So that should be where we are in status in the array. So let's remove this. Now let's go back. Okay, one um, one another thing, like we are throwing not found exception right here, uh, but that will be caught by this. So maybe we need another catch, which will catch not found, not found HTTP exception, and simply throw that exception. Uh, otherwise, we will take this and display it. Okay, but that should already work. Okay, we don't have any items and it to cart and proceed to checkout and where's my information it didn't save i think or it did i don't know i don't want to provide my phone number at the moment so let's fill up the form and click pay let's open this Okay, everything completed and your order has been completed. Now I think we have everything good and let's check now our payments. Okay, the last one is paid. If we go in the orders, we see this is also paid. If we go in my orders, we see uh, that all of them actually is paid except this one. So let's pay this one as well, just to make sure that uh, the payment from the orders also works fine. Here is the intent that was created and your order has been completed. If you go in the my orders, we see all of them is paid. Okay, I think this is the full flow of Stripe. So you configure not only redirect URLs, success and failure, but webhook as well. And you have to test your webhook because that is um, that's a fallback case if the redirect failed for some reason. Okay. Okay, now let's implement view order or view invoice functionality. If we go in the design, so when we click on this order number, 
um, it opens the order details page. We always see the order number, date, status, uh, what is the subtotal, and the items, what is inside the order. And if the um, order is not paid, we have make a payment button right here as well. If we go back and click view invoice, that basically doesn't do anything, but uh, I think we need to show a model maybe inside which we will have invoice. Okay, but let's first implement the, um, this my, my, this should not be my orders, that should be an order with some specific number this page basically so for this let's now close everything uh, i'm going to close all the tabs i have opened and now let's open order order controller and create function view we we will get order right here and we have to render return view uh, order dot view and we're going to pass order okay however we need to make sure that the order belongs to the user who is actually trying to um trying to view the order so i'm going to get this current user and we can accept request right here i think we can get the current user from a simple function do we have that function? I think no. Okay. Anyway, so uh, we, I think we have a request. Request user. So basically no need to accept a request argument right here. So we get the user. And we need to make sure that the order belongs to the user. Okay. So we check if the order created by... That can be done in the middleware as well. Uh, but yeah. I'm doing it right here so if the order created by equals or let's say doesn't equal to user id then we throw new forbidden uh forbidden forbidden i think we don't have forbidden exception do we have unauthorized unauthorized we do have unauthorized let's go in the unauthorized exception and maybe we have some other exceptions here as well exception we have validation exception and basically that's it we don't have forbidden exception well let me actually return in this case return response response with message you don't have um let's put this in double quotation marks you don't have permission to view this order and we're gonna pass 403 or maybe we need to render a page which is specifically for this for simplicity i'm gonna do it like this because that's, that's a uh, basically case uh, when someone is trying something illegal or um, something which is not actually possible from the user interface okay so in other case we will render the order so let's now open order slash view blade and let's delete this and now i'm going to open vs code and open order details page and let's copy this container and put this right here let's format the code and have a look in the browser uh, let's reload the page okay it doesn't seem to be linked properly let's open let's open index blade as well and let's see we should have wrote order view we're, we're passing order now let's open web.php and see we have order right here and the order uh, sorry okay this is how it should be okay orders and maybe we can specify URL like this so if I just reload the page now we see URLs look correct in the bottom left corner of the screen so I'm gonna click the first one and it's gonna open the order view page and we have to implement this so if we go right here uh, the title which is called my orders that should be order number 
whatever is order ID. Uh, then we have order number right here as well, order ID. Uh, order date, we can specify it right here, order created it. Uh, order status, let's format HTML nicely. And for the order status, we're going to have order a status. However, we have to change this as well. So we have to add the conditional classes right here. If the order is paid, then we're going to have a class PG Emerald um, 500, maybe. Otherwise, we're going to have PG Gray 400. Uh, that's fine. Subtotal, let's output order um, amount. I think it's called amount. We're going to fix if something, um, if we have a typo. So let's just reload the page. And what happens? Okay, this is what happens. Subtotal order amount. Okay, it seems like the order doesn't have amount. It's called total price. Okay, total price. Now we reload and we see total price. We see order status. We see order number as well. And now let's render order items. So cart item. That should not be cart item. That should be an order item. Uh, okay, let me remove all of them except only one. And let's put this in a for each. For each order items is item, lowercase. Oops, why do I need dollar sign here? Then we have end for each. And let's put this right here. Okay, so we need to output the item, item, product, image. I think product has image, right? Or image URL. It's an image. Okay, then right here we have product title. That is item, product, title. And then we have price. The price should come from uh, item. Uh, I think it's called unit price. And then quantity, it should come from item um, quantity. And then we have remove. Why do we have remove right here? I don't know. Uh, there's a mistake. We shouldn't have remove. It was cart item probably, and that, that's why we had remove. It is order item. Okay, if we just reload the page, we see the items. That's fine. However, the image is um, straight, not stretched, but the image takes huge amount of um, height. So we have to do something uh, like we have in the cart like this. So if we now open a cart blade and look for the product item, how image is rendered, we see that this is the image section. So let's put this right here for the image URL. This is how it should be. And remove colon because that uh, colon is using uh, uses Alpine JS, and we can change this in to link to an actual product page, which is also fine. So we can specify root right here. We're going to specify product dot view and provide item product. And let's delete this and have a look. So go my orders and click on the first one, and okay. This is how it looks like. And we have everything, like we have the title and uh, we have the price. However, um, I think I'm going to move the price down next to quantity, maybe. Flex justify, justify between. I think that's, that's much better. 
Okay, let's go back and uh, let's actually go to my orders and uh, view another one. Okay, fine. Another one, which is also fine. Okay, so we have implemented um, we have implemented the order view page. However, um, this make a payment button should be disabled or maybe not even visible if the order is actually paid. But if not paid, that should do the same thing as the payment button from here. So let's open, let's close cart index plate and open order index plate and find the this portion. Okay, if the order is paid. So let's go right here and I'm going to paste this. And let's now copy this button, make a payment button. Let's format the code. And if the order is not paid, we send uh, we uh, create a form with the cart checkout order. I think that's it. And then we should replace this button. We can leave the icon, I think. Make a payment. However, let's leave the icon, this SVG icon. Let's put this right here. Okay, let's see. Reload the page. Okay, let's comment out to see the button first. Okay, make a payment is looking ugly. That should be flex. Items center. And here we go. Justify center as well. Make a payment. Perfect. Now we can we can recover this if statement if order is paid right here and down below we need end and if okay now let's create one more order let's add a few items in the cart let's check out proceed to check out okay we the order was created at this moment so now let's open localhost 8000 i'm going to go into my orders and we see unpaid order. Let's, by the way, sort the orders, the recent to be at the top. So if you open now order controller and see um, where, let's put right here, order, order by, uh, order by created at uh, descending. Okay, reload the page. We see latest at the top. Uh, however, we don't also see the pagination. Let's move this, let's format this nicely. Let's give it pagin pagination 5. Now we don't see the buttons, so we have to implement the buttons as well, just like we have in the uh, in the product index. So I think if we go in the index, um, maybe after the table, we have the table and inside it should be inside um no it should be outside of the bg white i think it will be nicer so we're gonna have uh orders i think it's called links I'm not sure let's see yeah we see these links and let's put this in its own div and give it class margin top uh, like uh, three okay here we see that the first page second page third page and let's display only 10 10 at a time okay go to the first page we have 10 items and we see this pay button here as well uh, however the button uh, is not that nice uh, and the view inv invoice button also has some styles missing if we go in the orders view invoice looks like this so now let's go in the index and look for view invoice. Not sure if we need this because the invoice um, is kind of um, for it's kind of document to prove that you made an order and you should be able to print that. However, this is something that uh, is a proof, and if that's that is uh, printable, that's going to be fine. Okay, so I'm going to remove this view invoice at the moment and leave it uh, leave it like this 
okay so we have the date we have status we have subtotal um and yeah well the only thing we can add here is maybe number of items um items after subtotal so we collapse this td second uh this is status this is subtotal and maybe items uh, and then we call count how many items the order has so and dollar is not necessary here and we can specify text here okay this should have um text no wrap i want no wrap white space no wrap However, the action has a fixed width, which I want to reduce. Now, that's much better. So we have like three items, two, one item, one item, and so on. Okay, fine. So we have now orders page. And we, um, we have to... This one works. However, I'm going to slightly increase the button slightly the vertical padding of the button uh, yeah that's much better and if we go inside we need to test if this make a payment button also works so i'm going to click on that and we are redirected right here let's fill up the form let's click on pay and and your order has been completed and here is my orders as well which is by the way which is by the way unpaid and you know why because i have stopped the stripe cli and the webhook uh, was not sent however the redirect worked show so it should have marked this as completed so we probably have a small error in the checkout controller again testing testing takes a huge amount of time building your production ready application so we should be checking success <coughs> excuse me so right here we get the session we select the payment and i think the payment will be pending right so we select pending we are in pending or paid if the payment doesn't exist we show not found if the payment equals pending we update order and session for the payment okay paid and paid and then we show success so this should have updated this should have updated the payment okay we don't know why it didn't work let's dump i'm going to dump the payment if that's available so let's click on pay from here okay we have the payment and status is pending so it should come right here let's put this here reload the page we see your order has been completed because probably the if wasn't satisfied probably because i don't use right here value okay i think that's the reason so basically uh, comparing a status to payment status pending which is an enum uh, enum value simply will not going to work especially when when you compare with two uh with three equality basically so if I do this with two equal sign, probably it might work. No, it's not going to work. So I'm going to specify right here value. In this case, this if will be satisfied and we should see payment right here. Here we go. And now it's marked as completed, actually marked as completed. And we should be able to see in the database as well. And if we go into my orders page, we should see it uh, marked as completed here as well. All right, fantastic. In this section, we have implemented outputting all orders in the admin. This table looks amazing, in my opinion. So the, the statuses have nice colors. And um, 
I generally, uh, I am not strong in design, but this is something I, I personally actually liked. So we have um, the orders inner page as well, from which we have possibility to change the order details status. I think the UI of this details page is not that nice, and I, I'm going to work on this UI in the future and make it more um, like better basically in terms of UI. So whenever the status is changed right here, the customer of this order will receive an email that his order status was actually changed. Let's see everything basically that has been changed so far. So we created order controller for the API and that is done inside the API folder. Uh, and it has a couple of methods like to get the order details um, uh, as it get the all orders as a list, get specific order, get the order statuses, which are basically uh, values of enum, and we have change status as well, inside which we are using the um, update order email um, class for email sending, basically. So that's the order controller. We have the uh, order list resource. We have created order list resource, which returns the following information, which is displayed in the table. And we have created order resource that is a massive resource. It has the order items inside there. Each item has product details there. We have the customer with its shipping and billing addresses inside this order resource. And we have two classes, new order email and update order email. So new order email is sent to the customer as well as to the admin user that the new order has been made that information um, is necessary for both admin receives basically that hey new order has been made and you need to take care of this order and the customer receives a new email that hey you have just made an order and here is your order details okay so this is the um, this is a very simple uh, mailable class um, and it has right here new order subject and view we're going to have a look at the views as well so we have order update the same type uh, and let's have a look first the mailable um, views so we have right here tables that uh, these are just um, not nice uh, user interface basically for email sending um, we have uh, links also to the order details page for admin uh, if the uh, the same view basically is used for admin and for the customer when the new order is made and if the this view is for admin we are passing a variable if the user is for admin we are rendering the backend url for the um, for the view link and in else case we render the front end url for the order details page okay and the similar um, view is this update order we just uh, Give the user information that your order has been updated this is the new order status and this is a link to the order which was basically updated and on the front end side we created a similar uh, view uh, views basically we have for the products we created the orders view component which has inside the orders table the orders table basically uh, has the pagination there and uh, the table header cell which is uh, which is the common one for sorting and we also have um, search right there and we have order statuses component as well order status component basically as well and that order status uh, reusable component is used right here as well as in the list of the orders right here okay and we have created that reusable component and that is basically all we made in this uh in this section so we inside the order statuses we added uh three more statuses cancelled and shipped and completed and we added this method which returns all the statuses okay that is all that has been made in this particular section again i cannot explain everything line by line uh this is going to take the um, huge time of course and if you're interested to see the full process of this particular section check uh the full course on my website thecodeholic.com all right, let's move on the next section. In this section, we have implemented the user management from the admin side, and that is for the admin users. So from here, we now added possibility to create new admin user, provide its email address, provide the password, and just like this new admin user will be created. And we have, of course, possibility to edit or delete existing users. And that's a simple users crowd right here. Uh, the one small difference 
um, not the difference, but one small thing is that whenever a new user is added from, from here, is admin flag is added to true because the user needs to be able to log in into the admin interface. Okay, let's understand how this was made. That's going to be pretty straightforward and similar to the like orders or products CRUD. So we create the user controller inside the API folder for list, for index, store, uh, update and delete methods. We created create user request and update user request. We created user resource, which returns the following information. We actually updated the existing user resource not created and just added right here, created it because that's going to be used right here in this table. Okay. And we created a new user model that's going to be under API folder, which simply extends to app models user. Okay. That's, that's, that is generally good approach to create different models for API because you might need some things differently for the API models. And that's why we created the user model. Probably we are using in the, in the next sections of the course. And we made a few updates in the, um, app layout so we see that we modified the get user um, that was a action get user and that was modified into get current user okay because the get user might be necessary for to get the the following user whichever uh, on whichever we click this edit button okay so we make those changes in the actions as we see we change the get user into get current user and down below we're going to see that we created get users action right here uh, and we have get a single user as well, which at the moment is not used in my opinion. And we have create user as well. And we have created update user inside the actions. Of course, the corresponding mutations are added as well. Set users. And uh, I think, yeah, only set users is added. And similar to orders and products, we have the users component, which has users table and the user model right here. And the user table has possibility uh, for uh, pagination and sorting and for search as well. All right. And in the API, of course, we added new root right here, new API resource for users um, from the user controller. Okay. That was all that made um, in this particular section. And the next section is the customer's CRUD. Customers CRUD is very similar to users, but uh, we actually, I actually spent much, much more time working on the customers CRUD than on the users CRUD because the customers CRUD had one, um, one tricky thing, which we have finally implemented, of course. So the customer details form has these addresses right there. Okay. So we have billing addresses and shipping addresses, and we implemented, uh, we had a custom input component in the Vue.js. We have that, and we added this uh, support for the select, as well as we implemented this uh, possibility to um, have right here either text field or select. And that, Believe me, uh, the, the section is really interesting. The, the whole section, I think it's also two hours. I planned it to be actually like a half an hour maximum because uh, it was very similar to the users, but it took some time. And if we have a look in the source code, you will know that. So the customer's controller is um, like uh, similar to user's controller. But in this case, we consider, if we go in the update, we consider the addresses as well. Okay. And that makes things a little bit challenging. Uh, and we are, we are also returning from the customer's control controller all the uh, countries we have because we need the countries drop down and the data is received from the backend, of course. Okay, so let's uh, let's see the next section. So we change the authenticated session controller as well, and um, okay, so this this is unnecessary. The customer status right here. So skip that. Uh, in the login request, however, we made the following changes. So we make sure that whenever the customer, I think this is the authenticate. Yeah. So whenever the customer um, authorizes, we check. Um, on the website, we check if the customer status is active. So we allow if the status is not active, basically we log out the customer, invalidate the session and return uh, the error message that, that your account has been disabled. 
Okay, so that was made uh, in the customer request. Uh, we have all the validation for the customer fields as well as for the addresses. We have kind we have created country resource and customer list resource with a uh, few fields and the customer resource with much more fields right here. And inside the models, um, we may just made um, changes we had has one right here but we changed it into correct approach uh, to um, using belongs to and let's scroll down below and in the customers uh, I want to open the customers model okay so that was challenging actually tricky and challenging so we have uh, right here all the inputs so this is the header and down below we have all the inputs so custom inputs this is what we are using and we made it so that the select basically uh, is also a custom input right now. So we created, we improved our custom input and make, made it even more reusable. So we have select right here, we provide all the countries, we provide of course the model, and now down below we check if the billing country states does not exist, we render it as a text field. However, if it exists, we render the states as a drop down and we even provide the billing state options and the same thing of course happens for the shipping and down below we have the whole logic how we basically take you know, those billing country identify the active one and take out the billing states as well as consider the cases when the billing country might not be selected the response is not received from the server and so that it should not throw an error like i can't explain again everything line by line but that was actually challenging and the whole section um, as i mentioned is about like two hours long uh, in the premium course Okay, so and finally on the submit we call the action update customer and down below we have the create customer. Okay, that was basically all about the um, customer CRUD. In this section we have implemented the dashboard page and the whole information basically is coming from the back end. So we have the uh, number of active customers, number of active products, we have paid orders, the total income in the... Um, in the whole period we have this website running and we have the latest 10 orders right here and we have the latest customers as well down below and we also have the orders by country okay so the whole thing is implemented in this section and we even have uh, we even have right here change date period drop down and if we switch this into last week we're gonna see updated numbers right there that Basically, nothing was uh, purchased in the last week. Let's change this into the last two weeks. We probably see something. No, all the orders has been made in last month. Okay, so we have this date um, range period, and let's now understand how these changes have been made in the in the back end. So we obviously created dashboard controller. This section is very, very interesting. So we created dashboard controller and we have a couple of endpoints right here to get all the active customers count to get the active products count and this count will be changed in the future and added the possibility to only get to those products which is published on the website at the moment the published flag does not exist on the product but this will be added in the later sections so the paid orders that's going to return the all the number of paid orders and down below we have the total income that's going to return the sum of all the total prices of the orders okay but we also consider in every request basically this is orders by country and we return this is a complex uh, select with joins and we return finally the number of um, records by country okay and down below we have the latest customers and the latest orders with limited uh, for the customers we have limit five and for the orders we have limit uh, limit ten Okay, and in this case we are using order resource as well and we return only the information we need and down below we have get from date so this is interesting basically most of the methods right here uh not this one not this one this one actually is, uh, uses that get from date and we have this from date so basically if the date was changed in the user interface like last month or last week so we basically need to use uh inside the where query we want to add where the create date is more than the last week date okay and this is what we calculate okay so get from date 
returns the following array um, and we have we're using carbon package and we calculate the you know, following days and then return that information let's um, proceed so we have now this from date all right uh, let's uh, have a look in the other files so we have order resources i mentioned that's going to return the order details which is necessary for displaying the latest orders right here um, the basically this order resource is under the resources dashboard folder okay because that order resource is only for dashboard okay and uh, of course we implemented installed the chart js so view js uh, chart um, let's have a look what's the exact name of the package view chart js package and the chart js was also installed okay and using that package we render render this donut chart right now if we change this into all time we're going to see this donut right here okay so we also made modifications in the customer section as well because right here we render all the latest customers but whenever we click on the customer i want the customer details to be visible for the users okay so whenever i click now previously the customer form was a modal okay and um showing a modal from this place is is um is not a good idea basically it, it's even more challenging but not a good idea so when you click on the customer right now there is a dedicated customer page that customer page opens and it is also affected in the url so when you just reload the page then the uh, active customer stays right there okay and this is this is the uh, change we made of course in the api we added you know, the following dashboard roads everything starts with the dashboard prefix with the dashboard controller and the method name and we created the currency filter in the Vue.js. that's that's something interesting so we basically if we go in the dashboard we see that the number right here is formatted with a dollar sign okay and this is done through the currency filter we created that currency filter we installed that currency filter we activated the currency filter in the main js and then we are using this uh, in the in the dashboard where is dashboard view file here it is okay and if we scroll down below let's enlarge the right side total income we have this total income so basically we are using that uh, not sure here it is here's how uh, we are using that um, currency filter okay so that is all that has been done into the dashboard controller but the full process is of course um, like much much longer I think more than one hour I think it's uh, one and a half hours the whole section all right let's move on to the next section and see how the reports are done in this section we created two uh two reports and uh, one is the orders report and second is the customers report so basically we see all the orders that uh, the number of orders made per day for the um from the beginning of the uh, application okay and if we choose like last week for example uh, we don't see anything because no order has been made in the last week but we see seven um seven days right here okay uh seven or eight i think this is this is eight so this includes like um seven days plus one okay which is probably something that needs to be fixed but uh, at, at the moment it is um like this so we have this report orders by orders by day and we have the customer report as well let's choose last month and we're going to see how many customers basically we was registered the last month so only one customer was registered okay the data is not that much at the moment that's why it doesn't look that nice but believe me uh when you have a good data and i tested this on good data as well so these reports look uh, look amazing okay let's understand how these reports have been done okay so first we added published column into products okay so this was added and we updated the dashboard controller as well if we scroll down below we are only returning those the count of those products which has published true we also change the product controller on the front end and we return only those products who has published true 
Okay, if the product doesn't have publish true, it's not going to be outputted on the website. Okay, that was added. And then we let's have a look in the report controller. Okay, uh, the report controller has two main methods, orders and customers. And it has a private method, prepare data for bar chart. And uh, we are using bar charts in both cases. Uh, let's have a look. But the actual data is very similar, the identical basically for bar chart or line chart. So we can even create the line chart for the customer's report. Okay, it's going to be pretty straightforward, the same basically. Okay, but I also created report trait. Remember in the dashboard controller, we, we are using the method called get from date okay this is from date or start date from which uh, uh, until the current date we want to get the data and this get from date was used and is used still right here for example to get the orders by country or right here to get the total income from starting from this day but I created a trait because I needed the same method in the report controller as well. And I used this trait right here in the dashboard controller and in the report controller as well, right here. Okay. And the trait is very simple. It has just one method right here. Okay. Okay. Uh, we updated the product request. Uh, we did publish right there. We updated the product uh, resource. We returned published. And down below, we created the bar and line. I think I created the line chart, but not sure why I didn't use this line chart. Uh, probably I just forgot to use this line chart and still using the bar chart. Okay, so we made a few changes uh, in the customer. We created the customer's report, uh, orders report, and we also used um, currency USD filter everywhere. Basically, we have the price out. Okay, so in any place where you see price outputted on the website, on the admin panel, right here on these products, uh, right here in the orders, basically now it's going to use this currency um, currency formatter. And the currency fo formatter is like the big advantage, the biggest advantage is that it formats with the currency symbol as well as with the thousand separator. Okay, that is something which is very um, necessary for the... Um, for the readability let's let's say like this okay so that was uh that was basically all so inside this state we added the date options we moved the date options from the dashboard into the state state store state and we are using this in uh, both cases in the uh, report um, as well as on the dashboard okay and in the api of course we added those two report api um, endpoints okay and just like this as it, it's it is as simple as that so we created this dashboard in just five minutes explaining all right now it's time to take our e-commerce application and deploy it on custom domain we're going to also create custom email address and configure laravel application to send emails from that email address this is hostinger h panel and from here we can manage our hosting, we can claim our free domain, set up our email, set up our SSL certificates and create databases and etc. Okay, so once you register the first time, you will be redirected right here. So I use Hostinger as I mentioned for every kind of things I, I need and right here I have premium shared hosting which I can set up, but first we need to claim our free domain. I'm going to click right here, claim domain, and I'm going to search now my domain. So I can choose the um, suffix for my domain, which I want. And let's search for L as a, the first letter for Laravel, L commerce, L commerce dot, dot com. Let's see, the domain is already taken. Let's try another one, L commerce dot net. Let's click right here. Okay, and as we see, lcommerce.net is available. I think that's a great domain for our e-commerce website. And I'm going to take this domain, and after one year, the domain renews for $14. Okay, so I'm going to click Claim Domain right here, which will claim the domain for me, and then we have to set up 
our SSL certificates and premium shared hosting. So select primary details. I'm going to choose my country. This is the place where I have to provide the address details. Uh, this is just for personal purposes. I'm going to provide right here my address information and then click finish registration. OK, so my contact information is under review and I will be informed about my domain registration in a short while and I can already create my website. So I'm going to click continue right here. Get Elcommerce. No, this is something else. Um, protect your brand. It suggests me to take Elcommerce.live. But I see right here that the domain status is active. Email verification status is verified. And now we just need to add a website. So let's click on the home page right here. On the left side, we have the domain chosen. So let's click on the home page. Right here we have this setup section. We have to set up premium shared hosting. I'm going to click setup right here and let's click start now. I can skip this part. I'm building something fresh new. I'm going to choose skip. I will start from scratch. Here is my domain. I'm going to select my domain and here it is. So I'm going to click finish setup. OK, now let's go on the home page again and we have to basically set up activate SSL certificates. My browser right now is zoomed and this is displayed on the right side, the navigation. If I just zoom out, we see this main navigation at the top. OK, you will probably see this at the top. And right here we have a couple of options. Let me actually zoom in. So we have websites. The websites basically uh, I am I have on this shared hosting. So we have right here hosting and emails and domains and VPS and SSL. Let's click on SSL. Here it is. So lcommerce.net. And let's by the way check what is the result in the browser. lcommerce.net. Okay. So we see hostinger welcome page. This means that the domain is taken and it is on the hostinger. All right. So this is failed for Let's Encrypt. Why it is failed? Let's click Manage right there. Reinstall. Let's try to reinstall the SSL certificate. OK, the SSL is being installed for Elcommerce in the background. HTTPS will be automatically forced on your domain. Let's click Close right here. It's trying to install. And once this finishes, we are going to see right here, it is not secure, but we're going to see HTTPS protocol right here and the mark that now this is secure. Let's wait until this is done and we have to add websites as well. OK, let's reload the page. Now we see this as active. So if we go in the tab lcommerce.net and just refresh this page, now we see lock icon right here and we have connection is secure. Now this is under HTTPS. We have to add subdomain as well because this is going to be the main website. Now this is going to be this part, but we need admin side as well. We can take subdomain like admin.lcommerce.net, which is really logical. So let's go in the hostinger premium shared for hosting for lcommerce. We have it right there. Let's click manage for lcommerce.net. So I think this is the place. So from here, we can also take the free email, but let's create first a subdomain. OK, we have to add a website. Let me actually zoom out this slightly. We have domains and subdomains. Let's try to add subdomain admin.lcommerce.net. Let it create a custom folder for subdomain. OK, let's understand. So basically our main website is this. And if we have a look in the project source, okay, our main website will be under public. So basically this index index.php is what will be served. And we have this backend side and we have to build this Vue.js application and deploy it on the place where we need that. So it really does not matter, I think what's going to be the path. So let's specify right here 
folder admin. Let's create subdomain. Subdomain created successfully. And let's now open in a new tab admin lcommerce.net. Let's hit the enter. Okay, now we see website for our subdomain as well. And let's install SSL certificate right here. On the right side, we have this SSL section. I'm going to click on this SSL. And here we see this admin lcommerce.net. Let's click manage. Okay, now it is already active. It automatically got active. And if we just reload this page, we will see lock right here as well. So now we have two domains, admin.lcommerce.net and lcommerce.net for our e-commerce website. And the only thing we need is to deploy our applications. But now let's understand where we need to deploy it. Let's go under files and click the file manager. So let's explore the file structure and understand where we are going to actually deploy or how we are going to deploy it. Hostinger provides nice, really nice file manager, but I am not going to use file manager to deploy Laravel application. Maybe we can use the file manager to deploy Vue.js application, but not for Laravel. So right here we see this public HTML, which is a symbolic link basically into domains lcommerce.net public HTML. And if we click on the root directory right here, we see the same thing. If we click on the domains, double click maybe, if we go inside, we see lcommerce.net right here. If we go inside, we see this public HTML, okay? And right here we see this default PHP and admin folder. If we go inside the admin folder, this also includes default PHP. And let's open default PHP, click edit right here and understand what is there. Inside default PHP, we see the HTML, basically this part of HTML, okay? So we can actually delete this. This is for admin default HTML. So I can delete this, everything, and simply write hello from admin. This is PHP. So we can write HTML there. I'm going to save this. And now if we go on the admin page and just reload this, we're going to see hello from admin, okay? This is the place right here, we are going to deploy our Vue.js application, okay? So let's close this and let me actually go back into LCommerce and we have public HTML right here. And I know that from inside this public HTML, we have to put our Vue.js application under admin folder. By the way, we can change this folder as well if we want, okay? So now I'm gonna use SSH to clone my, my application in the correct folder, okay? And then make public folder of our Vue.js, uh, sorry, of our Laravel application. This public folder is something that needs to be web accessible, okay? Right now, everything what is inside this public HTML is the web accessible. If I rename this, right click and rename and call this uh, index, dot php it's going to work in the same way for our lcommerce.net okay so if we just manage to have this index php which is our laravel applications entry script index php into here okay then our application will be deployed now let's go in the h panel and i'm going to search for ssh Right here, we have this SSH access under advanced. So let's click it right here. And here we have IP and port and username and password. Basically using these configurations, we can connect to our project. We can do deployment using basically uploading our files right here, but we have to upload vendor as well. And if we have a look in the application, so our vendor contains a lot of packages and it's going to take a lot of time until we upload it. So we can zip the whole application and upload it like this as well. But that's going to also take huge time. So I'm going to try to 
show you and teach you how you can use SSH to deploy your application. Okay, so let's try to connect using SSH. So for this, I'm going to use Putty. I don't have Putty, so let's download download Putty, which is an SSH client for Windows. So let's click right here, download Putty. We have to download for our operating system. So I'm going to click right here to download the installer. Save that. Click Next, Next, and let's install it. Okay, now we have Putty installed. Now let's open it. Here is Putty, and now we have to provide right here the credentials and IP that Hostinger gave us. So IP is this. So we have to host name or IP. We're going to paste this right here. This is the port 65002. We're going to put this right here. And we can already click open. We have to click accept right here. And now we have to provide username. So for username, we, we need to copy this and then paste it right here and hit the enter. Now it asks password. Let's click change right here and let's generate new password. Uh, okay, we have to generate new password. We can type, of course, new password we prefer or I prefer to take a random password. So in the Google, I'm going to type random password. Let's click right here and let's click generate random password. And this is the password now I'm going to set. So let's copy this, right click and copy. Then let's paste this and click change. Okay, our password was actually changed. Now let's open Putty and let's paste our password here as well. Just right click and it's going to paste. It seems like nothing is pasted, but if you just right, right click, it's going to paste. So then let's hit the enter. But it was closed. Okay, basically you can connect to your SSH server in two ways, using password or using public private keys. So let's try to repeat these steps. I have actually password, so I'm going to save this password temporarily. So let me actually put this right here in our code. I'm not going to commit and push it, just put right here for short time. So let's repeat these steps. So I'm going to copy IP and put this right here. Copy port, put this right here. We can also provide username. So let's copy the username and we can go in the, let's give it Let's give it a name. We can save this session as well. Let's give it a name. The name is lcommerce.net. Okay, and I'm going to click save right here. This is our lcommerce. And then if we go under connection, under data, right here. Under connection data, we have to provide after login username. So I'm going to paste our username right here. Go under session and hit save. So now our lcommerce.net session has that username saved. And if we click open right now, it's going to take the username, but ask password. Okay, so we have our password right here. So let's take this password and hit shift and insert or right click and then hit the enter. For some reason, we are not able to log in. And I think I know the reason. So right here, we have SSH status inactive. We have to click enable right here. Okay, SSH is successfully enabled. And now it also recommends to use either Putty or uh, Pinguinet. And this is the command which you can run from your Linux machine. Okay, and the recommended way which I'm going to also do is to add a public key. Okay, but first I want to log in with the password. So again, I'm going to now open Putty. Now we have this lcommerce.net saved. I'm going to click load and then click open. It will ask password. I'm going to take the password and specify it right here and hit the enter. Okay, now we are inside the server. This is the server we are in and we can type some basic Linux commands. And those basic Linux commands can be found right here as well. Basic SSH commands, if you just click on this, it's going to open new tab 
and it will show you some basic commands and it will show you also how you can connect to the server using putty okay but let me close this and i'm going to show you a few basic commands to see every file and folder in this directory we need to type ls in this case we only have domain and domains and public html we can type ls dash la and it's going to give you much more information for each file and it's going to also show us that we have some files and folders which start with dot like dot logs and dot profile we can type pwd to show the current path we are under home u24 something now if we go in the browser and click right here this is the same path okay this is the path we are inside right now this is our home directory okay right here and if we type again ls dash la we see right here public html which is a symbolic link from domains lcommerce.net public html and we see domains folder right there and we see them right here as well domains in public html and profile and logs as well and we see all all of them right here okay so this is the same folder now we need to clone our application right here okay not right here but under domains basically so if we navigate inside domains and just type ls dash la navigation happens using cd command which stands for change directory we change the directory into domains and now we are in the domains if we just type pwd now we are under home username domains okay and then we can type ls dash la and hit the enter and we see our domain lcommerce.net this is our website so if we navigate inside lcommerce.net and hit the enter and then type ls dash la we see public html right here okay and if we navigate again inside the public html or we can just list the directories from this public html using ls dash la public html hit the enter we see admin and index php right there okay so this reflects the same folder and file structure we see in the browser under domains we have lcommerce.net and public html and in fact if i now delete this admin folder and index php it's gonna disappear from here as well because that's the actual same um, file storage so let's type ls dash la and we see right here public html so basically i'm going to remove this public html rm dash rf public html that's going to delete this public html and if we go in the l commerce folder right now we don't see anything we don't have public html anymore and if we check our websites which is this is the admin website we don't see anything we see not found page from hostinger and if we check our another website let's close these tabs another website we're going to see not found right right there as well here we go now we need to clone our application using our ssh in our file system so let's clear up everything now we are under lcommerce.net so let's go one directory back and i'm going to clone my application right here in this lcommerce.net i have my application on my github so if we open github.com slash the code holy go under repositories here is laravel view e-commerce okay let me check if i have everything pushed so i'm going to delete this password let's check if i have everything pushed yes i do have everything pushed and i now i need to clone this before i clone this i want to show you one very important thing as well so now we are connected right here using username and password okay but i want to connect using public private keys as well how to do that if we go in the ssh access right here we have add ssh key we have to generate public private ssh keys and add them right here okay what are public private ssh keys 
Those are the authorization mechanism. Modern today's like the most popular and secure authorization mechanism. So basically, you generate two keys, public and private keys. Uh, you save private key on your operating system and you don't share it to anyone and you share your public key to third parties uh, for which you basically want the authorization to work. Okay, and we have to generate our public private keys. Uh, on Windows, the most common tool to generate them is uh, Putty Gain. But I think, yeah, we do have Putty Gain. I think it comes with Putty. So if we open this Putty Gain, it's going to show the following window. Okay, and we click this Generate button. And basically, we have to move our mouse randomly um, to generate random public private keys. Okay, and now that was generated. So we have a public key and we have to save our public keys in private keys. Just click right here, save public key. And we have to save this in a specific location. And that location should be under your home folder. Okay, you can save it in else in different places as well, but that is that is the most common common place and also the SSH client will by default search for your public private keys in that place. So under your home folder dot SSH. Okay, and you have to save your public private keys right here. Okay. And for your public keys, you just need to call it ID underscore rsa.pub and just click save. I, I'm not going to save because I already have that saved. And then click save private key. And in this case, it will ask you, are you sure you want to save this key without passphrase to protect it? So in this case, I'm going to give it, yes, I want to save it without passphrase. Passphrase is kind of additional security layer on top of these public private keys. But I want, I don't want this passphrase because I want, I want whenever I try to log in, uh, inside the server, I don't want to enter any kind of passwords there anymore. Okay, and if we if I just set the passphrase, it's going to ask me passphrase. Okay, I'm going to click yes right here, and again we have to specify the location, your home, your username, then SSH folder, and you have to call uh, your private key id underscore rsa dot uh, PPK. I think I don't have any kind of PPK files at the moment because I have my public private keys generated on a different operating system on the Linux operating system and then moved into this machine. So you just create idrsa.ppk and save it. Okay, I'm not going to save it. Instead, I'm going to load my private key. Let's try to load my private key show all files and this is idea say this is my private uh, private key let's click open that was actually imported okay this is my uh, my public key for my private key okay I do definitely have public and private keys and if you follow your uh, the instructions I showed to you you are gonna have public private keys as well generated we have to take our public key and put in our in our website. OK, so for this, let's basically open our home folder. OK, here's my home folder. Let's open SSH folder. And inside there, I actually have multiple public private keys, but this is what I'm going to use. IDRSA.pub. OK, and I'm right click on this and I'm going to open this using VS Code or you can open with any editor you prefer. And here is my public key. So I'm going to copy everything, go in the browser, click add SSH key and paste this right here and I'm going to give this name which is which gives you um, some kind of context to identify what kind of kind of key is this so this is my uh, Windows laptop and I'm going to click add SSH key okay SSH key is successfully added on the server and now I can authorize you inside the SSH using putty without entering password Okay, password is less secure way than public private keys. So you should always try to have authorization using public private keys. Now let's open Putty 
okay this is our active session so i'm gonna type exit right here and now let's open putty and we have this lcommerce.net i'm gonna load and if i click open it will ask me for a password that's because we need to configure our putty to take to have a look at the private key and try to authorize using public private keys so let's actually start new session and let's close this and let's click on lcommerce.net and load this and now if we go under connection and data connection sorry ssh and under auth this is the place private key file for auth authentication so i'm going to browse right here and choose our private key so if i click my user folder ssh and let's show all files right here and choose idrsa in your case it might be called idrsa.ppk but they are going to be the same so i'm going to click idrsa open that and then i will go under session again and click save so this will associate my just specified private key into loaded session and the loaded session is lcommerce.net now if i click open right here basically it sh i should be authorized unable to use key file okay open sh ssh to private key new format so in my case i have a different format than uh, the server requires so that's why i wasn't able to um, authenticate but if you have just generated your public private keys you should be able to authenticate in fact let me make is make this um, easy and i can generate new public private keys or i can convert my existing private key into the new version so let's try to open putty again and let me open now private key from my home directory ssh folder i'm going to choose idrsa and i'm going to open this okay so that's successfully imported and i'm going to now save the private key i think it needs ppk file so i'm going to click yes right here go again in the home the my home folder zura ssh and i'm going to call this id underscore rsa dot ppk okay this is the uh, extension i think it needs on windows and i'm going to hit save right here i think the file was actually saved now let's open putty and we need to load lcommerce and then go under connection ssh auth and let's browse right here ppk file open that let's click on session again and hit save then we click open right here and let's wait here we go we, we are successfully authorized using our public private keys okay i my again i, I mentioned this but my public private keys we are generated on linux and then i moved them copied them on my windows as well because i use the same public private keys on windows and linux as well but if you just generated your public private keys you're going to name it dot ppk and you shouldn't have any problems okay now i'm on the server and again let's type ls dash la let's see right here we have this broken symbolic link it tries to it is linked to domains lcommerce.net public html but we deleted that public html from domains which is fine no problem uh, we can even delete that symbolic link rm uh, rm uh, dash rf public html then ls dash la and we don't see this broken symbolic link let's navigate into domains and now i'm going to clone clear up everything and i'm going to clone my project right here let's open github and just copy the https url and then type git clone and paste this url okay but i'm going to give it the same name whatever is our domain okay so in our case i'm going to name it lcommerce.net and let's hit the enter it's going to clone our application in the lcommerce.net and if i just type ls-la lcommerce.net it's going to 
show me list of files and folders we have in the lcommerce.net right now. And if we open browser, the file manager, and if we just refresh this, we're going to see those Laravel files and folders right here as well. Okay. We don't have vendor because vendor only appears if you run composer install, right? So let's just run composer install here. Uh, what happened? Uh, composer could not be found. Yes, we need to run composer install from the lcommerce.net folder. Right now we are under domains folder. Look at this. So if we navigate into lcommerce.net, type ls-la, this is the files and folders we see, and we're going to run composer install right here. Let's hit the enter. All right, now we have small problem, and the problem tells us that we are we don't have enough extensions, PHP extensions. Okay, first, the problem one. This package requires PHP 8.1, but your PHP version 7.4 doesn't satisfy that requirement. That version 7.4 is by default set from the when you create new application from the hosting or H panel. This is the default version it is set. Okay, so let's go now in our H panel right here, and I'm going to search for PHP. So we need this under advanced section. We see this PHP configuration. This is an excellent thing. So I think th that's why I, I just love the um, Hostinger shared hosting services because it gives you possibility to configure as much as you need. The PHP version we are using is 8.1. So we're going to just change this and hit the update. Changing the PHP version will reset PHP extension values to default. Okay, no problem. I'm going to click confirm right here. It's going to take a few seconds until this is actually changed. And right now in our terminal, if we just type PHP dash V, we have already 8.1. That was already changed and it was immediately changed. Okay, let's run composer install again. Now we have different problems. Let's scroll up and have a look. Okay, composer runtime API. I think by default, if we just clear up everything, by default this uses composer version 1. So let's just type composer dash dash version, hit the enter. Uh, we see warnings in composer version 1.10 point something. Okay, I think we can update the composer. We need to update the composer and we have to run composer self dash update. Okay, once we do this, uh, it's going to download the latest version, but the latest version is one point something, one point latest. So it's going to update into one point latest version. We need to update into second latest version. So we have to type composer self update dash dash two and hit the enter. Now it, it is downloading the latest version for version two. And let's see file system exception composer update failed user local being composer one far could not be written. Okay, so this user local being composer one far. So this is the place where composer self update basically tries to put it. Okay, this is probably one small, um, not maybe a disadvantage, but a configuration a restriction, let's say that the current version in this hosting or services is the composer current version is version one. If we just try to update composer self update version two, that's not going to work because we don't have root permissions to update it. And uh, it, sh it should be updated globally, basically. The order there should be probably an option from this H panel to update the composer to the version one. I think we don't have this a possibility. Not sure. Uh, I'm going to type composer right here. I think we don't have anything related to this. We have to find a solution. That's basically a daily life of, of the developer. You have problems, you find the solutions. So in this case, we need to 
use a local composer. So by default, when we type composer, we see this is a global composer and this is the version one. But now I'm going to download the composer file far file locally, which will be for version two. OK, let's open Google and just type download composer far. We want to download for the latest version. So I think we need to run this following code. OK, let's just paste this right here. Everything using right click and here we go. So composer version 2.4.3 successfully installed to and here's the location. So it was installed right here in this location. And let's hit the enter. And if we just type ls la, we're going to see composer far right here. OK, so we basically need to execute this composer far using PHP and this is going to give us version two. So I'm going to type PHP composer far and let's hit the enter. Now, this is composer version two. We see it right here. We don't see any warnings, by the way. And if we just type composer far dash dash version, hit the en enter, we see version two. So we basically need to run PHP composer far install space right here and install. Let's hit the enter. Now it is downloading all the packages our Laravel application needs. We have the correct version of PHP 8.1 and we have the correct version of Composer. In this case, we use the local Composer because the global Composer basically was referring to the Composer version one. OK, it should not take much time until this is downloaded. I'm going to pause recording and then continue. OK, so that was actually finished and we need to now create a local EN file. So if we just type ls again dash la, we see right here EN example, but we don't see EN file. OK, so I'm going to run CP, which means copy. So I want to copy EN dot example into EN. And then we need to use Vim, which is a uh, very popular text editor to open this EN file. And we're going to modify a few things right here. Once you are inside the Vim, you have to type I on your keyboard to go in the insert mode. And let's change the application name, which is um, let's put use double quotes uh, Laravel e-commerce. OK, so we can leave the environment local at the moment. Uh, make sure that everything works so far. Let's specify right here our application URL and our application URL is HTTPS lcommerce.net. OK, what options do we need? If we scroll down below, we need to create MySQL database, which we have not created, by the way, and then run migrations. So let me leave this open. And now let's create MySQL database. Let's go and search for database right here. Here we see MySQL databases. I'm going to click on this and let's specify the name, database name, L Commerce. OK, and that's going to be our full database name. This is the prefix. This is our uh, name, Lcommerce. Uh, the username, we can specify the same username and password. I'm going to generate random password. Take this password and put this in our EN file. By the way, you can edit your EN file from here as well. If you just refresh this page, we are going to see EN right here. Just click on this and click edit. So we can do editing from here as well. OK, maybe that's that's better for you. So right here, I'm going to specify the connection is my SQL. The host is localhost or 127001. This is the port. Everything is default. Let's adjust now database username and password. I have password copied, so I'm going to put this right here. So this is the database password. Now let's take the let's take the database name. The database name is let's delete everything. The prefix and then L commerce. And username is the same thing. Prefix and L commerce. All right. Now let's go down below. We don't need to change anything right here. OK, and we are going to create new email 
custom email and we're going to configure this right here but let's leave this until now just to make sure that the website works if you scroll down below we have to provide um, uh, stripe keys as well but let's actually save everything to save everything we're going to hit escape on our keyboard then we're going to type colon w which means to write the changes on the inside the file and then q to quit basically from the file i'm going to hit enter okay and what else do we have remained i think we have to generate the ansi key but let's check first the browser in the browser we don't see anything yet because we have one very important thing missing okay we don't have public html under l commerce folder and by default it searches for public html if we type ls-la we don't see public html right here but we have public folder if we just create a symbolic link from public into public html then it should work so for creating a symbolic link we're going to type ln dash public dash s public needs to be linked inside public underscore html so let's hit the enter now we should see a symbolic link right here actually we see that and if we open our browser and reload it we're gonna see some kind of error okay this is laravel error that tells no application encryption key has been specified and that is exactly what i expected now we are in the project main directory and we're going to run php artisan uh, key colon generate dash dash ansi let's hit the enter application key set successfully and if we just reload the page now we see problem about the database okay now we're going to run migrations php artisan migrate and let's run seed as well dash dash seed let's hit the enter we have the problem access denied for user did we actually finish creating database i think we we haven't finished that so we have to click create right here it's going to take a few seconds database created successfully and we have the database right here and now let's rerun php artisan migrate dash dash seed and here it goes now it, it is running migrations, it run admin user seeder and country seeder as well. And if we open our website and reload it. Now we have the problem which is basically about uh, the Vue.js, um, not the Vue.js, but the Vite, because of Vite. So we don't have Vite manifest file. We need to run npm run build. Let's out open our project we can do this from here as well but not sure if we have npm do we have node.js and npm here no we don't have that we can go ahead and install it right here but it is not necessary we can open our project we can bring up the terminal and i'm going to run npm run build okay that's going to create and build and create this build folder under public so if we now check under public we have this build folder okay and we have to commit and push this build folder and then pull the changes right here okay using git so i'm gonna go and commit the changes i think this build might be even ignored i think it is ignored but i'm gonna just remove it from git ignore so if i open git ignore and search for public build it is added right here so we basically purpose why this build directory is added under uh, here in the git ignore is that the it is a generated file build file and it can be generated on any platform so basically if we have node.js right here and if we just run npm install and then npm run build we would be able to generate it from here as well but I think the easiest solution will be just to remove it from here at the moment we save it now i'm going to make uh, i'm going to comment those changes basically i can comment from terminal as well git status and here's the public build so let's add git add public build okay let's type git status and we see those those changes right here and let's commit and we have to also 
uh, add a git ignore as well. So git add dot git ignore. Hit the enter. Now again git status, and we see those changes right there. Let's commit them. Git commit minus m add build directory. Let's hit the enter. Now we need to push our changes. Git push origin main. Okay, we push them. Now let's open our project terminal. This is our uh, project root directory, and I'm going to run git pull origin main. If we hit the enter, now our changes have been pulled. And if we just reload, we see the home page up and running. We don't have any product um, pro products at the moment, but we do have the login, registration, all of that should actually successfully work. Now, let's deploy our Vue.js application so that login and create products right there. Okay, this is it and it shows not found. Deploying Vue.js application is much easier. So let's go in the project and let's navigate into the backend. Okay, we, we have that right here under backend and I'm going to run npm run build. And that is going to generate build files. Let's wait. Here we see this folder. Let's go in the backend. And right here we see this dist folder. Okay. And everything basically, we should take everything from this dist folder and put it in the directory we mapped into our uh, into our subdomain. So in this case, we mapped everything from the public. So if we go inside, let's refresh everything. We should see right here public HTML as well. Here we go. So inside there, we need to create right here admin folder. And if we open that, we're going to put our files right here. So here are our files. I'm going to open this in a file system on our file system. Then basically, let's open browser and then these files. And I'm going to drag and drop those files right here in this admin. There are not much files. Let's click upload. It's going to take a few seconds until all of them is uploaded. And let's have a look. Let's reload the page. And here we go. So we see our application. And now let's try to log in with the admin username and password we gave it in the admin user seeder. So we have this admin user seeder and there we specified admin123 to be the password. So let's specify username to be admin at example.com. The password will be admin123 and let's click sign in. But I'm going to also inspect and have a look in the network just in case there are some errors to observe it. There are no errors and we are actually able to successfully log in into the backend. However, however, look at this. So we don't have any products. We don't have any paid orders, but we see numbers right here. Okay. That happened because when we build our Vue.js application, it used the domain of our local API, not the production API. Okay. We didn't specify this. And if we just click login, for example, look at this. The URL basically is the localhost port 8000. Okay. And this is something we have to adjust. So we have right here dot env and the dot env basically corresponds to uh, inside the dot env we have this base URL to be localhost port 8000. We need to create another env file which should be for production dot env dot production. And we can have a look at the Vite, let's search for Vite environment variables or Vite, for example, dot env production. Okay, so if we just click right here, so you can read this um, section, but basically, as far as I remember, if we just have this env dot mode, in this case production, and we build that, it's going to take um, the this byte API base URL from this env production. So I'm going to basically modify now this 
env production and call this https lcommerce.net so i save this i open the terminal and run npm run build again that's going to take a few seconds okay as soon as this is done i'm going to open the file manager and i'm going to delete all the files from here and re-upload then these files now the javascript file which is inside the assets folder will correspond to production server not local server and if we open our admin and reload the page we see not found that's that's understandable we're going to fix this not found as well okay and let's now try to log in with admin and admin one two three and hit sign in okay now we see everything is zero because there are no products no orders nothing is there everything is empty if we go in the products empty database orders empty users we have only one admin user which is the logged in one we have customers and we have reports okay everything is empty however if i just reload this right now we have this not found problem so that happens because our web server is configured that it tries to find a file or folder this path at this path so we basically need to change the configuration so that everything needs to be redirected to the index.html because the index.html in our case is the file which takes all the requests okay and this is processed by javascript not by the server side now we have to open file manager inside which we have this admin basically deployed and right here we're going to create a new file called dot access that is the apache configuration file and we have to configure it so that everything should be redirected to the index html so let's click this ht access and click edit and i'm going to specify right here uh, first we're going to enable rewrite engine so rewrite engine on uppercase o then we're going to write rewrite conditions rewrite cond we have to specify right here the request file name request file name space exclamation dash f so basically this means the request file name the request file name is everything after the domain okay and we specify if the request file name doesn't equal to file and we have to copy this and put this and change this into d and if the request file name is not a directory then inside rewrite rule we write that should be everything redirected into index html okay and we hit save right here and let's now refresh and here we go so now we see up dashboard if we go on another page and reload that apache understands that it needs to redirect to the index html and we see our application okay and just like this we deployed our Vue.js application now we need to take custom email address create custom email address and implement email sending with that custom email address let me close all the tabs i don't need them at the moment and if we go in the register now and fill up the form it's not going to send us an email because we don't have en of file con configured correctly okay if i go in the lcommerce.net and click on this en and edit that scroll down below we see in the mailer section we have a mail hog right here which is basically for local testing okay let's create now custom email address configure it right here so that when the user registers the email is sent basically from let's say info at lcommerce.net from that email address okay for this we need to search email section right here emails go to control panel and we have to select the plan for our lcommerce so we can take a business email which has a couple of advantages like email templates and uh, send later feature and follow-up reminders 
but I think uh, we don't need that at the moment. So I'm going to click this free email, select right here. Email plan was successfully selected. And right here we have to create now uh, email. And I'm going to call this info, info at lcommerce.net. And let's generate a um, random password for our email info at lcommerce.net. Let me actually, I can uh, specify or automatically generate password. So let's create new account. Uh, we're going to specify, by the way, the recovery email address as well. I'm going to specify this as my email address and create new account. Okay, so the email was actually created. And in fact, we can now log in into the email inbox as well. So if I just click on this, it's going to open new tab. And we have uh, this info at lcommerce.net provided right here. And let's copy the password and paste this right here. Click login. It will ask us again about recovery email and click on submit. Okay, once this process is finished, we will be able to see our inbox. Let's just reload because sometimes it stacks right there. Okay, and here we have this inbox. So let's close this. We don't we don't need this professional email. Okay, and this is our email from which we can basically send emails and receive emails using info at lcommerce.net. This is awesome, right? But we're going to go even step farther. We have this custom email address from which we can respond to the customers uh, of our e-commerce website and anyone. But let's take now SMTP credentials and put this in our website. Okay, so let me hit done right here. Let's go on the home. And this is the place. So here we have multiple options. But what I need is configure desktop application. Basically, this is the approach how a third party can connect to your email. So I click on configure desktop app and it gives me now the SMTP information I need. So we basically we're going to use this. So we have two options configure via POP or IMAP. For us, it's the same. So I'm going to just, I'm going to take this outgoing server, which is SMTP Titan dot email. Quick disclaimer right here. The only purpose of this section is just to show you how you can configure your Laravel application to use production ready SMTP credentials. This particular email provider is not intended for massive email sending. It has limitations per day or per hour. Its main purpose is to give you a business email and business look when sending and receiving emails from the user interface, from the inbox. I don't recommend using this particular email provider on production for massive email sending. If you need massive email sending, we should probably consider something like MailChimp or SendGrid. Also, don't abuse the email service provider's terms and conditions and don't send emails to non-existing accounts. In such case, your email account might be suspended. And put this in the file manager. Mailer is SMTP Titan email. Let me zoom in. Then we need to take uh, let's use SSL encryption to be SSL. We have encryption right here. Let's specify port, which is 465. We have port right here. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Right here, the mailer should be SMTP. I'm sorry. The host should be SMTP Titan email. Let me remove this. The mailer should be SMTP, host should be SMTP Titan email, mail port. We have now username and password. The username and password is basically what we just copied. I think we copied password once, but we need to probably reset the password because I didn't save that password. So here we see that email accounts. Let's click on this reset password info at lcommerce.net send reset link. We should receive reset link right here. Here we received. Let me zoom out and click reset your password. And we have we have to specify new password. So I'm going to generate again a random password because we need a strong password for that. Let's take this. And this is my new password. 
Okay, so that was successfully changed. And I was logged out from the system basically. And now I'm going to put this right here. Okay, this is my password. And the username is obviously info at lcommerce.net. So now we have the mailer configured properly. And let's specify from address as well, which will be info at lcommerce.net. Scroll down below and hit save right here. Okay, now I'm going to close this and now let's try to register on our website. And I'm going to use my personal email address and let's hit sign up. Okay, so here it tells me that uh, thanks for signing up before getting started. I had to verify my email address basically. Let me open my Gmail. Look at this. So I just received an email, verify email address, Laravel Elcom e-commerce. This is our website. Hello. Click the link below to verify your email address. Let's click on this link. And now we are authorized in the system and we can go in my profile and add addresses right here. And we see countries as well, which came from the country seeder. Okay. Now we have our email address, um, set a custom email address set up correctly. And basically from application, uh, we use this custom email address for email sending, which is awesome. Now I think we need to create a couple of products and make an order. And we have to also specify Stripe keys as well. So because I am going to have a test account uh, for Stripe as well, so I'm not going to have a production Stripe account. So I'm, I can take these keys from .env. I can copy these three keys and then open the file manager, open env, edit that scroll down below and paste them right here. Okay. So we have publishable key, secret key and webhook secret key as well. We have to configure webhook as well. So I'm going to click save and close. Okay. So we have that Stripe information as well. And now I'm going to add few products and then make an order. We have this small problem because we added published and whenever we are trying to create new product, and we hit the submit, no matter if you tick this published or not, we hit the submit, we have this error, we have this debugger, and if we just continue and have a look in the network, we have this problem that published, the published field is required. If we check payload right here, we don't see published, so we don't pass published on the new product creation. So let's open back inside, go under source, views, products, product model. And let's have a look. What do we do right here? So when the user hits submit on submit, we take product value and send that. Okay. So whenever we call update product, if we change the image, we're going to lose that published. Yes, this will happen. So whenever we are trying to create new product, let's search for create product, we basically lose that published. So let's click right here. We have to duplicate this and change this into published product published. But I have a feeling that that's going to be always true because it's going to send probably string. So we're going to test this. I'm going to click a new product give it test title. Let's choose some image and give some price. Clear up the network and hit submit. Okay. We have this error. Let's check the network and payload. We send published to be undefined. All right. Let's check now. What do we have inside the product? Debugger, let's add new product, test, choose an image, give some price and hit the submit. The product contains right there published to be undefined. 
Okay, if we don't take the check checkbox, it is undefined, which is okay, so it's kind of false. Uh, but we definitely get this error. Let's continue the error. The published field must be true or false. We send it undefined, but it must be true or false. All right, let's change this. And if it's undefined, well, we can cast it into boolean so let's use double exclamation mark okay and this will simply cast this into boolean if it's undefined it's going to become false so let's just add new product test choose the image and give some price let's not mark this publish checkbox hit the submit and now the product should contain uh, it will not contain actually, but it will product published. I think the browser didn't update our changes. Let's test this. Test image and price. Hit the submit. Let's proceed. We have an error. Let's see what information is sent. It is still undefined. Let's proceed. Published is still undefined. Let's remove the debugger from here. So let's do like this. If published exists, then we take true. Otherwise, we take false because we want it to be Boolean. But the value right here actually should be string inside form append. Not sure how this will work. So let's check this. Prices want to. Let's mark this and hit the submit now. Okay, we still get this error. I want to remove this debugger from product model. Let's remove it. And let's proceed. And let's check network. The published field must be true or false. Yes, in this case, we send it to be true, but this is actually string. It is not Boolean. Okay, this is the problem. The published field must be true or false. I think this can be adjusted using Laravel rules. So if we open product request and scroll down below and find the published, it needs to be required and Boolean. So by default, the Boolean rule basically checks only the following values. It should be either false or true or zero or, or one, or it can be string zero or string one. Okay, but it doesn't have string true and string false. So if we open now our actions.js, and if we just change what we are sending, so instead of sending right here true or false, why don't we send one and a zero? Okay, we can even wrap this as strings, but we, it will be um, just converted into string in any case. If we do like this and then try to add new product, hit this submit. Now we see that the product was actually created. Okay, and it also has this published checked. Now let's create second product, test2, which will not have this published marked. And we see test2. And if we edit, we see it is not published. And if we check on the front end side, we're going to also see test outputted right here, but test2 is not outputted. Okay, just like this we have fixed this problem. Let's try update as well, because that was the creation part. And if we search for update, or why, why don't we simply copy this part and search for update product and put this right here. Okay, we need to send it like this as well. And now if we just uh, open any products, and just change the image and tick the checkbox 
it's going to work. So here we see this last updated and it should have also checkbox che checked. Okay, the description is null, which I know why, because right here we send the description was actually null and it was sent as null string. So we can specify right here if the description doesn't exist, just take an empty string. Okay, and we have to do the same thing when we are creating product right here as well. So we fixed this problem about creating new product. I have created a simple test product, but the uploaded image is not displayed. And there are two things to do to make the uploaded images to be displayed. First, we have to create a storage link, which we haven't done. We're going to run php artisan storage colon link, and this will create a link from storage up public into public storage. So basically, the uploaded files go under storage up public, and that storage up public is not web accessible. Only those files and folders are web accessible, which are under public folder. So Laravel creates a symbolic link from storage up public into public storage. And now if we go under public folder, we're going to see right here storage symbolic link. Okay. And everything which is uploaded under storage up public will be available right here as well. Okay. So far, so good. But this will not fix our problem. There is a second thing to do to make this working. Now the storage link exists, but we are using an incorrect, not the incorrect, but the file system we are using is not configured to be publicly accessible. All right, so let's have a look. Let's navigate one directory back, go in the project root directory, and we're going to open .en file. And right here we have this file system disk equals local. Okay, so we are using at the moment local file system. And now let's open our Laravel project. Let's open a file under config file systems PHP. And right here we have multiple disks configured. This comes out of the box with Laravel. We have local file system, public, S3, and so on. And if we scroll up, the default one is taken from the EN file system disk. And this is local, what we just saw. And if we have a look, the local file system is not configured to be publicly available and accessible. Okay, so right here, we need to give it a visibility to be public, just like the public disk has. Like we could use this public disk as well, but in this case, a few things might not work because we might have to update the code of uploading image, which we don't know what want at the moment. So we're going to put right here, visibility is public. Okay, so once you do this, just commit and push the changes on your Git repository. Then we're going we're gonna to go in the project. We can exit from Veeam. And then we're going to pull the changes. We're going to run git pull. And I already have those changes pulled. Well, we're going to run git pull origin master main origin main. This will download the latest version. And now if we open a full file from config file systems and have a look, if we scroll at the top. So let's have a look. We have the local and right here we have visibility public. So this indicates that now we have the latest change on our server. Okay. And now we can open the browser. Let's delete this and try to create new product. Okay. Let's name it test, choose some image give some price and hit submit. Okay, the product was uploaded and image is right there. Let's test also modifying the image. I'm going to choose a different one and click submit. And that works perfectly. Now I'm going to go ahead and create several sample products. I added these two items and I'm going to now add both of them in the cart. Go to the cart click on proceed to checkout. We have already provided Stripe keys, so we should be good to go. Let's specify right here Stripe test card information. 
We haven't configured the webhook so far, so the redirect should work, and our order should be able um, our order should be marked as completed. And I get this success message, and if I go in my orders, I see right here order. Click on this. I see the order is actually paid. If I go in the admin, right here we see one order, and I also got an email. I want to show this email. This is the email I received. New order has been created. Okay, the image for the second one is for some reason broken, but the email is actually received. And if we go in the dashboard, we are going to see two active products, one active customer, one paid order, total income. We see the latest customer, latest order. If we go in the orders, we see this order. And if we click right here, we're going to see the order details. We probably have an error right here. Sometimes the error happen after you deploy your application. They don't happen on locally but they happen when you deploy. So you should know how to deal with these problems. Attempt to read property ID on now. That happens on order resource. This is where it happens. And I think the reason might be addresses because we don't restrict users from checkout. And if we open this, Right here, we try to access to something like customer and shipping ID, and, and, and I think that is the that is the problem. And yeah, this is something which can be easily fixed. We have the line right here as well. So the line is forty-seven. This is exactly okay. Here is the line mentioned. So this is something we need to improve. But the main thing is that the application is deployed and working. Uh, we were able to register and log in and make an order as well. Probably the only thing that is remained is to configure webhooks, which is very easy. So let's go to the Stripe dashboard. Let's search for webhooks right here and add an endpoint. So now we have to provide right here our domain, which is this, and I think the URL is called webhook, right? So let's put this right here and let's open in our project webphp and webhook stripe. This is the URL. So I'm going to paste this right here Select the events to listen. We can listen for checkout session completed because this is what we are interested in. This is what we are looking for. And we can open this webhook and scroll down below and find checkout session completed. Yeah, this is exactly what we are interested. Anything else is something we don't care. All right, so we add an event. We have this domain ready, endpoint URL, and let's add endpoint. So we added this webhook, and now let's make one more order, but in this case, we're gonna close the tab after, after the payment basically is made, but before the redirect happens. So we proceed to checkout. So we fill up the information and click on pay, and as soon as button turns into green, I'm gonna close the tab, Okay, I'm going to close the tab and now let's have a look. So let's reload the page. It's going to go through an error. If we click on the orders, now we see both is actually paid. And that's because Stripe sent webhook properly. And if we check the customer lcommerce.net and go in my orders, right here I see both of them are paid. So our webhook also works fine. All right, guys, that's it for this project, and I hope you like it. If so, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. I will see you in the next time.